The Castle of the Carpathians by Jules Verne. Recording by Joe Denoya, Somerset, New Jersey. Chapter 1. This story is not fantastic. It is merely romantic. Are we to conclude that it is not true, its unreality being granted? That would be a mistake. We live in times where everything can happen. We might almost say everything has happened. If our story does not seem to be true today, it may seem so tomorrow, thanks to the resources of science, which are the wealth of the future. No one would think of classing it as legendary. Besides, one does not invent legends at the close of this practical and positive nineteenth century. Neither in Brittany, the country of the ferocious Corrigans, nor in Scotland, the land of the Brownies and Gnomes, nor in Norway, the land of Azes, Elfs, Sylphs, and Valkyries, nor even in Transylvania, where the Carpathian scenery lends itself so naturally to every psychagogic evocation. But at the same time, it is as well to note that Transylvania is still much attached to the superstitions of early ages. These provinces of furthest Europe, Monsieur de Hirondo has described them, Monsieur Elise Recluse has visited them. Neither have said anything of the strange story on which this romance is founded. Did they know of it? Perhaps. But they did not wish to add to the belief in it. We are sorry for it, for if they had related it, one would have done so with the precision of the annalist, and the other with that instinctive poetry with which all his tales of travels are imbued. But as neither of them told it, I will try to do so for them. On the twenty ninth of May, a shepherd was watching his flock on the edge of the green plateau at the foot of Retezat, which dominates a fertile valley, thickly wooded with straight stemmed trees, and enriched with cultivation. This elevated plateau, open, unsheltered, the northwest winds sweep during the winter as closely as the barber's razor. It is said in the country that they shave it, and they do so, almost. This shepherd had nothing Arcadian in his costume, nor bucolic in his attitude. He was neither Daphne's, nor Amentus, nor Teterus, nor Lycidas, nor Malibos. The Linian did not murmur at his feet, which were encased in thick wooden shoes. It was only the Wallachian sill whose clear pastoral waters were worthy of flowing through the meanderings of the romance of Astria. Frick, Frick of the village of Worst, such was the name of this rustic shepherd, was as roughly clothed as a sheep, but quite well enough for the whole at the entrance of the village where sheep and pigs lived in a state of revolting filth. The Imanum Pecus fed then under the care of said Frick, Imani, or Eeps. Stretched on a hillcock carpeted with grass, he slept with one eye open, his big pipe in his mouth, and now and then he gave a shrill whistle to his dogs when some sheep strayed away from the pasturage, or else he gave a more powerful blast, which awoke the multiple echoes of the mountain. It was four o'clock in the afternoon. The sun was sinking toward the horizon. A few summits whose bases were bathed in floating mists were standing out clear in the east. Toward the southwest, two breaks in the chain allowed a slanting column of rays to enter the ring like a luminous jet passing through a half-open door. This orographic system belongs to the wildest part of Transylvania, known as the county of Klausenburg, or Kolosvar. A curious fragment of the Austrian Empire is this Transylvania, Erdele in Magyar, which means the country of the forests. It is bounded by Hungary on the north, Molokia on the south, Moldavia on the west, extending over 60,000 square kilometers, about six millions of hectares, nearly the ninth of France. It is a kind of Switzerland, but half as large again, and no more populous. With its table lands under cultivation, its luxuriant pasturages, its capriciously carved valleys, its frowning summits, Transylvania, streaked by the plutonic ramifications of the Carpathians, is furrowed by numerous watercourses flowing to swell the Tice and the superb Danube, the iron gates of which, a few miles to the south, close the defile of the Balkan chain on the frontier of Hungary and the Ottoman Empire. Such is the ancient country of Dacia, conquered by Trajan in the first century of the Christian era. The independence it enjoyed under Jean Zappoli and his successors up to 1699 ended with Leopold I, who annexed it to Austria. But such was its political constitution that it remained the common abode of the races which elbow each other but never mingle. Wallachians or Romans, Hungarians, Tsiganes, Zecklers of Moldavia origin, and also Saxons, whose time and circumstances will end by magyarizing to the advantage of Transylvania unity. To which of these types did the shepherd Frick belong? Was he a degenerate descendant of the ancient Dacians? He would not have found it easy to say so, to judge by his tumbled hair, his begrimed face, his bristly beard, his thick eyebrows, like two red-haired bushes, his bluish eyes, bluish or greenish, the humid corners of which were marked with the wrinkles of old age. He must have been sixty-five. You would never have guessed him less. But he was big, hardy, upright under his yellowish cloak, which was not as shaggy as his chest, and a painter would not have lost the chance of sketching him when he was wearing his grass hat 
a true wisp of straw, and resting on his crook as motionless as a rock. Just as the rays penetrated through the break in the west, Frick turned over. His half-closed hand he made into a telescope, as he had already made it into a speaking trumpet, to make his voice heard at a distance, and he looked through it attentively. In the clear of the horizon, a good mile away, lay a group of buildings, with their outlines much softened by the distance. This old castle occupied on an isolated shoulder of the Vulcan Range the upper part of a tableland called the Orgal Plateau. In the bright light the castle stood out with the clearness displayed in stereoscopic views. But, nevertheless, the shepherd's eye must have been endowed with great power of vision to be able to make out any detail in that distant mass. Suddenly he exclaimed, as he shook his head, Old castle! Old castle! You may well stand firm on your foundation. Three years more and you will have ceased to exist, for your beech tree has only three branches left. This beech tree, planted at the extremity of one of the bastions of the enclosure, stood out black against the sky, and would have been almost invisible at that distance to anyone else than Frick. The explanation of the shepherd's words, which were caused by a legend relative to the castle, we will give in due time. Yes, he repeated, three branches. There were four yesterday, but the fourth has fallen during the night. I can only count three at the fork. No more than three, old castle, no more than three. If we attack a shepherd on his ideal side, the imagination readily takes him for a dreamy, contemplative being. He converses with the planets, he confers with the stars, he reads in the skies. In reality, he is generally a stupid, ignorant brute. But public credulity easily credits him with supernatural gifts. He practices sorcery. According to his humor, he can call up good fortune or bad, and scatter it among man and beast. Or, what comes to the same thing, he sells sympathetic powders, and you can buy from him philtres and formulas. Can he not make the furrows barren by throwing into them enchanted stones? Can he not make sheep sterile by merely casting on them the evil eye? These superstitions are of all times and all countries. Even in the most civilized lands, one will never meet a shepherd without giving him some friendly word, some significant greeting, saluting him by the name of Pastor, to which he clings. A touch of the hat affords an escape from malign influences, and on the roads of Transylvania it is no more omitted than elsewhere. Frick, then, was regarded as a sorcerer, a caller-up of apparitions. According to him, the vampires and strategists obey him. If you were to believe him, these were to be met with at the setting of the moon, as on dark nights in other countries you see the great Bissex astride on the arms of the mill, talking with the wolves or dreaming in the starlight. Frick profited by all this. He sold charms and counter-charms, but, be it noted, he was as credulous as his believers. If he did not believe in his own witchcraft, he believed in the legends of his country. There is nothing surprising, therefore, in his prophecy regarding the approaching disappearance of the old castle, now that the beach was reduced to three branches, or is at once setting out to bear the news to worst. After mustering his flock by bellowing loudly through a long trumpet of white wood, he took the road to the village. His dogs followed him, hurrying on the sheep as they did so. Two mongrel demigriffins, snarling and ferocious, who seemed fitter to eat the sheep than to guard them. He had a hundred rams and ewes, a dozen yearlings, the rest three and four years old. The flock belonged to the judge of worst, the Biro Colts, who paid the commune a large sum for pasturage, and who thought a good deal of his shepherd Frick, knowing him to be a skillful shearer and well acquainted with the treatment of such maladies as thrush, giddiness, fluke, rot, foot rot, and other cattle ailments. The flock moved in a compact mass, the bellwether at the head making the bell heard above the bleeding. As he left the pasturage, Frick took a wide footpath bordered by spacious fields, in which waved magnificent ears of corn, very long in the straw and high on the stalk, and several plantations of cuckoo routes, which is the maze of the country. The road led to the edge of a forest of firs and spruces, fresh and gloomy beneath their branches. Lower down, the sill flowed along its luminous course, filtering through the pebbles in its bed and bearing the logs of wood from the sawmills upstream. Dogs and sheep stopped on the right bank of the river and began to drink greedily, pushing the reeds aside to do so. Worst was not more than three gunshots away, beyond a thick plantation of willows formed of well-grown trees, and not of stunted pollards which only grow bushy for a few feet above their roots. These willows stretched away up to Vulcan Hill, of which the village of the same name occupied a projection on the southern slope of the Plesot Range. The fields were now deserted. It is only at nightfall that the laborers return home, and Frick, as he went along, had no traditional good night to exchange. When his flock had satisfied their thirst, he was about to enter the fold of the valley when a man appeared at the bend of the sill, some fifty yards downstream. Hello, friend, said he to the shepherd. He was one of those peddlers who traveled from market to market in the district. They are to be met with in the towns and all the villages, in making themselves understood that they have no difficulty, for they speak all languages. Was this one an Italian, a Saxon, 
or a Wallachian. No one could say, but he was unmistakably a Jew, tall, thin, hook-nosed, with a pointed beard, a prominent forehead, and keen, glittering eyes. This peddler dealt in telescopes, thermometers, barometers, and small clocks. What he did not carry in the bag, strongly strapped over his shoulder, he hung from his neck and his belt, so that he was quite a traveling stall. Probably this Jew had the usual respect for shepherds, and the salutary fear they inspire. He took Frick by the hand. Then in the Roman language, which is a mixture of Latin and slave, he said with a foreign accent, Are you getting on all right, friend? Yes, considering the weather, replied Frick. Then you must be doing well today, for the weather is beautiful. And I shall not be doing well tomorrow, for it will rain. It will rain, said the peddler. Then it rains without clouds in your country. The clouds will come tonight, and from yonder, the bad side of the mountain. How do you know that? By the wool of my sheep, which is harsh and dry as tanned leather. Then it will be all the worse for those who are on a long journey. And all the better for those who stay near home. Then you have a home, shepherd? Have you any children? said Frick. No. Are you married? No. And Frick asked this because in this country it is the custom to do so of those you meet. He continued. Where do you come from, peddler? From Hermannstadt. Hermannstadt is one of the principal villages of Transylvania. On leaving it you find the valley of the Hungarian Sill, which flows down to the town of Petrosini. And you are going? To Kolosvar. To reach Kolosvar you have to ascend the valley of the Maros, and then by Carlsberg, along the lower slopes of the Bihar Mountains, you reach the capital of the country. It is a walk of twenty miles only. These vendors of thermometers, barometers, and cheap jewelry always seem to be a peculiar people, and somewhat Hoffmanesque in their bearing. It is part of the trade. They sell time and weather in all forms. The time which flies, the weather which is, and the weather which will be, just as other packmen sell baskets and drapery. They are commercial travelers from the house of Saturn and Co., on the sign of the Golden Shoe. And doubtless this was the effect the Jew produced on Frick, who gazed not without astonishment at this display of things which were new to him, the use of which he did not know. I say, peddler, said he, outstretching his arm, what is the use of all this trumpery which rattles at your belt like a lot of old bones? These things are valuable, said the peddler. They are of use to everybody. To everybody, said Frick, winking his eye. Even the shepherds? Even the shepherds. What is the use of this machine? This machine, answered the Jew, putting a thermometer into his hands, will tell you if it is hot or cold. Ah, friend, I can tell you that when I'm sweating under my tunic, or shivering under my overcoat. Evidently that was enough for a shepherd who did not trouble himself about the wherefore of science. And this big watch with the needle, continued he, pointing to an aneroid, that is not a watch, but an instrument which will tell you if it will be fine tomorrow, or if it will rain. Really? Really. Good, said Frick. I don't want that, even if it costs a kreutzer. I have only to look at the clouds trailing along the mountains or racing over the higher peaks, and I can tell you what the weather will be a day in advance. Look, do you see that mist which seems to rise from the ground? Well, I tell you it means water for tomorrow. And in fact, the shepherd, who was a great observer of the weather, could do very well without a barometer. I will not ask you if you want a clock, continued the peddler. A clock? I have one which goes by itself and hangs over my head. That is the sun up there. Look, you friend, when it is over the peak of Ruddock, it is noon. When it looks at me across the gap of Egelt, it is six o'clock. My sheep know it as well as I do, and my dogs know it as well as my sheep. You can keep your clocks. Then, said the peddler, if my only customers were shepherds, I should have hard work to make a fortune. And so you want nothing? Nothing at all. Besides which, all these low-priced goods were very poor workmanship. The barometers never agreed as to its being changeable weather or fair. The clock hands made the hours too long or the minutes too short. In fact, they were pure rubbish. The shepherd suspected this, perhaps, and did not care to become a buyer. But just as he was taking up his stick again, he caught sight of a sort of tube hanging from the peddler's strap. And what do you do with that tube? That tube is not a tube. Is it a blunderbuss? No, said the Jew, it is a telescope. It was one of those common telescopes which magnify the objects five or six times, or bring them as near, which produces the same result. Frick unhooked the instrument. He looked at it, he handled it, and opened and shut it. Then he shook his head. A telescope, he asked. Yes, Shepard, and a good one, and one that will make you see a long way off. Oh, I have good eyes, my friend. When the air is clear, I can see the rocks on top of the Retziats, and the farthest trees in the Vulcan Valleys. Without winking? Without winking. It is the dew which makes me do that, and my sleeping from night to morning under the starlit sky. That is the sort of thing to keep your pupils clean. What? The dew? said the peddler. It might perhaps make the blot, not the shepherds. 
Quite so, but if you have good eyes, mine are better when I get them at the end of that telescope. That remains to be seen. Put yours to it now. Mine? Try. Will that cost me anything? asked Frick, suspiciously. Nothing at all, unless you buy the machine. Being reassured on this point, Frick took the telescope, the tubes of which were adjusted by the peddler. Shutting his left eye as directed, he applied his right eye to the eyepiece. At first he looked towards Vulcan Hill, and then up towards Plaza. That done, he lowered the instrument and brought it to bear on the village of Verst. Ah, ah, he said, perhaps you are right. It does carry farther than my eyes. There is the main road. I recognize the people. There is Nick Deck, the forester, coming home with his haversack on his back and his gun over his shoulder. I told you so, said the peddler. Yes, yes, that really is Nick, said the shepherd. And who was the girl who was coming out of Colts's house, with the red petticoat and the black bodice, as if to get in front of him? Keep on looking, shepherd. You will soon recognize the girl, as you did the young man. Ah, yes. It is Miriota, the lovely Miriota. Ah, the lovers, the lovers. This time I have got them at the end of my tube, and I shall not lose one of their little goings-on. What do you say to the telescope? Eh? It does make you see far. As Frick was looking through a telescope for the first time, it followed that Verse was one of the most backwards villages of the country of Klausenberg, and that this was so, we shall soon see. Come, shepherd, continued the peddler, look again, look further than worst. The village is too near us, look beyond, farther beyond, I tell you. Shall I have to pay any more? No more. Good. I will look towards the Hungarian sill. Yes. There is the clock tower I live in Zell. I recognize it by the cross which has lost one arm. And... Beyond, in the valley, among the pines, I see the spire of Petrosny, with its weathercock of zinc with the open beak as if it were calling its chickens. And, beyond, there is that tower pointing up amidst the trees. But I suppose, peddler, it is all the same price? All the same price, shepherd. Frick turned the telescope toward the plateau of Orgal. Then, with it, he followed the curtain of forests darkening the slopes of Plesa, and the field of the objective framed the distant outline of the village. Yes, he exclaimed, the fourth branch is on the ground. I had seen it all right, and no one would get it to make a torch out of it for the night of St. John's. Nobody, not even me. It would be to risk both body and soul. But do not trouble yourself about it. There is one who knows how to gather it tonight for his infernal fire, and that is the chort. The chort being the devil when he is invoked in the language of the country. Perhaps the Jew might have demanded an explanation of these incomprehensible words, as he was not a native of the village of Worst or its environs, had not Frick exclaimed in a voice of terror mingled with surprise. What is that mist escaping from the dungeon? Is it a mist? No. One would say it was a smoke. It is not possible. For hundreds and hundreds of years, no smoke had come from the chimney of the castle. If you see a smoke over there, Shepherd, there is a smoke. No, Peddler, no. It is the glass of your machine which is misty. Clean it. And when I have cleaned it? Frick shifted the telescope, and having rubbed the glasses, he replaced it at his eye. It was undoubtedly a smoke streaming from the upper part of the dungeon. It mounted high in the air and mingled with the highest vapors. Frick remained motionless and silent. All his attention was concentrated on the castle, from which the rising shadow began to touch the level of the plateau of Orgal. Suddenly he lowered the telescope, and thrusting his hand into the pouch he wore under his frock, he said, How much do you want for your tube? A florin and a half, said the peddler. And he would have sold the telescope for a florin if Frick had shown any desire to bargain for it. But the shepherd said not a word. Evidently, under the influence of an astonishment, as sudden as it was inexplicable, he plunged his hand to the bottom of his wallet and drew out the money. Are you buying the telescope for yourself? asked Peddler. No, for my master. And he will pay you back? Yes, the two florins it cost me. What? The two florins? Eh, certainly. That and no less. Good evening, my friend. Good evening, Shepherd. And Frick, whistling his dogs and urging on his flock, struck off rapidly in the direction of Hurst. The Jew, looking at him as he went, shook his head as if he had been doing a trade with a madman. If I had known that, he murmured, I should have charged him more for the telescope. Then he adjusted his burden of his belt and shoulders and resumed his journey to Carlsberg, along the right bank of the sill. Where did he go? It matters little. He passed out of the story. We shall meet with him no more. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 it matters not whether we are dealing with native rocks piled up by natural means in distant geological epochs, or with constructions due to the hand of man over which the breadth of time has passed. The effect is much the same when viewed from a few miles off. Unworked stone and worked stone may easily be confounded. From afar, the same color, the same liniments, the same deviations of line in the perspective, the same uniformity of tint under the gray patina of centuries. 
And so it was with this castle, otherwise known as the Castle of the Carpathians, to distinguish the indefinite outlines of this structure on the plateau of Wargal, which crowns the left of Vulcan Hill, was impossible. It did not stand out in relief from the background of mountains. What might have been taken as a dungeon was only a stony mound. What might be supposed to be a curtain with its battlements might be only a rocky crest. The mass was vague, floating, uncertain, and in the opinion of many tourists, the castle of the Carpathians existed only in the imagination of the country people. Evidently, the simplest means of assuring yourself as to its existence would have been to have bargained with a guide from Vulcan or worse, to have gone up the valley, scaled the ridge, and visited the buildings. But a guide would have been as difficult to find as the road leading to the castle. In the valley of both sills, no one would have agreed to be guide to a traveler, for no matter what remuneration, to the castle of the Carpathians. What they would have seen of this ancient habitation in the field of a telescope more powerful and better focused than the trumpery thing bought by the shepherd Frick on account of his master Colts was this. Some eight hundred or nine hundred feet in the rear of Vulcan Hill lay a gray enclosure, covered with the mass of wall plants, and extending for from four hundred to five hundred feet along the irregularities of the plateau. At each end were two angular bastions, in the right of which grew the famous beech, close by the slender watchtower or lookout of the pointed roof. On the left, a few patches of wall, strengthened by flying buttresses, supporting the tower of the chapel, the cracked bell of which was often sounded in high winds to the great alarm of the district. In the midst, crowned by its crenellated platform, a heavy, formidable dungeon, with three rows of leaded windows, the first story of which was surrounded by a circular terrace. On the platform, a long metal spire, ornamented with feudal virolet, or weathercock, stationary with rust, which a last puff of the northwest wind had set pointing to the southeast. As to what was contained in this enclosure, if there was any habitable building within, if a drawbridge or a postern gave admittance to it, had been unknown for a number of years. In fact, although the castle of the Carpathians was in better preservation than it seemed to be, an infectious terror, doubled by superstition, protected it as much as it had formerly been by its basilisks, its grasshoppers, its bombards, its culverins, its thunderers, and other engines of medieval artillery. But nevertheless, the castle of the Carpathians was well worth visiting by tourists and antiquarians. Its situation on the crest of the Orgal Plateau was exceptionally fine. From the upper platform of the keep, or dungeon, the view extended to the farthest point of the mountains. In the rear undulated the lofty chain, so capriciously spurred, which serves as the frontier of Wallachia. In front lay the sinuous defile of the Vulcan, the only practical route between the frontier provinces. Beyond the valley of the two cells lay the towns of Livenzel, Lognai, Petrosny, and Petria, grouped at the mouths of the shaft by which the rich coal basin is worked. In the distance lay an admirable series of ridges, wooden to their bases, green on their flanks, barren on their summits, commanded by the rugged peaks of Retyazet and Paring. Far away beyond the valley of Hatzeg and the course of the Marrows appeared the distant mist-clad outlines of the Alps of central Transylvania. Hereabouts the depression of the ground formerly formed a lake into which the two sills flowed before they found a passage through the chain. Nowadays, this depression is a coal field, with its advantages and inconveniences. The tall brick chimneys rise amid the poplars, pines, and beeches, and black fumes poison the air which once was saturated with the perfumes of fruit trees and flowers. But at the time of our story, although industry was holding the mining district under its iron hand, nothing had been lost of the country's wild character, which was its by nature. The castle of the Carpathians dated from the 12th or 13th century. In those days, under the rule of the chiefs or voivodes, monasteries, churches, palaces, castles were fortified with as much care as the towns and villages. Lords and peasants had to secure themselves against aggressions of all kind. This state of affairs explains why the old fortifications of the castle, its bastions and its keep, gave it the appearance of a feudal building. What architect would have built on this plateau, at this height? We know not, and the bold builder is unknown unless it was the Rumen Minoli, so gloriously sung of in Wallachian legend, and who built the Curte de Argis, the celebrated castle of Rudolf the Black. Whatever doubts there may be as to the architect, there were none as to the family who owned the castle. The barons of Gortz had been lords of the country from time immemorial. They were mixed up in all the wars, which ensanguined the Transylvanian fields. They fought against the Hungarians, the Saxons, the Secklers. Their name figures in the Cantuses and Doines, in which is perpetuated the memory of these disastrous times. For their motto, they had the famous Wallachian proverb, Dape Moate, give unto death, and they gave. They poured out their blood for the cause of independence, the blood which came to them from their Romans, their ancestors. 
As we know, all their efforts of devoutness and sacrifice ended only in reducing the descendants of this valiant race to the most unworthy oppression. It no longer exists politically. Three heels have crushed it. But these Wallachians of Transylvania have not despaired of shaking off the yoke. The future belongs to them, and it is with unshakable confidence that they repeat these words, in which are concentrated all their aspirations. Roman no pere. The Roman does not know how to perish. Toward the middle of the nineteenth century, the last representative of the Lords of Gortz was Baron Rodolphe, born at the castle of the Carpathians. He had seen the family die away around him in the early years of his youth. When he was twenty-two years old, he found himself alone in the world. His people had fallen off year by year, like the branches of the old beech tree, with which popular superstition associated the very existence of the castle. Without relatives, we might even say without friends, what could Baron Rodolphe do to occupy the leisure of this monotonous solitude that death had made around him? What were his tastes, his instincts, his aptitudes? It would not have been easy to discover any, beyond an irresistible passion for music, particularly for the singing of the great artists of the period. And so, after having entrusted the castle, then much dilapidated, to the care of a few old servants, he one day disappeared. And, as was discovered later on, he had devoted his wealth, which was considerable, to visiting the chief lyrical centers of Europe, the theaters of Germany, France, and Italy, where he can indulge himself in his insatiable dilettante fancies. Was he an oddity or a madman? The strangeness of his life led people to suppose so. But the remembrance of his country was deeply engraven on the heart of the young lord of Gortz. In his distant wanderings he had not forgotten his Transylvanian birthplace, and he had returned to take part in one of the sanguinary revolts of the Romanian peasantry against Hungarian oppression. The descendants of the ancient Dacians were conquered, and their territory shared among the conquerors. It was in consequence of this defeat that Baron Rudolf finally left the castle of the Carpathians, certain parts of which had already fallen into ruin. Death soon deprived the castle of its last servants, and it was totally deserted. As to the Baron de Gortz, the report went that he had patriotically associated himself with the famous Ruza Sandor, an old highwayman whom the War of Independence had made a dramatic hero. Happily for him, at the close of the struggle, Rudolf de Gortz had separated from the band of the Betjar, and he had done wisely, for the old brigand had again become a robber, and ended by falling into the hands of the police, who shut him up in the prison Samos Udvar. Nevertheless, another version was generally believed in the country, to the effect that Baron Rodolf had been killed during an encounter between Rosoff Sandar and the custom house officer on the frontier. This was not so, although the Baron de Gortz had never appeared at the castle since that time, and his death was generally taken for granted. But it is wise not to accept without considerable reserve the gossip of this credulous people. A castle deserted, haunted, and mysterious. A vivid and ardent imagination had soon peopled it with phantoms. Ghosts appeared in it, and spirits returned to it at all hours of the night. Such opinions are still common in certain superstitious countries of Europe, and Transylvania is one of the most superstitious. Besides, how could the village of Verst put off its belief in the supernatural? The Pope and the schoolmaster, the one charged with the education of the faithful, the other charged with the education of the children, taught their fables as openly as if they believed in them thoroughly. They affirmed, and even produced corroborative evidence, that werewolves prowled about the country, that vampires, known as striges, because they shrieked like striges, quenched their thirst on human blood, that Staffi lurked their ruins and became vindictive if something to eat and drink were not left for them every night. There were fairies, babes who should not be met with on Thursdays or Fridays, the two worst days of the week. In the depths of the forests, those enchanted forests, there wandered the Baluri, those gigantic dragons whose jaws gape up to the clouds, the Zmi with vast wings who carry away the daughters of the royal blood, and even those of meaner lineage when they are pretty. Here, it would seem, were a number of formidable monsters, and what is the good genius opposed to them in the popular imagination? Simply the Serpe de Casa, the snake of the fireside, which lives at the back of the hearth, and whose healthy influence the peasant purchases by feeding him with the best milk. If ever a castle was a fitting refuge for the creatures of the Romanian mythology, was it not the castle of the Carpathians? On this isolated plateau, inaccessible except for the left of the Vulcan Hill, there could be no doubt that there lived dragons and fairies and striders and probably a few ghosts of the family of the barons of Gortz. And so it had an evil reputation, which it deserved, as they said. No one dared to visit it. It spread around it a terrible epidemic, as an unhealthy marsh gives forth its pestilential emanations. Nothing could approach it within a quarter of a mile, without risking its life in this world and its salvation in the next. At least so it was taught in the school of Magister Hermann. But at the same time this state of things was to end eventually, and that as soon as no stone remained of the ancient stronghold of the barons of Gortz 
and here it was that the legends came to live in. We were to believe the authorities of the village of Worst. The existence of the castle was bound up with that of the old beech tree which grew in the bastion to the right of the enclosure. Since the departure of Rodolphe de Gortz, the people of the village, and more especially the shepherd Frick, had observed it. This beech tree had lost one of its main branches every year. There were eighteen from the first fork when Baron Rodolphe was seen for the last time on the platform of the keep, and now the tree had only three. Consequently, every branch that fell meant a year less of the castle's life. The fall of the last would mean the final dissolution, and then on the plateau of Orgal the remains of the castle of the Carpathians would be sought in vain. Evidently, this was but one of the legends which sprung up so readily in Romanian imagination. In the first place, it remained to be proved that the beech tree did really lose one of its branches a year, although Frick did not hesitate to assert that it did, he who never lost sight of it while his flock pastured in the meadows of the sill. Nevertheless, from the highest to the lowest of the people of Worst, none doubted that the castle had but three years to live, for only three branches can now be counted on the tutelary tree. Thus it was that the shepherd had started on his return, to the village with the important news when there occurred the incident of the telescope. Important news. Very important news, in fact. Smoke had appeared above the dungeon. That which his eyes alone had not been able to notice, Frick had distinctly seen with the peddler's telescope. It was no vapor but real smoke which had arisen into the clouds. And yet the castle was deserted. For a long time no one had entered the gate, which was doubtless shut, nor crossed the drawbridge, which was doubtless up. If it were inhabited, it could only be by supernatural beings. But what use could spirits have for a fire in the rooms of the keep? Was it a fire in a room? Was it a kitchen fire? Really, it was inexplicable. Frick hurried his sheep along the road. At his voice the dogs urged the flock up the rising track, the dust of which had been laid by the evening moisture. A few peasants, delayed in the fields, greeted him as he passed, and he scarcely replied to them and consequently there was such uneasiness, for if you would avoid evil influences, it is not good enough to say, good evening, to a shepherd. But the shepherd must say it to you. And Frick did not appear much inclined to do so, as he hurried on with his haggard eyes, his curious gait, and his excited gestures. The wolves and the bears might have walked off with half of his flock without his noticing it. The first who learned the news was Judge Colts. From afar Frick saw him and shouted, There is a fire at the castle, master. What do you say? I say what there is. Have you gone mad? Oh, how could a fire break out in such a heap of old stones? As well assert that Nagoy, the highest peak of the Carpathians, had been devoured by flames. It would have been no more absurd. You suppose that the castle is on fire? asked Master Colts. If it is not on fire, it smokes. It is some vapor. No, it is smoke. Come and see. And they went into the middle of the main road of the village, near the terrace, from which the castle could be observed. When they got there, Frick held up the telescope to Master Colts. Evidently, the use of the instrument was no more known to him than it had been to the shepherd. What is that? he said. A machine I bought for you for two florins, master, and it was well worth four. Of whom? A peddler. And what is it to do? Put it to your eye. Look straight at the castle, and you will see. The judge leveled the telescope at the castle and looked through it for some time. Yes, there certainly was smoke rising from one of the chimneys of the dungeon. At this moment it was being blown away by the breeze and floating up the flank of the mountain. Smoke, said Master Colts, astonished. But now he and Frick had been joined by Mariotta and the forester, Nick Deck, who had been indoors for some time. What is the use of this? asked the young man, taking the telescope. To see with the far off, said the shepherd. Are you joking? Joking? Hardly an hour ago I saw you coming down the road into Worst. You and... He did not finish his sentence. Mariotta had blushed and lowered her pretty eyes. After all, there was no harm in an honest young girl going to meet her betrothed. Both of them took the famous telescope and looked through it at the castle. Meanwhile, half a dozen neighbors had arrived in the terrace, and, after many questions as to what it all meant, took a look through the telescope in turn. A smoke, a smoke at the castle, said one. Perhaps the lightning had struck the dungeon, said another. Has there been any thunder? asked Master Colts, addressing Frick. Not a sound for a week, said the shepherd and the good folks could not have been more startled if a crater had opened up on the summit of Retiat to give passage to the subterranean vapors. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 The village of Verst is of so little importance that most maps do not indicate its position. In administrative rank, it is even below its neighbor, called Vulcan, from the name of that portion of the place or range on which both are picturesquely situated. At the present time, when the opening of the coal fields had increased the importance of the towns of Petrosny, Livenzel, and others, a few miles off, 
neither Vulcan nor Verst had received the least advantage from their proximity to a great industrial center. What the villages were fifty years ago, what they will doubtless be half a century hence, they are still. And, accordingly, to Elise Reclus, a good half of the Vulcan population consists of people engaged in watching the frontier, custom house officers, gendarmes, revenue officers, and quarantine attendants. Omit the gendarmes and the revenue officers and a large population of agriculturalists, and you will have the population of birth, consisting of a few hundred inhabitants. It is a street, this village, nothing but a wide street, the uphill nature of which makes the ascent and descent laboriously enough along the road. It serves as a natural thoroughfare between a Wallachian and Transylvanian frontier. Through it pass the cattle and sheep and pigs, the dealers in fresh provisions, fruits, and cereals, the few travelers who venture through the defile instead of taking the Kosovar and Maros Valley railways. Nature has assuredly generously endowed the district between the mountains of Bihar, Rechizat, and Parang. Rich in the fertility of its soil, it is also rich in its underground wealth. There are salt mines in Thorda with an annual output of more than 20,000 tons. Mount Parajd, measuring seven kilometers in circumference at its dome, is entirely formed of chloride of sodium. The mines of Tarasco yield lead, galena, mercury, and especially iron, the beds of which were worked in the 10th century. At Vedya Hunyad are mines whose products can be turned into steel of superior quality. There are coal mines easily worked in the upper strata of the lacustrine valleys of the districts of Hatieg, Livenzel, and Petrosny, a vast deposit estimated to contain 250 million tons. And finally, there are gold mines at Ofenbanya, at Topinfaba, the region of the gold seekers where thousands of primitive mills are working the sands of various Pater, the Transylvanian Pactolos, and exporting every year about two million francs worth of the precious metal. Here is a district that would seem to be greatly favored by nature, and yet its wealth is of very little profit to its population. If the more important centers, like Torotsko, Petrozny, and Lonyai, possess a few establishments suited to the comfortable conditions of modern industrial life, if they have regular buildings laid out with rule and line, and outhouses of shops, real workmen's towns in fact, if they have a certain number of houses with balconies and verandas, that is not the case at Vulcan or at Verst. Some sixty houses, irregularly clustered along the only street, capped with a fanciful roof, the ridge overhanging the mud wall, the front toward the garden, an attic with a skylight as a top story, a dilapidated barn as an annex, a stable all awry covered with straw, here and there a well surmounted by a beam from which hangs a bucket, two or three ponds which run over during a storm, streams of which the tortuous ruts indicated the course. Such is the village of Verst, built on both sides of the road between the slanting slopes of a hill. But it is all very fresh and attractive. There are flowers at the doors and windows, curtains of verdure screening the walls, plants in disorder mingling with the old gold of the thatch, poplars, elms, beeches, pines, maples climbing above the houses as high as they can. Beyond are the zigzagging flanks of the hills, and in the background the tops of the mountains, blue in the distance, and mingling their blue with the sky. Neither German nor Hungarian is spoken at first, nor in any of this part of Transylvania. These people speak Romanian, even the gypsies do so, of whom a few families are established rather than camped in the different villages of the country. These strangers adopt the language of the country as they adopt the religion. Those of Verst form a sort of little clan under the authority of the Voivode, with their huts, their barracas with pointed roofs, their legions of children, so different in their manners and regularity of their life from those of their congeners who wander about Europe. They even belong to the Greek church, and conform to the religion of the Christians among whom they have settled. As religious head, Verst has a pope, who resides at Vulcan and superintends the two villages, which are only half a mile apart. Civilization is like air or water. Wherever there is a passage, be it only a fissure, it will penetrate and modify the conditions of the country. But it must be admitted that no fissure has yet been found through this southern portion of the Carpathians. Vulcan, as L.S.A. Recluse says, is the last post of civilization in the valley of the Wallachian Sill, and we need not be astonished at worst being one of the most backward villages on the country of Kosovar. And how can it be otherwise in these places, where every one is born and lives and dies without ever leaving them? But perhaps you will say there is a schoolmaster and a judge at first? Yes, without doubt. But Magister Hermid was only able to teach what he knew, that is, to read a little, to write a little, to reckon a little. His personal instruction did not go beyond that. Of science, history, geography, literature, he knew nothing beyond the popular songs and legends of the surrounding country. In that respect his memory was richly stored. He was strong in manners of romance, and the few scholars of the village gained great profit from his lessons. As to the judge, 
we may as well say something concerning the chief magistrate of Verst. The bureau, Master Colts, was a little man, of from fifty-five to sixty years old, a Romanian by birth, his hair close-cut and gray, his mustache still black, his eyes more gentle than fiery. Solidly built like a mountaineer, he wore the large felt hat on his head, the high belt with ornamental buckle around his waist, the sleeveless vest, and the short baggy breeches tucked into his high leather boots. As much mayor as judge, for his function obliged him to intervene in the many disputes between neighbor and neighbor, he was chiefly occupied in administering his village with a great show of authority, and not without some benefit to his purse. In fact, all transactions, purchases, or sales were subject to a tax for his benefit, to say nothing of the tolls with which travelers for pleasure or trade filled his pocket. This lucrative position kept Master Colts in easy circumstances. If most of the peasants of the country were ground down by the usury of the Israelitish moneylenders, who were the real proprietors of the soil, the bureau had managed to escape. His goods were free from hypothecations, intabulations as they were called in this country, and he owed nothing. He would rather have lent than borrowed, and would certainly have done so without fleecing the poor people. He owned several pasturages, good grazing grounds for his flocks, lands under fair cultivation, although he would have nothing to do with the new methods. Vineyards, which flattered his vanity when he walked down the lines of stocks covered with the grapes he sold at a goodly profit, although he retained a fair portion for his private consumption. It need not be said that the house of Master Colts was the best in the village, at the angle of the terrace which crossed the long road as it ascended. A stone house, if you please, with its facade continued round onto the garden, its door between the third and fourth windows, with the festoons of verdure bordering the gutter with their slender branchlets with the two great beech trees spreading their boughs above the flowery thatch. Behind lay a fine orchard with its bed of vegetables like a chessboard, and its rows of fruit trees skirting the slopes of the hill. Inside the house were fine, clean rooms, some to dine in, some to sleep in, with their painted furniture, tables, beds, benches, and stools, their sideboards, on which shone the pots and dishes. The beams of the ceiling, from which hung vases decorated with ribbons and gaily colored stuffs, the heavy coffers, covered with cloths and quilts, which served as chests and cupboards, the white walls, the holly-colored portraits of Romanian patriots, amongst others the popular hero of the fifteenth century, the voivoda Veda Hunget. It was a charming house, which would have been too large for a man by himself. But Master Colts was not alone. A widower for twelve years, he had a daughter, the lovely Mariotta, who was much admired from verse to Vulcan, and even beyond. She might have been called by one of those strange pagan names, Florica, Diana, Danrichia, which are much in honor in Wallachian families. But no, she was Miriota, that is to say, the little sheep. But she had grown this little sheep, and was now a graceful girl of twenty, fair with brown eyes, a gentle look, charming features, and a pleasing figure. In truth, she could not look other than attractive, with her chemisette embroidered with red thread up to the collar, and on the wrists and on the shoulders, her petticoat clasped by a belt with silver buckles, her catrinza, or double atron, with red and blue stripes, knotted to her waist, her little boots of yellow leather, the light handkerchief on her head, her long hair floating behind her, the plate of which was ornamented with a ribbon or a metal clasp. Yes, a handsome girl was Mariota Colts, and, no harm to her, she was rich, that is, for this village lost in the depth of the Carpathians. A good manager? Undoubtedly, for she managed her father's house in intelligent fashion. Was she educated? Yes, at Magister Hermod School she had learned to read, to write, to cipher, and she ciphered, wrote, and read correctly. But she had not been pushed very far, and there were reasons for it. On the other hand, she knew about as much as was to be known of the Transylvania traditions and sagas. She knew as much as her master. She knew the legend of the Lini Co, the Rock of the Virgin, in which a rather fanciful princess escapes from the pursuit of the Tartars. The legend of the Dragon's Cave in the Valley of the King's Stairs. The legend of the Fortress of Diva, which was built in the days of the fairies, the legend of the Detunata, the thunderclap, that famous basaltic mountain like a giant stone fiddle on which the devil plays on stormy nights, the legend of Retyazat, with its summit cut down by a witch, the legend of the Valley of Thorda, which was cleft by the stroke of the sword of St. Ladislas. We must confess that Miriota believed in all these mythological fictions, but she was none the less a charming and amiable girl. A good many young men of the district found her so, even without considering that she was the only heiress of the Biro, Master Colts, the first magistrate of Verst. But there was no use in paying her attentions. Was she not already engaged to Nicholas Deck? 
A handsome type of Romanian was this Nicholas, or rather Nick Deck, twenty-five years of age, tall, strong in constitution, head well set in the shoulders, hair black, covered by the white culpac, look clear and frank, bearing himself well under his vest of lambskin embroidered with needlework, well set on his slender legs, legs as of a deer, and an air of determination in his gait and gestures. He was a forester by trade, that is to say, almost as much as a soldier as a civilian. As he owned a little land, under cultivation in the environs of Verst, he was approved of by the father, and as he was a good-looking, well-made fellow, he was approved of by the daughter, with whom he was deeply in love. He would not allow anyone to attempt to rival him, nor to look at her too closely, and no one thought of doing so. The marriage of Nick Deck and Mariotta Colts was to take place in a fortnight toward the middle of the approaching month. On that occasion the village would hold a general holiday. Master Colts would do the thing properly. He was no miser. If he liked getting money, he did not refuse to spend it when opportunity offered. When the ceremony was over, Nick Deck would take up his residence in the house which would be his when the buyer was gone. And when Mariotta knew he was near her, perhaps she would cease to fear, as she heard the creak of a door or the rattling of a window in the long winter nights, that some phantom escaped from her favorite legends was about to put in an appearance. To complete the list of the notables in verse, we must mention two more, and these not the least important, the schoolmaster and the doctor. Magister Herman was a big man in spectacles about forty-five years old, having always between his lips the curved stem of his pipe and a porcelain bowl, his hair thin and disordered on a fattish head, his face hairless, with a twitching in the left cheek. His great occupation was cutting the pens of his pupils, whom he forbade to use steel pens on principle, but how he lengthened the nibs of his old pointed pocket knife. With what precision and winking of his eye did he give the final touch by cutting the point? Above everything, good handwriting. To that all his efforts were directed. It was to that that a schoolmaster, careful of his mission, should urge his pupils. Instruction was of secondary importance, and we know what Magister Hermit taught and what the generations of boys and girls learnt on the benches of his school. And now for the turn of Dr. Patak. What, a doctor at worst, and yet the village still believed in the supernatural? Yes, but we might as well be clear as to the title borne by Dr. Patak, as we had to be that regarding that borne by Judge Colts. Patak was a little man with a prominent corporation, short and fat, aged about forty-five, ostensibly acting as medical adviser in Verst and his neighborhood. With his imperturbable self-confidence, his deafening loquacity, he inspired no less confidence than the shepherd Frick, and that is to say, little. He dealt in consultations and drugs, but so harmless were they that they were made no worse the petty ailments of his patients, who would have got well had they been left to themselves. People ate healthy enough in these parts. The air is of first quality. Epidemic maladies are there unknown. If people die, it is because they must, even in this privileged corner of Transylvania. As to Dr. Patak, yes, they called him doctor. He had had no education either in medicine or in pharmacy or in anything. He was merely an old quarantine attendant whose occupation consisted in looking after the travelers detained on the frontier for health purposes, nothing more. That it appeared, was enough for the easy-going people of Verst. It should be added, and there is nothing surprising in it, that Dr. Patak was a wide-awake fellow, as is usually the case with one who had to look after other people. And he believed in none of the superstitions current in the Carpathian district, not even in those that were cherished in the village. He laughed at them, he made fun of them, and when he was told that no one had dared to approach the castle from time immemorial, he would say, You must not dare me to visit the old hovel. But as they did not dare him, as they carefully kept from daring him, Dr. Patak had never been there, and with the help of credulity the castle of the Carpathians remained enveloped in impenetrable mystery. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 In a few minutes the news brought by the shepherd had spread in the village. Master Colts, carrying the precious telescope, went back into his house, followed by Nick Deck and Miriota. There now remained on the terrace only Frick, surrounded by about twenty men, women, and children, among whom were a few Saganes, who were not the least excited among the worst population. They surrounded Frick, they bombarded him with questions, and the shepherd replied with the superb importance of a man who had just seen something quite extraordinary. Yes, he repeated, the castle was smoking, it still smokes, and it will smoke until not one stone of it remains on another. But who could have lighted the fire? asked an old woman, with her hands clasped. The Chort, said Frick, giving the devil the name he is known by in the district. And he is the rascal who knows how to light a fire much better than how to put it out. And at that reply, everyone looked to try and find the smoke on top of the dungeon. 
In the end, most of them affirmed they could distinguish it perfectly, although it was quite invisible at that distance. The effect produced by this singular phenomenon exceeded everything imaginable. It is necessary to insist on this point. The reader must put himself in the place of the people of worst, and he will not be astonished at what follows. I do not ask him to believe in the supernatural, but to understand that this ignorant people believed in it without reservation. To the mistrust inspired by the castle of the Carpathians, which up to then was supposed to be deserted, was to be added the terror that it now seemed to be inhabited, and by such beings, good heavens! There was at worst a meeting place frequented by drinkers, and even beloved by those who, without drinking, delighted in talking over matters at the close of the day, the latter in small numbers, be it understood. This place, open to all, was the chief, or rather the only, inn in the village. Who was the proprietor of this inn? A Jew of the name of Jonas, a fine fellow of about sixty, of pleasing physiognomy, although rather Semitic, with black eyes, hook nose, long lip, smooth hair, and the traditional beard. Obsequious and obliging, he willingly lent little sums to one or other, without being too particular as to security, nor too usurious as regards interest although he expected to be paid on the dates fixed by the borrower. Would to heaven that the Jews in Transylvania were always as accommodating as the innkeeper of worst. Unfortunately, this excellent Jonas was an exception. His fellows in religion, his brethren by profession, for they are all innkeepers selling drinks and groceries, carrying on the trade of moneylenders with a bitterness that is not promising for the future of Romanian peasant. Gradually the land is passing from the native to the foreigner. In default of being repaid their advances, the Jews are becoming the proprietors of the finest farms mortgaged to their advantage, and if the promised land is not to be that of Israel, it may one day make its appearance in the maps of Transylvanian geography. The inn of the King Matthias, such is its name, occupies one of the corners of the terrace which crosses the main street of Worst and is immediately opposite the Bureau's house. It is an old structure, half wood, half stone, much patched in places, but a good deal covered with verdure and of very attractive appearance. It consists only of the ground floor, with a glass door giving access to the terrace. Inside, one first entered a large room furnished with tables for the glasses and benches for the drinkers, with a sideboard in varnished oak on which gleamed the dishes, pots, and bottles, and a counter of black wood, behind which Jonas stood ready for his customers. Light was obtained from two windows which were in the wall facing the terrace, and two others opposite each other in the outer walls. Of these, one was veiled by a thick curtain of climbing and hanging plants which screened the outer view and only allowed a little light to pass, while the other, when opened, gave an extensive view over the lower valley of the Vulcan. A few feet below it rolled the tumultuous waters of the Naiad torrent. On one side the torrent descended the slopes of the range from its rise on the plateau of Orgal, which was crowned by the castle buildings. On the other, abundantly fed by the mountain streams, even during summertime it flowed along the Wallachian sill, which absorbed it in its course. On the right, adjoining the large room, a half dozen of small rooms were enough to accommodate the few travelers who, before crossing the frontier, desired to rest at the King Matthias. They were of a good welcome at moderate charges, from an attentive and obliging landlord who was always well provided with good tobacco, which he bought in the best traffics of the neighborhood. As for Jonas himself, he occupied a narrow attic, the old-fashioned window of which patched the thatch with flowers and looked out on the terrace. In this inn, on this very night of the twenty-ninth of May, there were gathered all the wise heads of Worst, Master Colts, Magister Hermit, the forester Nick Deck, a dozen of the chief inhabitants, and also the shepherd Frick, who was not the least important of these personages. Dr. Patak was absent from this meeting of notables. Sent for in all haste by one of his old patients who was only waiting for him in order to pass away into another world, he had agreed to come to the inn as soon as his attentions were no longer necessary to the defunct. While waiting for the doctor, the company talked about the serious event of the day, but they did not talk without eating or drinking. To the hungry, Jonas offered that kind of hasty pudding, or maize pudding, known under the name of mammalia, which is not at all disagreeable when taken with new milk. To the others he offered many a small glass of those strong liqueurs, which roll like pure water down Romanian throats, or schnapps, costing about a farthing a glass, and more particularly, racchio, a strong spirit from plums, of which the consumption is considerable among the Carpathians. It should be mentioned that the landlord Jonas, it was the custom of the inn, only served the customers when they were sitting down, as he had observed that seated customers consume more copiously than consumers on their feet. This evening matters looked promising, for all the seats were full, and Jonas was going from one table to another, jug in hand, filling up the glasses that were constantly empty. It was half-past eight in the evening. 
They had been talking since dusk without deciding what they should do. But they were agreed on one point, and that was that if the castle of the Carpathians was inhabited by the unknown, it had become as dangerous to worst as a powder magazine would be at the gate of town. "'It is a serious affair,' said Master Colts. "'Very serious,' said the McEaster, between two puffs of his inseparable pipe. "'Very serious,' said the company. "'There is no doubt,' said Jonas, "'that the evil repute of the castle does much harm to the country round about.' "'And now,' said McEaster Harmon, "'there is the thing also. "'Strangers do not come here often,' said Master Colts with a sigh. "'And now they will not come at all,' added Jonas, "'sighing in unison with the bureau. "'Some of the people will be going away,' said one of the drinkers. "'I shall go first of all,' said the peasant from the outskirts, "'and I will go as soon as I can sell my vines.' "'For which you will find no buyers, old man,' said the tavern-keeper. One can see what these worthies were driving at in their talk. Amid the personal terrors occasioned them by the castle of the Carpathians rose the anxiety for their interests so regrettably injured. If there were no more travelers, Jonas would suffer in the revenue of his inn. If there were no more strangers, Master Colts would suffer in the receipt of the tolls, which gradually grew less. If there were no more buyers, the owners could not sell their lands even at a low price. That would last for years, and a situation, already very unsatisfactory, would become worse. In fact, if it had been so while the spirits of the castle had kept out of sight, what would it be now that they had manifested their presence by material acts? Then the shepherd, Frick, thought he ought to say something, but in a hesitating sort of way. "'Perhaps we may have to—' "'What?' asked Master Colts. "'Go there, Master, and see.' The company looked at each other and then lowered their eyes, and the question remained without reply. Then Jonas, addressing Master Colts, took up the word in a firm voice. Your shepherd, he said, has just pointed out the only thing we can do. Go to the castle? Yes, my good friends, said the innkeeper. If there is a smoke from the dungeon chimney, it is because there is a fire, and if there is a fire, it must have been lighted by a hand. A hand, at least a claw, said an old peasant, shaking his head. Hand or claw, said the innkeeper, what does it matter? We must know what it means. It is the first time the smoke had come out of the castle chimneys since Baron Rodolph of Gortz left it. "'But there might have been smoke without anybody noticing it,' said Mr. Kelts. "'That I will never admit,' said McGeester Hermit suddenly. "'But it might be,' replied the Bureau, "'if we had not got the telescope to watch what was happening at the castle. "'It was well said. "'The phenomenon might have happened frequently "'and escaped even the shepherd Frick, good as were his eyes. "'But anyhow, whether the said phenomenon were recent or not, "'it was certain that human beings were actually living at the castle of the Carpathians.' and this fact constituted an extremely disturbing state of things for the inhabitants of Vulcan and worse. Then McGeester Herman made this remark, in support of his belief. Human beings, my friends, you allow me not to believe it. Why should human beings think of taking refuge in the castle, and for what reason? And how did they get there? What do you think these intruders are, then? exclaimed Master Colts. Supernatural beings, said McGeester Herman in an opposing voice. Why should they not be spirits? goblins, perhaps even those dangerous lamias, which present themselves under the form of beautiful women. During this enumeration every look was directed toward the door, toward the windows, or toward the chimney of the big saloon of the King Matthias. And in truth the company asked themselves if they were not about to see one or another of those phantoms successively evoked by the schoolmaster. However, my good friend, said Jonas, if these beings are of that kind, I don't understand why they should have lighted the fire, for they have no cooking to do. And their sorceries, said the shepherd, do you forget that they want a fire for their sorceries? Evidently, said the McGeester, in a tone which admitted of no reply. The reply was accepted without protest, and in the opinion of all there could be no doubt that it must be supernatural and not human beings who had chosen the castle of the Carpathians as the scene of their operations. Up to this point, Nick Deck had taken no part in the conversation. He had been content to listen attentively to what was said by one and the other. The old castle with its mysterious walls, its ancient origin, its feudal appearance, had always inspired him with as much curiosity as respect. And being very brave, although he was as credulous as any inhabitant of Verst, he had more than once even manifested a desire to enter the old stronghold. As may be imagined, Miriota had obstinately set her face against so adventurous a project. He might have such ideas when he was free to do as he liked, but an engaged man was no longer his own master, and to embark in such adventures was the act of a madman, not of a lover. But notwithstanding her prayers, the lovely girl was always afraid that the forester would make some such attempt. What reassured her a little was that Nick Deck had not formally declared that he would go to the castle, for no one had sufficient influence over him to stop him, not even herself. She knew him to be an obstinate, resolute man who would never go back on his promise. If he said a thing, the thing was as good as done, 
and Mariota would have been all anxiety had she suspected what the young man was thinking about. However, as Nick Deck said nothing, the shepherd's proposition received no reply. Visit the castle of the Carpathians now that it was haunted? Who would be mad enough to do that? And all those present discovered the best reasons for not doing anything. The bureau was no longer of an age to venture over so rough a road. The magister had to look after his school. Jonas had to look after his inn. Frick had his sheep to attend to, and the other peasants had to busy themselves with their cattle and their pastures. No, not one would venture, all of them saying to themselves, he who dares go to the castle may never come back. At this moment the door suddenly opened to the great alarm of the company. It was only Dr. Patak, and it would have been difficult to mistake him for one of those bewitching lamias of whom Magister Hermit had been speaking. His patient being dead, which did honor to his medical acumen if not to his talent, Dr. Patak had hurried on to the meeting at the King Matthias. Here he is at last, said Master Colts. Dr. Patak hastily shook hands with everybody, much as if he were distributing drugs, and, in a somewhat ironical tone, remarked, Then, my friends, it is the castle, the castle of the chort you are busy about. Oh, you cowards! But if the old castle wants to smoke, let it smoke. Does not our learned hermit smoke, and smoke all day? Really, the whole country is in a state of terror. I have heard of nothing else during my visits. Somebody has returned and made a fire over there, and why not if they have got a cold in the head? It would seem that it freezes in the month of May in the rooms of the dungeon, unless there is some bread cooking for the other world. I suppose they want food in that place. That is, if they come to life again? Perhaps they are some of the heavenly bakers who have come to start their oven. And so on in the series of jests that were much to the distaste of the worst people, who made no attempt to stop him. At last the bureau asks, And so, doctor, do you attach no importance to what is taking place at the castle? None, Master Colts. Have you never said you were ready to go there, if anyone dared you to do so? I, answered the doctor, with a certain look of annoyance at anyone reminding him of his words. Yes, have you not said so much more than once, asked the McGeester? I have said so, certainly, and there is no need to repeat it. But there is need to do it, said Hermod. To do it? Yes, and instead of daring you, we are content to ask you to do it, added Master Colts. You understand, my friends, certainly, such a proposal. Well, since you hesitate, said the innkeeper, we want to ask you. We will dare you. Dare me? Yes, doctor. Jonas, said the bureau, you are going too far. There is no need to dare, Patak. We know he is a man of his word. What he has said, he will do, if only to render a service to the village and to the whole country. But this is serious. You want me to go to the castle of the Carpathians, said the doctor, whose red face had become quite pale. You cannot get out of it, said Master Colts. I beg you, good friends, I beg you to be reasonable, if you please. We are reasonable, said Jonas. Be just, then. What is the use of my going there? What shall I find? A few good fellows have taken refuge in the castle, who are doing no harm to anyone. Well, replied Magister Hermit, if they are good fellows, you have nothing to fear from them. It will be an opportunity for you to offer them your services. If they need them, said Dr. Patak, if they send for me, I should not hesitate to go to the castle. But I do not go without an invitation, and I do not pay visits for nothing. We will pay you, said Master Colts, and at so much an hour. Who will pay you? I will. We will, at any rate you like, replied the majority of Jonas's customers. Evidently, in spite of his bluster, the doctor was as big a coward as the rest of worst. But after having posed as a superior person, after having ridiculed the popular legends, he found it difficult to refuse the service he was asked to render. But to go to the castle of the Carpathians, even if he were paid for his journey, was in no way agreeable to him. He therefore endeavored to show that the visit would produce no result, that the village was covering itself with ridicule and sending him to explore the castle. But his arguments hung fire. "'Look here, doctor,' said Magister Hermit. "'It seems to me that you have absolutely nothing to fear. You do not believe in spirits.' "'No, I do not believe in them.' "'Well, then, if they are not spirits who have returned to the castle, they are human beings who have taken up their quarters there, and you can get on all right with them.' The schoolmaster's reasoning was logical enough. It was difficult to get out of. Agreed, Hermit, said the doctor, but I might be detained at the castle. Then you will be welcome there, said Jonas. Certainly, but if my absence is prolonged, and if someone in the village wants me... We are all wonderfully well, said Master Colts, and there is not a single invalid in worse now your last patient has taken his departure for the other world. Speak frankly, said the inkerber. Will you go? No, I will not, said the doctor. Oh, it is not because I am afraid. You know I have no faith in these sorceries. The truth is, it seems to me absurd, and I repeat, ridiculous because a smoke has appeared at the dungeon chimney, a smoke which may not be a smoke, certainly not. I will not go to the castle of the Carpathians. I will go. It was the forester, Nick Deck, who had suddenly joined in the conversation. 
You, Nick, exclaimed Master Colts. I, but on condition, Patak goes with me. This was a direct thrust for the doctor, who gave a jump as if to avoid it. You think that, Forrester, said he, I, to go with you? Certainly. It will be a pleasant expedition for both of us, if it is of any use. Look here, Nick, you know well enough there is no road to the castle. We shall not get there. I have said I will go to the castle, replied Nick Deck, and as I have said so, I will go. But I have not said so, exclaimed the doctor, struggling as if someone had gripped him by the collar. But you have, said Jonas. Yes, yes, replied the company unanimously. The doctor, pressed on all sides, did not know how to escape. Ah, how much he regretted that he had so imprudently committed himself by his rhodomontandes. Never had he imagined that they would have been taken seriously, or that he would have to account for them in person. And now there was no chance of escape without becoming the laughing stock of Verst. And in all the Vulcan district they would badger him unmercifully. He decided to accept the inevitable with good grace. Well, since you wish it, he said, I will go with Nick Deck, although it will be useless. Well done, Patak, shouted all the company at the King Matthias. And when shall we start, Forrester? asked Dr. Patak, affecting to speak in a tone of indifference which poorly disguised his paltoonery. Tomorrow morning, said Nick Deck. These words were followed by a long silence, which showed how real were the feelings of Master Colts and the others. The glasses were empty, so were the pots, but no one rose. No one thought of leaving the place, although it was late, nor of returning home. It occurred to Jonas there was a good opportunity for serving another round of schnapps and rakia. Suddenly a voice was heard distinctly amid the general silence, and these words were slowly pronounced. Nicholas Deck, do not go to the castle tomorrow. Do not go there, or misfortune will happen to you. Who was it said this? Whence came the voice which no one knew, and which seemed to come from an invisible mouth? It could not be a voice from a phantom, a supernatural voice, a voice from another world. Terror was at its height. The men dared not look at one another. They dared not even utter a word. The bravest, and that evidently was Nick Deck, endeavored to discover what it all meant. It was evident that the words had been uttered in the room. The forester went up to the box and opened it. Nobody. And then looked into the rooms which opened into the saloon. Nobody. He opened the door, went outside, ran along the terrace to the main street of Worst. Nobody. A few minutes afterwards, Master Colts, Magister Hermit, Dr. Patak, Nick Deck, Shepherd Frick, and the others had left the inn and his keeper Jonas, who hastened to double-lock the door. That night, as if it had been menaced by some apparition, the inhabitants of Worst strongly barricaded themselves in their houses. Terror reigned in the village. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 In the morning, Nick Deck and Dr. Patak prepared to start at nine o'clock. The forester's intention was to ascend the Vulcan and take the shortest way to the suspicious castle. After the phenomenon of the smoke of the dungeon, after the phenomenon of the voice heard in the saloon of the King Matthias, we need not be astonished at the people being as if deranged. Some of the Seguins already spoke of leaving the district. During the night, nothing else had been spoken of at home, and in a low voice. Could there be any doubt that it was the Chort who had spoken in so threatening a way to the young forester? At Jonas's inn there had been about fifty people, and these the most worthy of belief, who had all heard the strange words. To suppose that they had all been duped by some illusion of the senses was inadmissible. There could be no doubt that Nick Deck had been formally warned that misfortune would overtake him if he persisted in his intention of visiting the castle of the Carpathians. And yet the young forester was preparing to leave Worst, and without being forced to do so. In fact, whatever advantage Master Colts might gain in cleaning up the mystery of the castle, whatever interest the village might have in knowing what was taking place, a powerful effort had been made to get Nick Deck to go back on his word. Weeping and in despair, with her beautiful eyes wet with tears, Miriota had besought him not to persist in this adventure. After the warning given by the voice, it was a serious matter. It was a mad adventure. On the eve of his marriage, Nick Deck was about to risk his life in the attempt, and his betrothed clung to his knees to prevent him, but all in vain. Neither the objurations of his friends nor the tears of Miriota had any effect on the young forester. And no one was surprised at it. They knew his indomitable character, his tenacity, his obstinacy, if you will. He had said he would go to the castle of the Carpathians, and nothing would stop him, not even the threat which had been addressed straight to him. Yes, he would go to the castle even if he never returned. When the hour of the parting came, Nick Deck pressed Miriota for the last time to his heart, while the poor girl made the sign of the thumb and two first fingers, according to Romanian custom, which is an emblem of the Holy Trinity. 
And Dr. Patak? Well, Dr. Patak had tried to get out of it, but without success. All that could be said, he had said. All the objections imaginable, he had mentioned. He tried to entrench himself behind the formal injunction not to go to the castle, which had been so distinctly heard. That menace only concerns me, said Nick Deck. But if anything happens to you, Forrester, said Dr. Patak, shall I get away without injury? Injury or not, you have promised to come with me to the castle, and you will come because I am going. Seeing that nothing would prevent his keeping his promise, the people of Worst had resolved to help the Forrester. It was better that Nick Deck should not enter alone on this affair, and, much to his disgust, the doctor, feeling that he could not go back, that it would compromise his position in the village, that it would be a disgrace for him to go back after all his boastings, resigned himself to the adventure with terror in his soul, and fully resolved to profit by the least obstacle on the road to make his companion turn back. Nick Deck and Dr. Patak set out, and Master Colts, Magister Hermit, Frick, and Jonas accompanied them up to a turning out on the main road, where they stopped. Here Master Colts for the last time brought his telescope, which he was never without, to bear on the castle. There was now no smoke from the dungeon chimney, and it would have been easy to see it on the clear horizon of a beautiful spring morning, were they to conclude that the guests, natural or supernatural, of the castle had vanished on finding that the forester took no heed of their threats. Some of them thought so, and therein appeared a decisive reason for bringing the adventure to a satisfactory termination. And so they all shook hands, and Nick Deck, dragging the doctor away with him, disappeared round the hill. The young forester was in full visiting costume, laced cap with large peak, belted vest with a cutlass in his sheath, baggy trousers, iron-shod boots, cartridge belt at his waist, and long gun on his shoulder. He had the deserved reputation of being a first-rate shot, and in default of ghosts, it was as well to be prepared for robbers or even bears with evil intentions. The doctor had armed himself with an old flint pistol, which missed fire three times out of five. He also carried a hatchet which his companion had given him in case it was necessary to cut away through the thick underwoods of Plaza. He wore a large country hat and was buttoned up in a thick traveling cape and shod with big iron-soled boots, but this heavy costume would not have stopped him from running away if opportunity presented itself. Both he and Nick Deck carried a few provisions in their wallets, so as to prolong the exploration if necessary. After leaving the by-road, Nick Deck and the doctor went along the right bank of the Nyad for a few hundred yards. Had they followed the road which winds through the valleys, they would have gone too far to the westward. It was a pity they could not follow the river and thereby reduce their distance by a third, for the Nyad rises in the folds of the Orgal Plateau. But though it was practicable at first, the bank became eventually so deeply cut into by ravines and barbed with rocks that progress along it was impossible even to pedestrians. They had, therefore, to bear way obliquely to the left so as to return to the castle after traversing the lower belt of the place of forests and this was the only side on which the castle was approachable from where they were. When it had been inhabited by Count Rodolphe de Gortz, the communication between the village of Verst, the Vulcan Hill, and the Valley of Sill had been through a gap which had been opened in this direction. But abandoned for twenty years to the invasions of vegetation, it had become obstructed by inextricable thicket of underwood, and the trace of a footpath or a passage would be sought for in vain. When they left the deep bed of the Nyad, which was filled with roaring water, Nick Deck stopped to take his bearings. The castle was no longer visible. It would only appear again beyond the curtain of force, which stood in rows one above the other on the lower slopes of the mountain, an arrangement common to the whole orographic system of the Carpathians. As there was no landmark, the direction was not easily made out. It could only be arrived at from the position of the sun, whose rays were lighting up the distant crests in the southwest. You see, Forrester, said the doctor, you see there is not even a road, or rather, no more road. There will be one, said Nick Deck. That's easy to say, Nick. And easy to do, Patak. You are resolved, then? The forester was content to reply by an affirmative gesture, and started off towards the trees. The doctor had a strong inclination to retrace his steps, but his companion, happening to turn around, gave him such a determined look that he thought it better not to remain behind. Dr. Patak then conceived another hope. Nick Deck might get lost amid this labyrinth of woods where his duties had not yet called him. But he reckoned without that marvelous scent, that professional instinct, that animal aptitude, so to speak, which takes notice of the least indications, projections of branches in such and such directions, irregularities of the ground, colors of the bark, hues of the mosses as they are exposed to different winds. Nick Deck was a perfect master of his trade, and practiced it with too much sagacity to go astray even in localities unknown to him. He was worthy to be ranked with Leatherstocking or Chingachgook in the land of Cooper. But the crossing of this zone of trees was not free from real difficulties. Elms, beeches, a few of those maples known as false plains, 
mighty oaks occupied the first line up to the line of the birches pines and spruces massed on the high shoulders of the call to the left magnificent were these trees with their powerful stems their boughs warm with the new sap their thick leafage intermingling to form a roof of verdure which the sun's rays could not pierce by stooping beneath the lower branches a passage was relatively easy but many were the obstacles on the surface of the ground and much work was needed to clear them away to get through the nettles and briars to avoid the thousands of thorns that clung to them at the least touch nick deck was not a man to become anxious about these matters and providing he got through the wood he did not worry himself about a few scratches the advance however under such conditions was necessarily slow and that was regrettable for nick deck and dr patak wished to reach the castle in the afternoon in order that they might return to worst before night hatchet in hand the forester worked at clearing a passage through these thick thorn bushes bristling with vegetable bayonets in which the foot met a rugged soil hammocky broken with roots or stumps to stumble over when it did not sink in a swampy bed of dead leaves which the wind had never swept away myriads of pods shot off like fulminating peas to the great alarm of the doctor who started back at the crackle and came again when some twig would catch on his vest like a claw that wished to keep him no poor man he was not at all comfortable but now he dared not return alone and he had to make an effort to keep up with his intractable companion occasionally capricious clearings appeared in the forest a shower of light would penetrate it a couple of black storks disturbed in their solitude escaped from the higher branches and flew off with powerful strokes of the wing the crossing of these clearings made the advance still more fatiguing in them were piled up enormous masses of trees blown down by the storm or fallen from old age as if the axe of the woodsman had given them a death stroke there lay enormous trunks eaten into with decay which no tool would ever cut into billets and no wagon ever carry to the bed of the Wallachian sill. Faced by these obstacles, which were difficult to clear and at times impossible to turn, Nick Deck and his companions had no easy time of it. If the young forester, active, supple, vigorous, managed well, the doctor with his short legs, his large corporation, breathless and exhausted, could not save himself from occasional falls, and Nick had to come to his assistance. "'You will see, Nick, that I shall end by breaking one of my limbs,' he said. "'You will patch it up if you do.' Come, Forrester, be reasonable. We need not strive against the impossible. But Nick Deck was already on in front, and the doctor, obtaining no reply, hastened to rejoin him. Were they in the right direction to come out in front of the castle? They would have been puzzled to prove it, but as the ground was on the rise all the time, they must be reaching the edge of the forest, and they arrived there at three o'clock in the afternoon. Beyond, up to the plateau of the Orgal, extended the curtain of green trees, much more scattered the further they were up the mountain. The naiad appeared among the rocks either because it had curved to the northwest, or because Nick Deck had struck off obliquely towards it. The young forester was thus assured he had made a good course, for the brook took its rise in the Orgal Plateau. Nick Deck could not refuse the doctor an hour's rest on the bank of the torrent. Besides, the stomach claimed its due as well as the limbs. The wallets were well furnished. Rakiao filled the doctor's flask as well as Nick's. Besides, water, fresh and limpid, filtered amid the pebbles below, and flowed a few paces off. What more could they desire? They had lost much. They must repair the loss. Since their departure, the doctor had scarcely had the leisure to talk with Nick Deck, who had been in front of him all the time. But he made up for lost time when they were seated on the bank of the Naiad. If one was not talkative, the other fully made up for it, and we need not be astonished if the questions were prolix and the answers brief. Let us talk a little, Forrester, and talk seriously, said the doctor. I am listening to you, replied Nick Deck. I think we halted here to recover our strength. Nothing could be more correct. Before returning to Worst? No, before going to the castle. But, Nick, we've been walking for six hours, and we are hardly halfway. That shows we have no time to lose. But we shall not reach the castle before night. And as I imagine, Forrester, you will not be mad enough to run any risks until you have had a clear view of it. We shall have to wait for daylight. We will wait for daylight. And so you will not give up this project, which has no common sense in it? No. What? Here we are exhausted, wanting a good table and a good room, and a good bed and a good room, and you're going to pass the night in the open air? Yes, if any obstacle prevents us from penetrating into the castle. And if there is no obstacle, we will sleep in the rooms in the dungeon. The rooms in the dungeon, exclaimed Dr. Patak. Do you think, Forrester, that I shall ever consent to spend a whole night inside that cursed castle? Certainly, unless you prefer to stay outside alone. Alone, Forrester? That was not in the bargain, and if we were to separate, I would rather start at once and go back to the village. 
It was in the bargain that you would follow me into the castle. In the day, yes. In the night, no. Well, you can go if you like, but take care you do not get lost in the thickets. Lost. That was what troubled the doctor, abandoned to himself, unaccustomed to these interminable circuits in the place of forests. He felt he was incapable of finding the way back to worst. Besides, to be alone when night fell, a very dark night, perhaps, to descend the slopes of the hill at the risk of collapsing in the bottom of a ravine, that certainly was not agreeable to him. He was freed from having to enter the castle when the sun was down, and if the forester persisted, he had better follow him up to the enclosure. But the doctor made a last effort to stop his companion. "'You know well, my dear Nick,' he continued, "'that I will never consent to separate from you. If you persist in going to the castle, I would not allow you to go there alone.' Well spoken, Dr. Patak. I think you ought to stick to that. No. One more word, Nick. If it is night when we arrive, promise me not to try to enter the castle. What I promised you, Doctor, is not to go back one footstep until I have discovered what is going on there. What is going on there, Forrester? said Dr. Patak, shrugging his shoulders. But what do you want to go on there? I know nothing, and if I have made up my mind to know, I will know. "'But shall we ever reach this devil's castle?' asked the doctor, whose arguments were exhausted. "'To judge by the difficulty we have had up to now, and the time it has taken us to get through the place of forts, the day will end before we are in sight of the wall.' "'I do not think so,' said Nick Deck. "'In the higher ranges the pines have no such thickets as do the elms or maples or beeches. But the ground is rough. What does that matter if it is not impracticable? But I believe that bears are met with on the outskirts of the plateau.' I have my gun, and you have your pistol to defend yourself with, doctor. But if night falls, we may be lost in the darkness. No, for we now have a guide, which guide will, I hope, not leave us any more. A guide, exclaimed the doctor, and he rose abruptly to cast an anxious look around him. Yes, said Nick, and this guide is the naiad. We have only to go up to the right bank to reach the very crest of the plateau where it takes its source. I think we shall be at the castle gate in two hours, if we get on the road without delay. In two hours, if not in six, replied the doctor. Are you ready? Already, Nick, already? Why, our halt has only lasted a few minutes. A few minutes which make a good half hour. For the last time, are you ready? Ready, when my legs are like lumps of lead? You know well enough, Nick Deck, my legs are not Forrester's legs. My feet are swollen in my boots, and it's cruel to make me follow you. Ah, you annoy me, Patak. You can go back alone if you like. Pleasant journey to you. And Nick rose. "'For the love of God, Forrester,' cried Dr. Patak, "'listen to me. Listen to your foolery. It is already late. Why not remain here? Why not encamp under the shelter of these trees? We can start at daylight and have all the morning to reach the plateau.' "'Doctor,' replied Nick Deck, "'I tell you again it is my intention to spend the night in the castle.' "'No,' cried the doctor. "'No, you shall not do it, Nick. I will stop you. You? I will cling to you. I will drag you back. I will thrash you if necessary.' The unfortunate doctor did not know what he was saying. As to Nick Deck, he did not even reply. Putting his arm through the gun strap, he started to go up the naiad. "'Wait! Wait!' cried the doctor piteously. "'What a fiend of a man! One moment! My limbs are stiff, my joints will not work!' But they soon had to work, for the doctor had to trot along on his little legs to catch up to the forester, who never looked back. It was four o'clock. The solar rays just tipped the crest of the plaza, which intercepted them, and by an oblique reflection lighted up the higher branches of the pine forest. Nick Deck had cause to hurry, for the woods below were growing dark at the decline of day. Of a different character were the higher forests, which consisted mainly of the commoner alpine species. Instead of being deformed and twisted and gnarled, the stems were straight and upright and far apart, and bare of branches for fifty or sixty feet from their roots, and then their evergreen verdure spread out like a roof. There was little brushwood or entanglement at their base, but the long roots crept along the ground as if it were snakes grown torpid with the cold. The ground was carpeted with close, yellowish moss, scattered over with dry twigs, and dotted with cones which crackled under the feet. The slope was rough and furrowed with crystalline rocks, the sharp edges of which made themselves felt through the thickest leather. For a quarter of a mile the passage through the pine wood was difficult. To climb these blocks required a suppleness of vigor and a sureness of foot which Dr. Patak could no longer claim. Nick Deck would have got through in an hour if he had been there alone, but it took him three with the hindrance of his companion, whom he had to stop to attend to and to help him over rocks too high for his little legs. The doctor had but one fear, a terrible fear, that of being left alone in these gloomy solitudes. However, if the slopes became more painful to climb, the trees began to get thinner and thinner on the place of ridge. They were now in isolated clumps and of a small size. 
Between these clumps could be seen the ranges of mountains in the background, with their outlines still traceable in the evening mist. The torrent of the naiad, which the forester had continued to follow, was now not larger than a brook, and rose not so very far off. A few hundred feet above the last folds of the ground lay the rounded plateau of Orgal, crowned by the castle buildings. Nick Dick at length reached the plateau after a final effort which reduced the doctor to the state of an inert mass. The poor man had not the strength to drag himself twenty yards further, and he fell like the ox before the axe of the butcher. Nick Deck hardly felt the fatigue of this painful ascent. Erect, motionless, he devoured with his gaze this castle of the Carpathians he had never before been so near. Before his eyes lay a crenellated wall, defended by a deep ditch, the only drawbridge of which was drawn up against the gate, surrounded by a ring of stone. Around the wall, on the plateau, all was bare and silent. In the twilight, the mass of castle buildings was confusedly distinguishable. There was no one visible on either wall or dungeon, nor on the circular terrace. Not a trace of smoke curled around the vein. "'Well, Forrester,' said Dr. Batak, "'are you convinced that it is possible to cross the ditch, lower the drawbridge, and open the gate?' Nick Deck did not reply. He saw that it would be necessary to halt before the castle walls. Amid the darkness, how could he descend into the ditch and climb the slope so as to enter the wall? Evidently the best thing to do was to wait for the coming dawn and work in broad daylight. And that was what it was decided to do, to the great annoyance of the forester and the extreme satisfaction of the doctor. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 The thin crescent of the moon, like a silver sickle, disappeared almost as soon as the sun set. A few clouds rising in the west soon extinguished the last gleams of twilight. Darkness gradually rose from below and covered all. The ring of mountains was blotted out in obscurity, and the castle soon disappeared beneath the pall of night. If the night promised to be very dark, there was nothing to indicate that it would be troubled by any atmospheric disturbance, rain, or storm. And this was fortunate for Nick Deck and his companion, who were about to encamp in the open air. There was no clump of trees on this barren plateau of Orgal. Here and there were a few shrubs, which afforded no shelter against the nocturnal cold. There were rocks in plenty, others in such a state of equilibrium that the slightest push would have sent them rolling down into the fir woods. The only plant that grew in profusion on the rocky soil was a thistle known as Russian thorn, whose seeds, says L.S.A. Recluse, were carried in their coats by the Muscovite horses, a present of cheerful conquest which the Russians gave the Transylvanians. A search was made for a more comfortable place in which to pass the night and which would afford some shelter against the fall in temperature, which is remarkable in these altitudes. "'We have more than chances enough to be miserable,' murmured Dr. Patak. "'Are you not satisfied, then?' asked Nick Deck. "'Certainly not. What a splendid place to catch a good cold, or the rheumatism, which I do not know how I shall ever get cured of.' A very artless confession on the part of the old quarantine officer. How he regretted his comfortable little house at worst, with its room so snug and its bed so well furnished with pillows and counterpane. Among the stones in the Orgal Plateau, one had to be selected whose position offered the best shelter against the southwest wind, which was beginning to freshen. This was what Nick Deck did, and soon the doctor joined him behind a large rock which was as flat as a table on its upper surface. This stone was one of those stone benches amid the scabuses and saxifrages which are frequently met with at the turnings of the road in Wallachia. While the traveler sits on them, he can quench his thirst with the water contained in the vase placed on them, and which is every day renewed by the country people. When Baron Rodolf de Gortz lived in the castle, this bench bore a bowl which his family servants never left empty. But now it was dirty and worn and covered with green mosses, and the least shock would have reduced it to dust. At the end of the seat rose a granite shaft, the remains of an ancient cross, nothing being left of the arms, although a half-effaced groove showed where they had been. Dr. Patak, being a strong-minded man, was unable to admit that this cross would protect him against supernatural apparitions. But by an anomaly common to a good many of the incredulous, although he did not believe in God, he was not very far from believing in the devil. In his heart he believed the chort was not far off. He it was that haunted the castle, and neither the closed gate, the raised drawbridge, the lofty wall, nor the deep ditch would keep him from coming out, if the fancy took him, to come and twist both their necks. And when the doctor saw that he had to spend a whole night under these conditions, he shuddered with terror. No, it was too much to require of a human creature, and it would be more than the most energetic of circumstances he could bear. And then an idea came to him tardily, an idea he had not thought of before he left Worst. It was Thursday evening, and on that day, the people of the district, the country people, were careful not to go out after sundown. 
Thursday they knew to be the day of evil deeds. Their legends told them that if they ventured abroad on that day, they ran the risk of meeting with some evil spirit, and so no one moved about on the roads and byways after nightfall. And here was Dr. Patak, not only away from home, but close to a haunted castle, two or three miles from the village, and here he would have to stop until the dawn came, if it ever came again. In truth, this was simply tempting the devil. Deep in these thoughts, the doctor saw the forester carefully take out of his bag a piece of cold meat after having a good drink from his flask. The best thing, it occurred to him, was to do likewise, and he did so. A leg of a goose, a thick slice of bread, the whole well moistened with rakiao, was the least he could take to revive his strength. But if that calmed his hunger, it did not calm his fears. Now let us sleep, said Nick Deck as soon as he had put his bag at the foot of the stone. Sleep, Forrester? Good night, doctor. Good night. That is easy to wish, but I am afraid it will not end well. Nick Deck, being in no humor for conversation, made no reply. Accustomed by his vocation to sleep amid the woods, he threw himself down close to the stone seat and was soon in a deep sleep. And the doctor could but grumble between his teeth when he heard his companion breathing at regular intervals. As for him, it was impossible for him for some minutes to deaden his senses of hearing and seeing. In spite of his fatigue, he continued to see and to listen. His brain was a prey to those extravagant visions which are due to the troubles of insomnia. What was he looking for in the depths of darkness? The hazy shapes of the objects which surrounded him, the scattered clouds across the sky, the almost imperceptible mass of the castle? The rocks on the Orgal Plateau seemed to be moving in a sort of infernal saraband, and if they were to crumble on their bases, slip down the slope, roll onto the two adventurers and crush them at the castle gate to which admission was denied them? The unhappy doctor got up. He listened to the noises which are ever present on lofty tablelands, those disquieting murmurs which seemed to whisper and groan and sigh. He heard the nyctalops fanning the rocks with frenzied wing, the striges in their nocturnal flight, and two or three pairs of funereal owls whose hooting echoed like a cry of pain. Then his muscles contracted all at once, and his body trembled, bathed in icy perspiration. In this way the long hours went by until midnight. If the doctor had been able to talk, to exchange but a few words now and then, to give free course to his recriminations, he would have been less afraid. But Nick Deck slept and slept in deep slumber. Midnight, a terrible hour for all, the hour of apparitions, the hour of evil deeds. What could it be? The doctor had just got up again. He was asking himself if he were awake or if he were suffering from a nightmare. Overhead he thought he saw... No, he really did see the strangest of shapes lighted by a spectral light pass from one horizon to the other, rise, fall, and drift down with the clouds. They looked like monsters, dragons with serpents' tails, hippogriffs with huge wings, gigantic krakens, enormous vampires, fighting to seize him in their claws or swallow him in their jaws. Then everything appeared to be in motion on the Orgal Plateau, the rocks, the trees at its edge, and very distinctly a clanging at short intervals reached his ear. The bell, he murmured, the castle bell. Yes, it was indeed the bell of the old chapel, and not that of the church at Vulcan, which the wind would have borne in the opposite direction. And now the strokes became more hurried, the hand that struck no longer told a funereal knell. No, it was an alarm, whose urgent strokes were awakening the echoes of the Transylvanian frontier. As he listened to these dismal vibrations, Dr. Patak was seized with a convulsive fear, an insurmountable anguish, an irresistible terror which thrilled his whole body with cold shudderings. But the forester had been awakened by the alarming clanging of the bell. He rose, while Dr. Patak seemed as if beside himself. Nick Deck listened, and his eyes tried to pierce the deep darkness which overhung the castle. "'That bell! That bell!' repeated Dr. Patak. "'It is the chort that is ringing it.' Decidedly, the poor, terrified doctor was thinking more than ever of the devil. The forester remained motionless, and did not reply. Suddenly a series of roars, as if from some huge animal at a harbor's mouth, broke forth in tumultuous undulations. For a long distance around the air resounded with his deafening growl. Then a light darted from the center of the dungeon, an intense light, from which leapt flashes of penetrating clearness and blinding coruscations. From what could come this powerful light, the irradiations of which spread in long sheets over the Orgal Plateau? From what furnace came the photogenic stream, which seemed to embrace the rocks at the same time as it bathed them in a strange lividity? "'Nick! Nick!' exclaimed the doctor. "'Look at me! Am I a corpse like you?' In fact, they had both assumed a corpse-like look. Their faces were pallid, their eyes seemed to have gone, the orbits being apparently empty, 
Their cheeks were grayish-green, like the mosses which the legends say grow on the heads of those that are hanged. Nick Deck was astonished at what he saw, at what he heard. Dr. Patak was in the last stage of fright. His muscles retracted, his skin bristled, his pupils dilated, his body was seized with titanic frigidity. As the poet of the contemplations remarks, he breathed in terror. A minute, a minute or more, lasted this terrifying phenomenon. When the strange light gradually went out, the groaning ceased, and the Orgal Plateau resumed its silence and obscurity. Neither of the men thought any more of sleep. The doctor, overwhelmed with stupor, the forester upright against a stone seat, awaited the return of the dawn. What did Nick Deck think of these things, which were evidently so supernatural to his eyes? Were they not enough to shake his resolution? Did he still intend to pursue this reckless adventure? Certainly he had said that he would enter the castle, that he would explore the dungeon. But was it not enough for him to come to its insurmountable wall, to have evoked the anger of its guardian spirits, and provoked this trouble of the elements? Would he be reproached with not having kept to his promise if he returned to the village without having urged his folly to the end in entering this diabolical castle? Suddenly the doctor threw himself upon him, seized him by the hand, and strove to drag him away, saying in a hoarse voice, Come, come. No, said Nick Deck, and in turn he caught hold of Dr. Patak, who fell at this last effort. At last the night ended, and such was their mental state that neither Forster nor Doctor knew the time that elapsed until daybreak. They remembered nothing of the hours which preceded the first rays of the morning. At that moment a rosy streak appeared on the crest of Paring, on the eastern horizon, on the other side of the valley of the two sills. The faint white rays of dawn dispersed over the depth of the sky, and striped it as if it were a zebra skin. Nick Deck turned toward the castle. He saw it grow clearer and clearer. The dungeon revealed itself from the high mists which came floating down the Vulcan slope. The chapel, the galleries, the outer walls emerged from the nocturnal mists, and there on the corner bastion appeared the beech tree, with its leaves rustling in the easterly breeze. There was no change in the ordinary aspect of the castle. The bell was as motionless as the old feudal weather vane. No smoke arose from the dungeon chimneys, and the barred windows remained obstinately closed. Above the platform, in the higher zones of the sky, a few birds were flying and gently calling to each other. Nick Deck turned to look at the principal entrance to the castle. The drawbridge up against the bay closed the postern between the two stone pillars which bore the arms of the barons of Gortz. Had the forester resolved to continue this adventurous expedition to the end? Yes, and his resolution had not been shaken by the events of the night. A thing said was a thing done. That was his motto, as we know. Neither the mysterious voice which had threatened him personally in the saloon of the King Matthias, nor the inexplicable phenomenon of sound and light he had just witnessed, would stop him from entering the castle. An hour would be enough for him to hurry through the galleries, visit the keep, and then, having fulfilled this promise, he would return to Worst, where he would arrive during the morning. As to Dr. Patak, he was now only an inert machine, without either the strength to resist or to insist. He would go wherever he was driven. If he fell, it would be impossible to lift him again. The terrors of the night had reduced him to complete imbecility, and he made no observation when the forester pointed to the castle and said, Come on. And yet the day had returned, and a doctor could have gone back to worse without fear of losing himself in the place of forests. He had no reason to wish to remain with Nick Deck, and if he did not abandon his companion and return to the village, it was that he was no longer conscious of the state of affairs, and was merely a body without a mind. And so, when the forester dragged him toward the slope of the counterscarp, he made no resistance. But was it possible to enter the castle otherwise than by the gate? That was what Nick Deck endeavored to discover. The wall showed no breach, no falling in, no excavation, giving access to the interior. It was indeed surprising that these old walls were in such a state of preservation, but this was doubtless due to their thickness. To climb to the line of crenellations which crowned them appeared to be impractical, as they rose some forty feet above the ditch and it seemed as though Nick Deck, at the very moment of reaching the castle of the Carpathians, was to fail owing to insurmountable obstacles. Fortunately, or very unfortunately for him, there stood above the posture in a sort of loophole, or rather an embrasure, through which formerly pointed the muzzle of a culverin. By making use of one of the chains of the drawbridge, which hung down to the ground, it would not be very difficult for an active, vigorous man to hoist himself up to this embrasure. Its width was sufficient to allow of a man to pass, unless it was barred on the inside, and Nick Deck could probably manage to get through it within the castle. The forester saw at once that this was the only way open to him, and that is why, followed by the unconscious doctor, he went obliquely down the inner slope of the counterscarp. They were soon at the bottom of the ditch, which was strewn with stones amid the thickets of wild plants. 
They could hardly find a place to step. They were not sure that myriads of venomous beasts did not swarm in the herbage of this humid excavation. In the middle of the ditch, and parallel to the wall, was the ancient trench, now nearly dry, which they could just stride across. Nick Deck, having lost nothing of his mental or bodily energy, went on coolly and quietly, while the doctor followed him mechanically, like an animal at the end of a string. After crossing the trench, the forester went along the base of the curtain for some twenty yards, and stopped underneath the gate close to one end of the chain of the drawbridge. By the help of his hands and feet, he could thence easily reach the line of stonework that jutted out just below the embrasure. Evidently, Nick did not intend to compel the doctor to take part with him in this escalade. So heavy a man could not have done so. He therefore contented himself with giving him a vigorous shake to make him understand, and then advised him to wait without moving at the bottom of the ditch. Then Nick Deck commenced to climb the chain, and this was merely child's play for this mountaineer's muscles. But when the doctor found himself alone, the true positions of things, to a certain extent, recurred to him. He understood. He looked. He saw his companion already suspended a dozen feet from the ground, and in a voice choked with the bitterness of fear, he cried, Stop! Nick! Stop! The forester heard him not. Come! Come, or I will go away, cried the doctor. Go then, said Nick. And he continued to raise himself along the chain of the drawbridge. Dr. Patak, in a paroxysm of terror, would have gone back again up the slope of the counterscarp so as to reach the crest of the Orgot Plateau and return full speed to worst. But, prodigy to which the wonders of the preceding night were as nothing, he could not move. His feet were held fast as if they had been seized in the jaws of a vice. Could he place one before the other? No. They stuck by the heels and soles of his boots. Had the doctor been taken in a trap? He was too much frightened to look, but it seemed as though he was held by the nails in his boots. Whatever it was, the poor man was immovable. He was fixed to the ground. Not having strength to cry out, he stretched out his hands in despair. It looked as though he sought to be rescued from the embrace of some tarrasque hidden in the bowels of the earth. Meanwhile, Nick Deck had got as high as the postern, and was placing his hand on the ironwork in which the hinges of the drawbridge were embedded. A cry of pain escaped him, then throwing himself back as if he had been struck by lightning, he slipped along the chain, which a fatal instinct made him clutch and roll to the bottom of the ditch. The voice truly said that misfortune would come to me, he murmured, and then he lost consciousness. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 how can we describe the anxiety to which the village of Worst had been prey since the departure of the young forester and Dr. Patek? And it had constantly increased as the hours elapsed, and seems interminable. Master Colts, the innkeeper Jonas, Magister Hermit, and a few others had remained all the time on the terrace, each of them keeping a constant watch in the distant castle to see if any wreath of smoke appeared over the dungeon. No smoke showed itself, as was ascertained by means of the telescope, which was incessantly brought to bear in that direction. Assuredly, the two florins sunk in the acquisition of that instrument had been well invested. Never had the Bureau, although so much interested in the matter, betrayed the slightest regret as so opportune an expenditure. At half-past twelve, when the shepherd Frick returned from the pasture, he was eagerly interrogated. Was there anything new, anything extraordinary, anything supernatural? Frick replied that he had just come along the valley of the Wallachian Sill without seeing anything suspicious. After dinner, about two o'clock, the people went back to their post of observation. No one dreamt of remaining at home, and no one would certainly have dreamt of setting foot within the grand saloon of the King Matthias, where comminatory voices had made themselves heard. That walls have ears is all very well, it is a popular proverb, but a mouth? And so the worthy innkeeper might well fear that his inn had been put into quarantine, and consequently his anxiety was extreme. Would he have to shut up shop and drink his own stock for want of customers? and with a view of restoring confidence among the people of Worst, he had undertaken a lengthy search throughout the King Matthias. He had searched the rooms, under the beds, explored the cupboards and the sideboard, and every corner of the large saloon, the cellar, and the storeroom, from which any ill-disposed practical joker might have worked the mystification. Nothing could he find, not even along the side of the house overlooking the naiad. The windows were too high for it to be possible for anyone to climb to them along a perpendicular wall, the foundation of which went sheer down into the impetuous torrent. It mattered not. Fear does not reason, and considerable time would doubtless elapse before Jonas's habitual guests would return to their confidence in his inn, his schnapps, and his racchio. Considerable time? That is a mistake, and, as we shall see, this gloomy prognostic was never realized. In fact, a few days later, in a quite unexpected way, the village notables were to resume their daily conferences, varied with refreshments, in the saloon of the King Matthias. But we must first return to the young forester and his companion, Dr. Patak. 
It will be remembered that when he left Worst, Nick Deck had promised the disconsolate Mariota that he would make his visit to the castle of the Carpathians as brief as possible. If no harm happened to him, if the threats fulminated against him were not realized, he expected to get back early in the evening. He was therefore waited for, and with what impatience! Neither the girl, nor her father, nor the schoolmaster could foresee that the difficulties of the road would prevent the forester from reaching the crest of the Orgal Plateau before nightfall, and, in consequence, the anxiety, which had been intense during the day, exceeded all bounds when eight o'clock struck in the Vulcan clock, which could be heard distinctly at worst. What could have happened to prevent both Nick and the doctor from returning after a day's absence? Nobody thought of going home before they came back. Every minute there was seen an imagination coming round some turning in the road or along some gap in the hills. Master Colts and his daughter had gone to the end of the road, where the shepherd had been placed on the lookout. Many times they thought they saw somebody in the distance through the clearings among the trees, a pure illusion. The hillside was deserted, as usual, for it was not often that a frontier folk ventured there at night. And it was Thursday evening, the Thursday of evil spirits, and on that day the Transylvanian never willingly stirs abroad after sundown. It seemed that Nick Deck must have been mad to have chosen such a day for his visit to the castle. The truth being that the young forester had not given it a thought, and indeed had no one else in the village. But Miriota was thinking a good deal about it now, and what terrible imaginings occurred to her. In imagination she had followed her lover hour by hour, through the thick forest of the Plaza as he made his way up to the Orgal Plateau. And now that night had come she seemed to see him within the wall, endeavoring to escape from the spirits which haunted the castle of the Carpathians. He had to become the sport of their malevolence. He was the victim devoted to their vengeance. He was imprisoned in the depths of some subterranean jail. Dead, perhaps. Poor girl, what she would not have given to throw herself on his track. And if she could not do that, at least she could wait all night in this place. But her father insisted on her going home, and leaving the shepherd on the watch, returned with her to his house. As soon as she was in her little room, Miriota abandoned herself to tears. She loved him with all her heart, this brave Nick, and with a love all the more grateful owing to the young forester not having sought her under the conditions on which marriages are typically arranged in these Transylvanian countries. Every year, at the Feast of St. Peter, there opens the Fair of the Betrothed. On that day, all the marriageable girls of the district are assembled. They come in their best carriages, drawn by their best horses. They bring with them their dowry, that is to say, the clothes that they have spun and sewn, and embroidered with their hands, and these are all packed in gaudily colored boxes, their relatives and women friends and neighbors accompanying them. And then the young men arrived, dressed in their best clothes and gilt with silken sashes. Proudly they strut through the fair, they choose the girl they take a fancy to, they give her a ring and a handkerchief in token of betrothal, and the marriages take place at the close of the fair. But it was not in one of these marriage fairs that Nick Deck had met Miriota. Their acquaintanceship had not come about by chance. They had known each other from childhood. They had loved as soon as they were old enough to love. The young forester had not had to seek her out at a sale. But why was Nick Deck of so resolute a character? Why was he so obstinate in keeping an imprudent promise? And yet he loved her, although she had not enough influence over him to stop his going to this wretched castle. What a night the sorrowful Mariota had amid her terrors and her tears. She could not sleep. Stooping at her window, looking out on the rising road, she seemed to hear a voice that whispered, Nicholas Deck has defied the warning. Miriota has no longer a lover. But that was but a mistake of her troubled senses. No voice came across the silence of the night. The phenomenon of the saloon of the King Matthias was not reproduced in the house of Master Colts. At dawn the next morning the population of Worst were astir. From the terrace to the rise of the hill some went one way, some another along the main road, some asking for news, some giving it. They said that Frick the shepherd had gone off about a quarter of a mile from the village, not to enter the forest, but to skirt it and that he had some reason for doing so. The people were waiting for him, and in order to communicate more promptly with him, Master Colts, Miriota, and Jonas went to the end of the village. Half an hour afterwards, Frick was observed a few hundred yards away, up the rising road. As he did not appear to be in a hurry, good news was not expected. "'Well, Frick,' said Master Colts, as soon as the shepherd came up, "'what have you discovered?' "'I have seen nothing and discovered nothing,' said Frick. "'Nothing?' murmured the girl, whose eyes filled with tears. At daybreak, continued the shepherd, I saw two men about half a mile away. At first I thought it was Nick Deck, accompanied by the doctor, but it was not. Do you know who the men were? asked Jonas. Two travelers who had crossed the frontier in the morning. You spoke to them? Yes. Were they coming towards the village? No, they were going towards Retiet, bound for the summit. Two tourists? They looked like it, Master Colts. And as they crossed the Vulcan during the night, they saw nothing near the castle? 
No, for they were then on the other side of the frontier, replied Frick. Have you no news of Nick Deck? None. There was a sigh from poor Mariota. Besides, said Frick, you can have a talk to these travelers in a day or two, for they are thinking of staying at worst, before setting out for Kulsevar. Provided someone does not speak evil of my inn, thought Jonas, they would never care to stay there. For the last thirty-six hours the excellent landlord had been possessed by this fear that no traveler dare henceforth eat and sleep at the King Matthias. In short, these questions and answers between the shepherd and his master had in no way cleared matters up, and as neither the young forester nor Dr. Patek had reappeared by eight o'clock in the morning, could it be reasonably hoped that they would ever reappear, the castle of the Carpathians was not to be approached with impunity. Crushed by the emotions of that sleepless night, Mariota could bear up no longer. She almost fainted away and hardly had strength to walk. Her father took her home. There her tears were doubled. She called Nick in a heart-rending voice. She would have gone out to find him, and all pitied her in fear that she was going to have a serious illness. However, it was necessary and urgent to do something. Someone ought to go to the help of the forester and the doctor without losing a moment. That he would have to run into danger in exposing himself to the attack of the beings, human or otherwise, who occupied the castle, mattered little. The important thing was to know what had become of Nick and the doctor. This duty fell not only to their friends, but to every inhabitant of the village. The bravest could not refuse to cross the place of forests and ascend to the castle of the Carpathians. That was decided after many discussions. The bravest were found to consist of three. These were Master Colts, the Shepherd Frick, and the Innkeeper Jonas. Not one more. As for Magister Hermit, he was suddenly seized with gout in the leg, and had to stretch himself out on two chairs while he taught in his school. About nine o'clock, Master Colts and his companions, well armed in case of eventualities, took the road to the Vulcan. At the very turning where Nick Deck had left it, they left it to plunge into the woods. In fact, they said to themselves, not without reason, that if the young forester and the doctor were on their way back to the village, this was the road by which they would come, and it would be easy to get on their track once the three were through the outer line of trees. We will leave them to relate what happened at worst as soon as they were out of sight. If it had appeared indispensable that volunteers should go off to the rescue of Nick Deck and Patak, it was considered to be unreasonably imprudent now that they were gone. It would be a fine conclusion that the first catastrophe were to be doubled by the second. That the forester and the doctor had been the victims of their attempt, no one doubted. And what was the use of Master Colts and Frick and Jonas exposing themselves to another disaster? They would indeed be getting on when the girl had to weep for her father, as she had to weep for her betrothed, when the friends of the shepherd and the innkeeper had to reproach themselves with their loss. The grief became general at worst, and there was no sign that it would soon end. Even supposing that no harm happened to them, the return of Master Colts and his two companions could not be reckoned upon before night had fallen on the height of the place. What, then, was the surprise when they were sighted about two o'clock in the afternoon some distance along the road? With what eagerness did Miriota, who was at once told of their approach, run to meet them? There were not three, there were four, and the fourth appeared to be in the shape of the doctor. Nick, by poor Nick, exclaimed the girl, Nick is not there. Yes, Nick Deck was there, stretched on a litter of boughs which Jonas and the shepherd bore with difficulty. Mariota rushed toward her betrothed. She stooped over him. She clasped him in her arms. He is dead, she exclaimed. He is dead. No, he is not dead, replied Dr. Batak. But he deserves to be, and so do I. The truth is, the forester was unconscious. His limbs were stiff, his face bloodless, his respiration hardly moved his chest. As for the doctor, his face was not as colorless as a companion's, owing to the walk having restored his usual brick-red tint. Mariota's voice, so tender, so heart-rending, could not awaken Nick Deck from the torpor in which he was plunged. When he had been brought into the village and laid in the room in Mester Colts's house, he had not uttered a word. A few moments afterwards, however, his eyes opened, and when he saw the girl stooping over him, a smile played on his lips. But when he tried to raise himself, he could not. A part of his body was paralyzed, as if he had been struck with hemiplegia. At the same time, wishing to comfort Miriota, he said to her in a very feeble voice, it is true, it will be nothing. It will be nothing. Nick, my poor Nick, said the girl. A little over fatigue, dear Mariota, and a little excitement. It will be over soon, with your nursing. But the patient required calm and repose, and so Master Colts went away, leaving Mariota near the young forester, who could not have wished for a more attentive nurse, and soon fell asleep. Meanwhile, the innkeeper Jonas related to a numerous audience, and in a loud voice so as to be heard by all, what had happened after their departure. Master Colts, the shepherd and himself, after finding the footpath cut by Nick Deck and the doctor, had gone on toward the castle of the Carpathians. 
For two hours they made their way up to the Plaza Slopes, and the edge of the forest was not more than a half mile off when two men appeared. These were the doctor and the forester, one quite helpless in the legs, the other just about to fall at the foot of a tree owing to exhaustion. To run to the doctor, to interrogate him, but without being able to obtain a single word, for he was too stupefied to reply. To make a litter with the branches, to lay Nick Deck on it, to put a tack on his feet, did not take very long. Then Master Colts and the shepherd, who relieved Jonas from time to time, resumed the road to worst. As to saying why Nick Deck was in such a state, and if he had entered the ruins of the castle, the innkeeper knew no more than Master Colts or the shepherd Frick, and the doctor had not yet sufficiently recovered his spirits to satisfy their curiosity. But if Patak had not yet spoken, it was necessary for him to speak now. He was in safety in the village, surrounded by his friends, and in the midst of his patients. He had nothing to fear from the things at the castle, and even if they had wrung from him an oath to be silent, to say nothing of what he had seen in the castle of the Carpathians, the public interest required that he should ignore that oath. "'Compose yourself, doctor,' said Master Colts, and try to remember. "'You wish me to speak?' In the name of the inhabitants of Worst, and for the sake of the safety of the village, I order you to do so. A large glass of rakiao, brought in by Jonas, had the effect of restoring to the doctor the use of his tongue, and in broken sentences he expressed himself in these terms. We went off, both of us, Nick and I. Fools, fools. It took nearly all day to get through those wretched forests. We did not get up to the castle before it was getting dark. I still tremble at it. I will tremble at it all my life. Nick wanted to go in. Yes, he wanted to spend the night in the dungeon as much as to say to sleep in the bedroom of Beelzebub. Dr. Patak said these things in a voice so cavernous that all who heard him shuddered. I did not consent, he continued. No, I did not consent. And what would have happened if I had yielded to Nick Deck's desires? My hair stands on end to think of it. And if the doctor's hair did not stand on end, it was because his hand wandered mechanically over his paw. Nick accordingly resigned himself to camping on the Orga Plateau. What a night! My friends, what a night! Try to rest when the spirits will not let you sleep an hour? No, not even one hour? Suddenly, fiery monsters appeared in the clouds, regular Balorus. They hurled themselves onto the plateau to devour us. Every look was turned towards the sky to make sure that a few specters were not there in full gallop. And a few moments after, continued the doctor, the chapel bell began to clang. Every ear was stretched toward the horizon, and more than one of the crowd believed they could hear the distant ringing in the direction of the castle. So much had the doctor's recital impressed his audience. Suddenly, he went on, fearful bellowings filled the air, or rather the roaring of wild beasts. Then a bright light darted from the windows of the dungeon. An infernal flame illuminated all the plateau up to the fir forest. Nick Deck and I looked at one another. Ah, the terrible vision! We were like two corpses, two corpses which the lurid light set making horrible grimaces at each other. And to look at Dr. Patak, with his convulsed face and his wild eyes, there really would have been some excuse for asking if he had not returned from the other world, whither he had already sent so many of his kind. He had to be left to recover his breath, for he was incapable of continuing his story. This cost Jonas a second glass of rakiao, which appeared to bring back to the doctor some portion of the senses which the other spirits had made him lose. What happened to poor Nick Deck? asked Master Colts. And, not without reason, the bureau attached extreme importance to the doctor's reply for it was the young forester who had been personally threatened by the voice of the spirits in the saloon of the King Matthias. As far as I remember, continued the doctor, the daylight returned. I besought Nick Deck to abandon his projects. But you know him. He could not be more obstinate if he would. He went down into the ditch, and I was forced to follow him, for he dragged me along with him. Besides, I really do not know what I did. Nick went on up to the gate. He caught hold of the chain of the drawbridge with which he pulled himself up the wall. At this moment the sense of our position occurred. There was still time to stop him, that rash, I say more, that sacrilegious young man. For the last time I ordered him to come down, to come back to the road to Worst. No, he shouted to me. I would have run away. Yes, my friends, I confess him. I would have fled, and there is not one of you who would not have had the same thought in my place. But it was in vain I tried to move from the ground. My feet were nailed, screwed, rooted. I tried to free them. It was impossible. I tried to struggle. It was useless and Dr. Patak imitated the desperate movements of a man held by the legs, as a fox is held in a trap. Then, resuming his story, he said, At this moment there was a cry, and such a cry. It was Nick Deck who uttered it. His hands had let go of the chain, and he fell to the bottom of the ditch as if he had been struck by an invisible hand. The doctor, it is clear, had told what had happened, and his imagination had added nothing, excited though it might be. Just as he described them, 
So had the prodigies appeared of which the Orgal Plateau had been the scene during the preceding night. What had happened after Nick Deck's fall was as follows. The forester had fainted, and Dr. Patak was incapable of helping him, for his boots were stuck to the ground, and he could not get his swollen feet out of them. Suddenly, the invisible force that detained him vanished. His legs were free. He rushed toward his companion, and what must be considered a noble act of courage, he bathed Nick Deck's face with his handkerchief, which he dipped in the water of the stream. The forester recovered consciousness, but his left arm and part of his body were helpless after the frightful shock he had had. However, with the doctor's aid, he managed to get up and climb the slope of the counterscarp and regain the plateau. Then he set out for the village. After an hour's progress, the pain in his arm and side became so violent that he had to stop, and it was just as the doctor was about to start off alone in search of help from worst that Master Colts and Jonas and Frick arrived most opportunely. The doctor carefully avoided saying that the young forester had been seriously hurt, although he was generally very positive when consulted on medical matters. When the ailment is a natural ailment, he said in a dogmatic tone, it is serious. But when we have to deal with the supernatural ailment sent by the chort, it is only the chort who can cure it. In default of a diagnosis, it cannot be said that this prognosis was reassuring for Nick Deck. There have, however, been many physicians since Hippocrates and Galen who have made mistakes, and these have been far better men than Dr. Patak. The young forester was a healthy lad. With his vigorous constitution, there was reason to hope that without any diabolic intervention, he would recover on condition that he was not too careful to accept the advice of the old quarantine officer. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 Such things were not calculated to calm the terrors of the people of Worst. There could now be no doubt that the threats uttered by the mouth of darkness, as the poet said in the King Matthias, were to be taken seriously. Nick Deck, struck in this inexplicable manner, had been punished for his disobedience and temerity. Was not this a warning to all those who might be tempted to follow his example? Here, clearly enough, was a formal prohibition against entering the castle of the Carpathians. Whoever tried it would risk his life. Most certainly if the forester had got within the wall, he would never have returned to the village. And so the fright was more complete than ever at worst, and even in Vulcan, and also throughout the valley of the two sills. Nothing less was spoken of than leaving the district, and a few gypsy families moved off rather than live in the vicinity of the castle that it should be a refuge for supernatural and maleficent beings was more than a popular feeling could put up with. The only thing to do was to go into some other part of the country, unless the Hungarian government decided to destroy this inaccessible haunt. But was the castle of the Carpathians destructible by the only means man had at his disposal? During the first week of June, no one would venture out of the village, not even to work in the fields. Might not the least stroke of a spade provoke the apparition of some phantom buried in the ground? The coulter of the plow as it cut the furrow might it not set in flight a flock of staffi or striges? Where the seed of corn was sown, might not the seed of demons spring up? That could not fail to happen, said the shepherd Frick in a tone of conviction. And, as far as he was concerned, he took good care not to return with his sheep to the pastures of the sill. And so the village was in a state of terror. No one went to work in the fields. Every one remained at home with doors and windows closed. Master Colts did not know what to do to restore confidence among those under his rule. Evidently, the only way was to go to Kosovar and invoke the intervention of the authorities. And had the smoke reappeared at the top of the dungeon chimney? Yes, many times the telescope had made it visible among the mists which swept the Orgal Plateau. And when night came, had the clouds assumed a rosy hue as if from the reflection of a fire? Yes, and it was said that fiery plumes could be seen curling and whirling over the castle. And that roaring which had frightened Dr. Patak, was it heard from among the woods of Plesa? to the terror of the people of Worst? Yes, or at least, notwithstanding the distance, the northwest wind brought along fearful growlings which were augmented by the echoes of the hills. According to some of the more terror-stricken, the ground was shaken by subterranean tremblings, as if some ancient volcano had become active again in the Carpathian chain, but possibly there was a good deal of exaggeration in what the Worstians thought they saw and heard and felt. Under any circumstances there were positive, tangible reasons, it will be admitted, why living in such a strangely troubled country was no longer possible. The King Matthias remained deserted in consequence. A lazaretto in an epidemic could not have been more shunned. No one had the audacity to cross the threshold, and Jonas was asking himself if, for want of customers, he would not have to retire from trade, when the arrival of two travelers altered matters considerably. In the evening of the month of June, about eight o'clock, the latch of the door was lifted from the outside, but the door, being bolted inside, could not be opened. Jonas, who had already retired to his attic, hastily came down. 
To the hope of finding himself face to face with a customer was added the fear that the customer might be some evil-looking ghost, to whom he would be only too ready to refuse board and lodging. Jonas proceeded to hold the parlay through the door without opening it. "'Who was there?' he asked. Two travelers. "'Alive? Very much alive. Are you sure of it?' "'As much alive as we can be, Mr. Innkeeper, but we shall die of hunger if you keep us outside.' Jonas decided to draw back the bolts, and two men entered the room. As soon as they were in, their first demand was for a room each, as they intended to stay a day at worst. By the light of the lamp, Jonas examined the newcomers with great attention, and made sure that he had really to deal with human beings. How fortunate for the King Matthias! The younger of the travelers might be about thirty-two years old, of tall stature, with a noble handsome face, black eyes, dark brown hair, a well-cut brown beard, a somewhat sad but proud look upon him. In fact, he was a gentleman, and an experienced innkeeper like Jonas could not be mistaken in such a matter. Besides, when he asked what names he was to enter into the visitor's book, the younger man replied, The Count Franz de Telec, and his man, Rotzko. Of what place? Krajoa. Krajoa was one of the chief towns of the state of Romania, which borders the Transylvanian provinces south of the Carpathian chain. Franz de Telec was thus of Romanian nationality, as Jonas had seen from the very first. Rotzko was a man of about forty, solidly built and strong, with a thick mustache, bristled hair, and quite a military bearing. He carried a soldier's knapsack strapped to his shoulders, and a valise small enough to be carried in his hands. That was all the baggage of the young Count, who traveled generally on foot, as could be seen from his costume. A cloak and a roll over his shoulder, a light cap on his head, a short jacket with a belt, from which hung the leather sheath of a Wallachian knife, and he wore the gaiters strapped down to the broad, thick-soled shoes. These travelers were the two whom the shepherd Fricken met twelve days before on the road to the hills, when they were going to Retyazet. After seeing the country up to Morose, and making the ascent of the mountain, they had come for a little rest to worst before exploring the valley of the two sills. "'You have two rooms we can have?' asked Franz de Telec. Two, three, four, "'As many as the Count pleases,' said Jonas. Two will do,' said Rotzko. "'But they must be near each other.' "'Will these suit you?' asked Jonas, opening two doors at the end of the large saloon. "'Very well indeed,' said Franz de Telec. Evidently Jonas had nothing to fear from his new customers. These were no supernatural beings, no phantoms who had assumed the shape of men. No, this gentleman was one of those personages of distinction whom the innkeeper is always honored and welcoming, and who might perhaps bring the King Matthias into fashion again. How far are we from Kosovar? asked the Count. About fifty miles if you go by road through the Petrosny and Carlsberg, replied Jonas. Is it a tiring sort of walk? Yes, very tiring for walkers. And if I may be permitted to say so, the Count would seem to require a rest of a few days before undertaking it. Can we have something to eat? asked Franz de Telec, cutting short the innkeeper's remarks. In half an hour's time I shall have the honor of offering the Count a repast worthy of him. Bread, wine, eggs, and cold meat will be enough for tonight. I will go and see about them, as soon as possible. This moment. And Jonas was hurrying off to the kitchen when a question stopped him. You do not seem to have many people at your inn, said Franz de Telec. No, not just at the moment, sir. Is this not the time for people to come and have a drink and smoke a pipe? It is too late now, sir. They go to bed with the chickens in the village of Worst. Never would he have said why the King Matthias was without a customer. Are there not three or four hundred people in this village? About that, sir. Why did we not meet a living soul as we came down the main street? That is because today, well, it is Saturday, you see, and the day before Sunday is... Franz de Telec did not persist, luckily for Jonas, who did not know what to reply. Nothing in the world would have induced him to reveal the true state of affairs. Strangers would learn that only too soon, and who could tell if they would not hasten to leave a village so deservedly suspected? It is to be hoped that that voice will not begin to chatter in the big room while they are at supper, thought Jonas as he laid the table. A few minutes afterwards the very simple meal ordered by the young Count was neatly served on a clean white cloth. Franz de Telec sat down, and Rotzko seated himself facing him, as they usually did on the travels. Both of them ate with a good appetite, and when the repast was over they retired to their rooms. As the young Count and Rotzko had hardly spoken ten words during their meal, Jonas had not been able to take part in their conversation, to his great displeasure. Besides, Franz de Telec did not seem to be communicative. As to Rotzko, the innkeeper, after due survey, gathered that he would not be able to get anything out of him regarding his master's family. Jonas had, therefore, to content himself with bidding his visitors good night. Before he went up to his attic, he gave a good look round the room, and lent an anxious ear to the least noises within and without, saying to himself, May that abominable voice not awake them from their sleep. The night passed tranquilly. At daybreak the next morning, the news began to spread in the village that two travelers had arrived at the King Matthias, and a number of people gathered in front of the inn. 
Franz de Tillac and Rotzko were still sleeping, tired after their excursion the day before. There was little likelihood of their rising before seven or eight o'clock, and consequently there was great impatience among the spectators, who had none of them the courage to enter the room before the travelers. At eight o'clock they came in together. Nothing regrettable had happened. They could be seen walking about in the inn, then they sat down for breakfast, all of which was particularly reassuring. Jonas stood at the front door and smiled amiably, inviting his old customers to give him another trial. The traveler who honored the King Matthias with his presence was a gentleman, a Romanian gentleman, if you please, and of one of the oldest Romanian families. What was to be feared in such noble company? In short, it happened that Master Colts, thinking it his duty to set an example, took the risk of the first step. About nine o'clock the bureau entered the room in a rather hesitating way. Almost immediately he was followed by Magister Hermid and three or four other customers, as well as the shepherd Frick. As to Dr. Patak, it had been impossible to persuade him to accompany them. Set foot in Jonas's, he said, never until he pays me two florins a visit. We may here remark, as it is a matter of some importance, that if Master Colts had consented to return to the King Matthias, it was not solely with a view of satisfying his curiosity, nor with the intention of making the acquaintance of Count Franz de Tillac. No, self-interest was his chief motive. As a traveler, the young Count had become liable for attacks on self and men, and it must not be forgotten that these taxes went directly into the pocket of the chief magistrate of Worst. The bureau at once went forward and politely stated his demand, and Franz de Tillac, although taken somewhat by surprise, immediately settled the claim. He even begged the bureau and the schoolmaster to be seated for a moment at his table, and the offer was so politely made that they could not refuse. Jonas hastened to serve them with his drinks, the best he had in the cellar, and then the few of the natives of Worst asked for a drink of their own account, and it seemed as though the old customers, for a moment dispersed, would soon be as plentiful as ever in the King Matthias. Having paid the traveler's tax, Franz de Tillac wished to know if it were productive. Not as much as we wish, replied Master Colts. Do strangers only come here occasionally, then? Very occasionally, said the Bureau, and yet the country is worth a visit. So I think, said the Count. What I have seen appeared to me to be well worth a traveler's attention. From the top of the Retigat I much admired the valley of the Sills, the villages away to the east, and the range of mountains which closes in the view. It is very fine, sir, very fine, said Magister Hermit, and to complete your tour you should make the ascent of pairing. I am afraid I shall not have the necessary time, said the Count. One day would be enough. Probably, but I am going to Carlsberg, and I must start tomorrow morning. What, said Jonas, with his most amiable air, does the Count think of leaving us so soon? And he would not have been sorry if the visitors could have stayed some time at the King Matthias. It must be so, said the Count de Tillec. Besides, what would be the use of making a longer stay at worst? Believe me, our village is well worth a tourist making some stay at, said Master Colts. But it does not seem so much frequented, said the Count, and that is probably because its neighborhood has nothing remarkable about it. Quite so, nothing remarkable, said the Bureau, thinking of the castle. No, nothing remarkable, said the schoolmaster. Oh, ah, said the shepherd Frick, the exclamation escaping involuntarily. What looks he received from Master Colts and the others? particularly from the innkeeper. Was it then advisable to let the stranger into the secrets of the district? Should they reveal to him what had passed on the plateau of Orgal, and direct his attention to the castle of the Carpathians? Would that not frighten him and make him anxious to leave the village? And in the future, what traveler would come by the Vulcan road into Transylvania? Truly the shepherd had shown no more intelligence than if he were one of his own sheep. Be quiet, you imbecile, be quiet, said Master Colts to him in a whisper. But as the young Count's curiosity had been awakened, he addressed himself directly to Frick, and asked him what he meant by this, oh, ah. The shepherd was not a man to retreat, and perhaps really thought that Franz de Tillec might give some advice which the village might profitably adopt. I said, oh, ah, replied the shepherd, and I will not go back on my word. Is there any marvel, then, to visit in the neighborhood of Verst? Any marvel, replied Master Colts. No, no, exclaimed the bystanders, and they were already in fear at the thought, lest a fresh attempt at entering the castle would bring fresh misfortunes on them. Franz de Tillec, not without some surprise, took notice of those people whose faces were expressive of alarm in all sorts of ways, but all equally unmistakable. "'What is this all about?' he asked. "'What is it, sir?' replied Rotzko. "'Well, it seems there is the Castle of the Carpathians.' "'The Castle of the Carpathians?' "'Yes, that is the name the shepherd just whispered in my ear.' And as he spoke, Rotzko pointed to Frick, who nodded his head without daring to look at his master. But a breach was now made in the wall of the private life of the superstitious village, and all its history could not help going forth through the breach. In fact, Master Colts, who made up his mind how to act, resolved to explain matters himself to the Count, and told him all he knew about the castle of the Carpathians. Naturally, Franz de Tillet could not hide the astonishment the story caused him, nor the feelings it suggested to him. Although he knew little of scientific matters, like other young people of his class who lived in their castles in the Wallachian byways, he was a sensible man. 
He believed but little in apparitions and laughed at legend. A castle haunted by spirits merely excited his incredulity. In his opinion, in all that Master Colts had told him there was nothing of the marvelous, but only a few facts, more or less proved, to which the people of Worst attributed a supernatural origin. The smoke from the dungeon, the bell ringing violently, could be very easily explained, and the lightnings and roarings from within the walls might be purely imaginary. Franz de Tillet did not hesitate to say so, and to joke about it to the great scandal of the listeners. But, Count, there is something else, said Master Colts. What is that? Well, it is impossible to get into this castle of the Carpathians. Indeed? Our forester and our doctor tried to get in a few days ago, for the benefit of the village, and they paid dearly for their attempt. What happened to them? asked Franz de Tillet, somewhat ironically. Master Colts related in detail the adventures of Nick Deck and Dr. Patak. And so, said the Count, when the doctor wanted to get out of the ditch, his feet were so stuck to the ground that he could not take a step forward? Neither a step forward nor a step behind, added Magister Hermit. Your doctor thought so, replied Franz de Telec, but it was fear which struck him by the heels. Be it so, replied Master Colts, but Nick Deck received a frightful shock when he put his hand on the ironwork of the drawbridge. A terrible shock. So terrible, replied the Bureau, that he has been in bed ever since. Not in danger of his life, I hope, said the Count. No, fortunately. That was a fact, an undeniable fact, and Master Colts waited for the explanation Franz de Telec would give. In all I have just heard there is nothing, I repeat, but what is very simple. I have no doubt but what somebody is now living in the castle. Who? I know not. Anyhow, they are not spirits, but people who wish to lie hidden there after taking refuge there. Criminals, probably. Criminals, exclaimed Master Colts. Probably, and as they do not want anyone to hunt them out, they wished it to be believed that the castle is haunted by supernatural beings. What? said Magister Hermit. You think— I think you are very superstitious in these parts, that the people in the castle know it, and that they wish to keep off visitors in that way. That this was the true explanation was not unlikely, but we need not be astonished if anyone at worst would admit it. The young Count saw that he had in no way convinced an audience who did not wish to be convinced, and so he contented himself with adding, If you do not care to agree with me, gentlemen, you can continue to think what you please about the castle of the Carpathians. We believe what we have seen, replied Master Colts. And what is, said the Magister, well, really, I am sorry I have not a day to spare, for Rotsko and I would have paid a visit to your famous castle, and I assure you we would have soon found out. Visit the castle, exclaimed Master Colts, without hesitation, and the devil himself would not have stopped us getting in. On listening to Franz de Telec express himself so positively, so ironically even, the villagers were seized with terror. In treating the spirits of the castle with such indifference, would he not bring some disaster on the village? Did not these spirits hear all that passed in the inn of the King Matthias? Would the voice be heard a second time in this room? And thereupon Master Colts told the young Count of the circumstance under which the forester had been personally threatened when he decided on entering the castle of the Carpathians. Franz de Telec simply shrugged his shoulders. Then he rose, saying that no voice had ever been heard in the room as they pretended, whereupon some of the company made for the door, not caring to remain any longer in a place where a young skeptic dared say such things. But Franz de Telec stopped them with a gesture. Assuredly, gentlemen, he said, I see that the village of Worst is under the empire of fear. And not without reason, replied Master Colts. Well, there's a very simple way of putting a stop to the performances which, according to you, are going on in the castle of the Carpathians. After tomorrow, I shall be at Carlsberg, and if you like, I will tell the town authorities. They will send you a few police, and I will answer for it that these brave fellows will know how to get into the castle and clear out the jokers who are practicing on your credulity, or arrest the scoundrels who are perhaps preparing for some new iniquity. Nothing could be more acceptable than this proposal, but yet it was not to the taste of the notables of Verst. In their opinion, neither the police nor the army itself would succeed against these superhuman beings, who would know how to defend themselves by supernatural means. But I believe, continued the young Count, that you have not yet told me to whom this castle of the Carpathians belongs or belonged. To an old country family, the family of the barons of Gortz, said Master Colts. The family of Gortz, exclaimed Franz de Telec. The same. Is that the family to which Baron Rodolphe belonged? Yes. And do you know what has become of him? No, for the Baron has not come back to the castle for years. Franz de Telec had become quite pale, and mechanically, in an altered voice, he repeated the name. Rodolphe de Gortz. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 The family of the Counts of Telec was one of the most ancient and illustrious in Romania, having been of considerable importance there before the country conquered its independence in the beginning of the 16th century. With all the political movements which abound in the history of these provinces, the name of the family is gloriously connected. Less favored than the famous beach of the castle of the Carpathians, which still possessed three branches, the house of Telec was now reduced to one, that of Telec of Krajawa, 
whose last offspring was the young gentleman who had just arrived at the village of Worst. During his infancy he had never left the patrimonial castle where the Count and Countess of Tilek lived. The descendants of the family were held in great esteem in the country, where they spent their wealth generously. Living the liberal, easy life of the country nobility, it was seldom that they left the estate of Krajawa more than once a year, and that when business took them to the town of that name, which was only a few miles away. This kind of life had of necessity an influence on the education of their only son, and for long afterwards Franz felt the effects of the surroundings amid which his childhood had passed. His only tutor was an old Italian priest, who could only teach him what he knew, and he did not know much. And so, when the boy had become a young man, he had but a very inadequate knowledge of science, or art, or contemporary literature. To be an enthusiastic sportsman, afoot night and day through the forest and on the plains, hunting the stag and the wild boar, and attacking the wild beasts of the mountains, knife in hand. Such were the ordinary pastimes of the young Count, who, being very brave and very resolute, accomplished wonders in these rough occupations. The Countess of Telec died when her son was scarcely fifteen, and he was only one and twenty when his father died in a hunting accident. The grief of young Franz was extreme. As he had wept for his mother, he wept for his father, who had just been taken away from him, one after the other, within those few years. All his tender feelings and the affectionate impulses of his heart were then centered in his filial love which had been sufficient for him during his childhood and youth. But when his love failed him, having no friends and his tutor being dead, he found himself alone in the world. For three years the young Count remained at the castle of Krajawa. He could not make up his mind to leave it. He lived there without seeking to make any acquaintances outside. Once or twice he had been to Bucharest, but that was because certain matters obliged him to go there and these were but short absences, for he was in haste to return to his domain. This life could not, however, last forever, and Franz began to feel the want of enlarging the horizon which was so restricted by Romanian mountains, and he wished to fly beyond it. The young Count was about twenty-three years old when he made up his mind to travel. His wealth enabled him to fully gratify his wishes. One day he left the castle of Krajawa to his old servants, and left the Wallachian country. He took with him Rotsko, an old Romanian soldier who had been for ten years in the family, and who had been a young Count's companion in all his hunting expeditions. He was a man of courage and resolution, entirely devoted to his master. The young Count's intention was to visit Europe and to stay a few months in the capitals and important towns of the continent. He considered, not without cause, that his education, which had only begun at the castle of Krajawa, might be completed by what he learned on the carefully planned tour. It was to Italy that Franz de Telec wished to go first, for he could speak Italian fairly well, the old priest having taught him. The attraction of this country, so rich in memories, was such that he stayed there four years. He only left Venice to go to Florence. He left Rome but to go to Naples, constantly returning to these artistic centers, from which he could not tear himself away. France, Germany, Spain, Russia, England, he would see later on. He would even study them to better advantage, so it seemed to him, when age had matured his ideas. On the other hand, he must be in all the effervescence of youth to enjoy the charms of the great Italian cities. Franz de Telec was twenty-seven when he went to Naples for the last time. He intended to spend only a few hours there before leaving for Sicily. By the exploration of the ancient Trinacria, he proposed to end his tour, and then return to his castle of Crajoa and have a year's rest. An unexpected circumstance not only changed his plans, but decided his life and changed its course. During the few years he had lived in Italy, the young Count had not learned much of the sciences, for which he had felt no aptitude, but the sense of the beautiful had been revealed to him like light to a blind man. With his mind widely open to the splendors of art, he had become enthusiastic over the masterpieces of painting, in visiting the galleries of Naples, Rome, and Florence. At the same time, the theaters had made him acquainted with the lyric works of the time, and he became powerfully interested in their interpretation by the great artists. It was during his stay at Naples, and under circumstances we are about to relate, that a sentiment of a more personal character, of more intense penetration, took possession of his heart. There was then at the theater of San Carlo a celebrated singer whose pure voice, finished method, and dramatic ability had won the admiration of all the dilettanti. Up to then, La Stilla had never sought the applause of foreigners, and had never sung any other music than Italian, which then held the first place in the heart of composition. The Carnegie Theatre at Turin, the Scala at Milan, the Fenice at Venice, the Alfieri at Florence, the Apollo at Rome, the San Carlo at Naples, 
introduced her in turn, and her triumphs left her no room for regret that she had not appeared at the other theaters of Europe. Lestilla, then aged five and twenty, was a woman of ideal beauty, with her long golden hair, the ardor of her deep black eyes, the purity of her complexion, and a figure which the chisel of Paraxitellus could not have made more perfect. And this woman had become a sublime artiste, another Malibran of whom Musset could also say, And thy songs in the skies bore away sorrow. But this voice, which was the most adored of poets and celebrated in the immortal stanzas, that voice of the heart which only finds the heart, that voice was Lestilla's in all its inexpressible magnificence. However, this incomparable prima donna, who reproduced with such perfection the accents of tenderness, the fury of the passions, the most powerful feelings of the soul, had never, so they said, experienced their effect. Never had she loved. Never had her eyes responded to the thousand looks which were concentrated on her on the stage. It seemed that she lived but for her art, and only for her art. The first time he saw Listilla, Franz experienced that irresistible ardor which is the essence of a first love and he gave up his plan on leaving Italy, after visiting Sicily, and resolved to remain at Naples until the close of the season. As if some invisible bond he could not break had attached him to the singer, he was at all the performances, with the enthusiasm of the public converted into veritable triumphs. Many times, incapable of mastering his passion, he had tried to obtain access to her house, but Lestilla's door remained as pitilessly closed against him as against so many other fanatic admirers. And so it came about that the young Count became the most to be pitied of men, always in sight of his love, thinking only of the great artiste, living but to see her and hear her. He sought no longer to make friends in the world to which his name and fortune called him. Soon this excitement so increased with Franz that his health was in danger. We can imagine that he might have suffered if he had had to bear the tortures of jealousy if Lestilla's heart had belonged to another. But the young Count had no rival, as he knew, and none can give him umbrage not even of a certain peculiar personages, of whose appearance and character our story requires more notice. He was a man between fifty and fifty-five at the time France de Telec last went to Naples. This incommunicative individual apparently strove to live outside the social conventionalities that prevailed in the higher circles. Nothing was known of his family, his position, his past life. He was met with today at Rome, tomorrow at Florence, provided that Lestilla was at Florence or at Rome. In fact, he lived but to listen to the renowned singer, who then occupied the foremost place in the art of song. If Franz de Telec had only lived in a delirium of his idol tree for Lestilla since the day he had applauded her, or rather had he seen her on a stage at Naples, this eccentric dilettante had been following her for about six years. But he was not like the young Count. In his case, it was not the woman, but the voice which had become so necessary to his life as the air he breathed. Never had he sought to see her except on stage. Never had he called at her house or attempted to write to her. But every time Lestilla appeared in no matter what theater of Italy, there passed in among the audience a man of tall stature, wrapped in a long, dark overcoat and wearing a large hat which hid his face. This man would hurry to his seat in a private box previously engaged for him, and there he would remain, silent and motionless, throughout the performance. But as soon as Lestilla had finished her last air, he would go away furtively, and no other singer would detain him. He had not even heard them. Who was the spectator so strangely assiduous at these performances? Lestilla had in vain sought to know, and being of a very impressionable nature, she had become quite frightened at this curious man, an unreasonable terror, but still a real one. Although she could not see him in the back of the box, she knew he was there. She felt his look imperiously fixed on her, and, greatly troubled by his presence, she no longer heard the cheers with which the public welcomed her appearance on the scene. We have said that this personage had never approached Lestilla. Nothing could be truer. But if he had not tried to make her acquaintance, and we must particularly insist on this point, all that could remain to him of the artiste had been the object of constant attention. Thus he possessed the finest of the portraits which the great painter Michael Gregorio had made of the singer. This was, indeed, Lestilla impassioned vibrating, sublime, incarnate, in one of her finest characters, and the portrait acquired for its price in gold was well worth the price her wealthy admirer had paid for it. If this eccentric individual was invariably alone when he occupied his box during Lestilla's performances, if he never went out of his rooms but to go to the theater, it must not be supposed that he lived in absolute isolation. No, a companion no less eccentric shared his existence. 
This individual was known as Orphanic. How old was he? Whence came he? Where was he born? No one could have answered those three questions. To listen to him, for he was only too glad to talk, he was one of those unrecognized geniuses who have taken an aversion to the world. And it was supposed, and not without reason, that he was some poor devil of an inventor who was chiefly supported by the purse of his protector. Orphanic was of middle height, thin, sickly, consumptive, and pale. He was remarkable for a black patch over his right eye, which he had lost in some experiment, and on his nose was a pair of spectacles, the only lens being that over his left eye, which glowed with a greenish look. During his solitary walks he gesticulated as if he were talking to some invisible being who listened without ever answering. These two characters, the strange melomaniac and the no less strange orphanic, were known, at least as much as they wished to be, in all the towns of Italy to which the theatrical season regularly took them. They had the privilege of exciting public curiosity, and although the admirer of La Stilla had always repulsed the reporters and their indiscreet interviews, they had at last discovered his name and nationality. He was of Romanian birth, and the first time Franz de Telec asked who he was, they told him, the Baron Rodolphe de Gortz. Such was the state of affairs when the young count arrived at Naples. For two months the theater of San Carlo had been full, and the success of La Stilla grew greater every evening. Never had she done herself more justice than their different characters. Never had she called forth more enthusiastic ovations. At each performance, while Franz occupied his orchestra, the Baron de Gort sat at the back of his box, absorbed in his ideal song, impregnated with his divine voice, without which it seemed he could not live. It was then that a rumor spread at Naples, a rumor the public refused to believe, but which eventually alarmed the dilettanti. It was said that at the close of the season, La Stilla was going to retire from the stage. What, in all the possession of her talent, and in all the plentitude of her beauty, in the apogee of her artistic career, was it possible she thought of retiring? Unlikely as it seemed, it was true, and undoubtedly the Baron de Gortz had something to do with her resolve. This spectator, with his mysterious proceedings, always there, although invisible behind the railing of his box, had at length provoked in La Stilla a nervous, persistent emotion which she could not overcome. Whenever she came on the stage, she felt an influence come over her, and the excitement, which was apparent enough to the public, had gradually injured her health. To leave Naples, to fly to Rome, to Venice, or to some other town of the peninsula, would not, she knew, deliver her from the presence of Baron de Gortz. She would not even escape him by abandoning Italy for Germany, Russia, or France. He would follow her wherever she made herself heard, and to deliver herself from this besetting importunity, her only chance was to abandon the stage. Two months before the rumor for retirement had been heard, Franz de Telec had taken a step with regard to the singer, the consequences of which were to be an irreparable catastrophe. Free to do as he liked, and master of an immense fortune, he had succeeded in obtaining admission to La Stilla's house, and had made her the offer of becoming Countess of Telec. La Stilla had long known of the feelings with which she had inspired the young Count. She had said to herself that he was a gentleman to whom any woman, even of the highest rank, would be happy to trust her life and happiness and in the state of mind that she was then, when Franz de Telec offered her his name, she received the offer with a sympathy and took no pains to hide. She felt herself loved in such a way that she consented to become the wife of Count Telec, and without regret abandoned her dramatic career. The news was then true. La Stilla would not appear again on any stage, as soon as the San Carlo season came to an end. In fact, her marriage, of which there had been some suspicions, was announced as certain. This, as may be imagined, caused considerable excitement not only in the professional world, but in the fashionable world of Italy. After refusing to believe in the realization of this project, they had to admit it. Hatred and jealousy rose against the young Count, who was to take her away from her art, her success, the idol tree of the dilettanti, the greatest singer of her age. Even personal threats were directed against Franz de Telec, which threats in no way troubled him. But if it was thus with the public, we can imagine what Rudolph de Gortz felt at the thought of losing La Stilla, and that he would lose with her all that was life to him. There was a rumor that he was about to commit suicide. It was certain that from this day Orphanic was not seen in the streets of Naples. He never left Baron Rudolph. Many times he was with him in the box which the Baron occupied at every performance, and that he had never done before, being, like other learned men, absolutely refractory to the sensual charms of music. The days, however, went by. The excitement did not subside, and it was at its height the last time La Stilla was to appear on the stage. It was in the superb character of Angelica in Orlando 
the masterpiece of Arcanati, that she was to bid her farewell to the public. That night San Carlo was but a tenth large enough to hold the people who crowded at its doors, and for the most part remained outside. It was feared that there would be a manifestation against Count de Telec, if not while Lestilla was on the stage, at least when the curtain fell on the last act. The Baron de Gortz had taken his place in his box, and this time Orphanic was again with him. Lestilla appeared, more agitated than she had ever been. She recovered herself, however. She abandoned herself to her inspiration, and sang with such perfection, such ineffable talent, that the indescribable enthusiasm she excited among the audience rose almost to delirium. During the performance, the young Count waited at the wing, impatient, nervous, feverish, cursing the length of the scenes, and angry at the delays provoked by the applause and recalls. Ah, how they hindered him from carrying off from this theater her who was to be the Countess of Telec, the adored woman he would take far, far away, so far that she would belong but to him, and to him alone. At last came the final most dramatic scene in which the heroine of Orlando dies. Never had the admirable music of Arcanati appeared more impressive. Never had Lestilla interpreted it with more impassioned emphasis. All her soul seemed to distill itself through her lips. And yet one would have said that this voice was about to break, for it was to be no longer heard. At this moment the railing of Baron de Gort's box was lowered. Over it there appeared that strange head, with the long grizzled hair and the eyes of flame. It showed itself, that ecstatic face, frightful in its parlor and from the wing Franz saw it in the light for the first time. Lestilla was then reveling in the full power of that ravishing strato in the final air. She had just repeated that phrase with the sublime sentiment, Inamorata, mio cuore tremante, voglia mori. Suddenly she stopped. Baron de Gortz's face terrified her. An inexplicable terror paralyzed her. She put her hand to her mouth. It reddened with blood. She staggered she fell. The audience rose, trembling, bewildered, distracted. A cry escaped from Baron de Gort's box. Franz rushed onto the stage. He took Lestilla in his arms. He lifted her. He looked at her. He called her. Dead! Dead! he cried. She is dead! Yes, Lestilla was dead. A blood vessel had broken. Her song died with her last sigh. The young Count was taken back to his hotel in such a state that his reason was despaired of. He was unable to be present at Lestilla's funeral, which took place amid an immense crowd of the Neapolitan population. It was at the cemetery of Campo Santo Nuovo that the singer was buried, and all that could be read on the marble was Stilla. The night of the funeral a man went to the Campo Santo Nuovo. There with haggard eyes, bowed head, and lips clenched as if they had been sealed by death, he looked for a long time at the spot where Lestilla lay and he seemed to listen as if the voice of the great artiste was to be heard for the last time from her grave. It was Rodolphe de Gortz. That very night the Baron de Gortz, accompanied by Orphanic, left Naples, and no one knew what became of him. But the next morning a letter was received by the young Count. The letter contained but these words. It is you who have killed her. Woe to you, Count de Telec. Rodolphe de Gortz. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 such had been this lamentable history. For a month, Franz de Telec's life was in danger. He recognized nobody, not even his man, Rotzko. In the height of his fever, but one name escaped his lips, which were ready to part with their last breath. It was that of La Stilla. The young Count did not die. The skill of the doctors, the incessant care of Rotzko, together with his own youth and constitution, saved Franz de Telec. His reason emerged uninjured from this terrible struggle. But when memory returned to him, when he recalled the final tragic scene in Orlando, in which the soul of the artist had left her, Stilla, my Stilla, he cried, stretching out his hands as if he were applauding. As soon as his master could leave his bed, Rotsko persuaded him to leave this accursed town and allow himself to be carried home to the castle of Krajoa. But before he left Naples, the young Count wished to go and pray over the grave of the dead, and bid her a last and eternal farewell. Rotsko accompanied him to Campo Santo Nuevo. There Franz threw himself on the cruel ground. He would have torn it up with his fingernails to bury himself by her side. Rothsko at last managed to get him away from the grave, where he had left all his life and all his happiness. A few days afterwards, Franz de Telec had returned to Krajoa, to his old family estate. There he lived for four years in absolute retirement, never leaving the castle. Neither time nor distance could alleviate his grief. 
He would have forgotten, but it was impossible. The remembrance of Lestilla, vivid as on the first day, was bound up with his life, and the wound would close only with his death. At the time our story begins, the young Count had left the castle for some weeks. What long and pressing arguments Rosco had had to prevail on his master to abandon the solitude in which he was wasting away. Consolation might be impossible, but an attempt at distraction might at least be made. A plan of a tour was then decided on, which consisted in first visiting the Transylvanian provinces. Later, Rothko hoped that the young Count would agree to resume the European journey, which had been interrupted by the sad events at Naples. Franz de Telec had set out for only a short exploration. He and Rothko had crossed the Wallachian plains up to the imposing mass of the Carpathians. They had been among the Vulcan defiles, and after an ascent of Retizat and an excursion across the valley of the Maros, they had come for a rest to the village of Worst, to the King Matthias Inn. We know the state of affairs when Franz de Telec arrived, and how he had been informed of the incomprehensible occurrences of which the castle had been the scene. We also know how he had ascertained that the castle belonged to Baron Rodolphe de Gortz. The effect produced by his name was too apparent for Master Colts and the other notables not to notice it, and Rothko would have cheerfully sent to the devil this Master Colts, who had so inopportunely uttered it and his stupid stories. Why should some ill chance have brought Franz de Telec to this very village of Worst, in the neighborhood of the castle of the Carpathians? The young Count had become silent. This look, wandering from one to the other, only too clearly indicated the deep trouble of his mind, which he was seeking in vain to calm. Master Colts and his friends understood that some mysterious tie must exist between the Count de Telec and the Baron de Gortz. But, inquisitive as they were, they maintained a seemly reserve and did not seek to take an advantage. Later on they would see what they could do. A few minutes afterwards, everyone had left the King Matthias, much perplexed at this extraordinary chain of adventures, which foreboded no good to the village. And now that the young Count knew to whom the castle of the Carpathians belonged, would he keep his promise? If he went to Carlsberg, would he report the matter to the authorities and demand their intervention? That was what the Bureau, the schoolmaster, Dr. Patak, and others were asking. If he did not do so, Master Colts had resolved to do so. The police had been informed of what had occurred. They would visit the castle. They would see if it were haunted by spirits or inhabited by criminals, for the village could remain no longer under such a state of affairs. This would, it is true, be quite useless in the opinion of most of the inhabitants. To attack the spirits, the swords of the gendarmes would be broken like glass, and their guns would misfire each time. Franz de Telec, left alone in the large room of the King Matthias, abandoned himself to the recollections which the name of Baron de Gortz had so unhappily evoked. After remaining in an armchair for an hour, as if he were quite exhausted, he rose, left the saloon, and went out to the end of the terrace and looked away in the distance. On the place a ridge, bounded by the Orgal Plateau, rose the castle of the Carpathians. There had lived that strange personage, the frequenter of San Carlo, the man who had inspired such insurmountable terror in the unfortunate Lastilla. But at present the castle was deserted, and Baron de Gortz had not returned to it since he had fled from Naples. None knew what had become of him, and it was possible he had put an end to his existence after the death of the great artist. Franz wandered in this way across the field of supposition, knowing not where to stop. On the other hand, the adventure of the forester Nick Deck to a certain extent troubled him, and he would have liked to have unraveled the mystery if were only to reassure the people of Worst. Added to this, the young Count had no doubt that it was a band of thieves who had taken refuge in the castle, and he had resolved to keep his promise and put a stop to the maneuvers of those sham ghosts by giving information to the police at Carlsberg. But before taking steps in the matter, Franz resolved to have the most circumstantial details of the affair. For this object, the best thing to do was to apply to the young forester in person, and about three o'clock in the afternoon, before returning to the inn, he presented himself at the Bureau's house. Master Colts showed that he was honored to receive a gentleman like the Count de Telec, this descendant of a noble Romanian race to whom the village of Worst would be indebted for the recovery of its peace and prosperity. For then, travelers would return to visit the country, and pay the customary tolls, without having to fear the malevolent spirits of the castle of the Carpathians, etc., etc. Franz de Telec thanked Master Colts for his compliments, and asked to be allowed to see Nick Deck, if there were no objection. None at all, Count, replied the Bureau. The gallant Nick is going on as well as possible, and will soon return to his work and turning to his daughter, who had just entered the room, he said, "'Is that not true, Mariota?' "'May heaven grant it so, my father,' 
replied Miriota in an agitated voice. Franz was charmed by the girl's graceful greeting, and seeing she was still anxious regarding the state of her betrothed, he hastened to ask her for some explanation of the subject. From what I have heard, he said, Nick Deck has not been seriously hurt. No count, said Miriota, and heaven be praised for it. You have a physician at worst? Hum, said Master Colts in a tone that was not very flattering to the old quarantine man. We have Dr. Patak, replied Miriota. He who accompanied Nick Deck to the castle of the Carpathians? Yes. I should like to see your betrothed for his own sake, and obtain the most precise details of his adventure. He will be glad to give you them, even though it may fatigue him a little. Oh, I will not abuse the opportunity, and I will do nothing to injure Nick Deck. I know that. When is your marriage to take place? In a fortnight, said the Bureau. Then I shall have the pleasure of being present if Master Colts will give me an invitation. Such an honor, Count. In a fortnight, then. It is understood. And I'm sure that Nick Deck will be well again as soon as he can take a walk with his good-looking betrothed. God protect him, replied the girl as she blushed. And her charming face betrayed such apparent anxiety that Franz asked her the reason. Yes, may God protect him, replied Mariota, for in endeavoring to enter the castle in spite of the prohibition, Nick has defied the spirits, and who knows if they may not set themselves to injure him all his life. Oh, for that, replied Franz, we will have it all put straight, I promise you. Nothing will happen to my poor Nick? Nothing. And thanks to the police, you will be able to visit the castle in a few days, and be quite as safe as in the streets of Worst. The young Count, thinking it inopportune to discuss the question of the supernatural, asked Miriota to show him the way to the forester's room. This the girl hastened to do, and then she left him alone with her betrothed. Nick Deck had been informed of the arrival of the two travelers at the King Matthias Inn. Seated in an old armchair as large as a sentry box, he rose to receive this visitor. As he now suffered but little from the paralysis with which he had been momentarily struck, he was sufficiently well to reply to the Count's questions. Nick Deck, said Franz, after a friendly shake of the hand, I would first ask you if you really believe in the presence of evil spirits at the castle of the Carpathians. I am compelled to believe it, replied Nick Deck. And it was they who kept you from getting over the castle wall? I have no doubt of it. And why, if you please? Because if they were not spirits, what happened to me would be inexplicable. Will you have the goodness to tell me, without admitting anything, what really did happen? Willingly. Nick Deck told his story item by item. He could only confirm the facts which Franz had heard in his conversation with the guests of the King Matthias. Facts on which, as we know, the young Count put a purely natural interpretation. In short, the occurrences of this night of adventure could be easily explained if human beings, criminal or otherwise, occupied the castle, and had the machinery capable of producing these phantasmal effects. As to Dr. Batak's peculiar assertion that he was chained to the ground by some force, it could only be supposed that he had been the sport of some illusion. What was most likely was that his limbs had failed him simply because he was mad with terror, and that Franz declared to the young forester. What? said Nick Deck. Would it be at the moment he wanted to run that his legs would fail the coward? That is hardly likely, you must admit. Well, continued Franz, let us admit that his legs were caught in some trap, probably hidden under the grass at the bottom of the ditch. When a trap closes, said the forester, it hurts you cruelly, it tears your flesh, and Dr. Patak's legs have no trace of a wound. Your observation is correct, Nick Deck, but if it will be true that the doctor could not get away, it must be that his legs were caught in some snare. Then I will ask you how this snare would open itself and set the doctor at liberty. Franz was too much puzzled to reply. But, Count, I leave to you all that concerns Dr. Patak. After all, I can only speak of what I know of myself. Yes, let us leave the doctor and speak of what happened to you, Nick Deck. What happened to me was clear enough. There is no doubt I received a terrible shock, and that in a way that is unnatural. There is no appearance of a wound on your body, asked Franz. None and yet I was struck with terrible violence. Was it just when you put your hand on the ironwork of the drawbridge? Yes, just as I touched it. I seemed as if it were paralyzed. Fortunately, my hand which held the chain did not leave go, and I slipped down to the bottom of the ditch where the doctor found me senseless. Franz shook his head with the air of a man whom these explanations left incredulous. You see, continued Nick Deck, what I have told you is no dream and if for eight days I remained full length in the bed without the use of arms or legs, it is not reasonable to say I must have imagined it all. 
I do not attempt to do that, said the Count. It is only too certain you received a brutal shock. Brutal and diabolic. No, and in that we differ, Nick Deck. You believe you were struck by some supernatural being, and I do not believe there are supernatural beings, either good or evil. Will you then explain what happened to me? I cannot do that yet, Nick Deck, but rest assured all will be explained, in the most simple manner. May God grant it so. Tell me, said Franz, has this castle belonged all along to the Gortz family? Yes, and it belongs to it now, although the last descendant of the family, Baron Rudolph, disappeared, and no one had heard of him since. When did he disappear? About twenty years ago. Twenty years? Yes. One day Baron Rudolph left the castle, of which the last servant died a few months after his departure, and no one has seen him since. And since then no one has set foot in the castle? No one. And what is thought about him in the neighborhood? It is supposed that Baron Rudolph died abroad a short time after he disappeared. Then it is supposed wrong, Nick Deck. The Baron is still alive. At least he was so five years ago. He's alive? Yes, in Italy. At Naples. You have seen him? I have seen him. And during the five years? I have heard nothing about him. The young forester thought for a moment or so. An idea had occurred to him, an idea he hesitated to formulate. At length he made up his mind, and, raising his head and knitting his brow, he said, It is not supposable that Baron de Gortz has returned to the country with the intention of shutting himself up in the castle. No, it is not supposable, Nick Deck. What object would he have in hiding himself, in never letting anyone come near him? None, replied Franz de Telec. And yet this was the thought which had begun to take shape in the mind of the young count. Was it not possible that this personage, whose existence had always been so enigmatic, had taken refuge in the castle after he left Naples? There, thanks to superstitious belief skillfully acted upon, would it not be easy for him to live in isolation, to defend himself against every unwelcome search, it being understood that he knew the state of mind that prevailed in the surrounding country? But yet Franz thought it useless to launch the Wurstians on this hypothesis. It would have been necessary to have put them in possession of facts which were too personal to him. Besides, he would have convinced nobody, and that he saw clearly enough when Nick Deck added, If it is Baron Rodolph who is in the castle, we shall have to believe that Baron Rodolph is the chort, for only the chort could have treated me in this way. Desirous of not returning over the same ground, Franz changed the course of the conversation. After employing every means to reassure the young forester as to the consequence of his attempt, he made his promise not to renew it. That was not his affair, it was the business of the authorities, and the Carlsberg police would know how to discover the mystery of the castle of the Carpathians. The young count then took leave of Nick Deck, recommending him to get well as quickly as possible, so as not to delay his marriage with the fair Miriota, at which he promised to be present. Absorbed in his reflections, Franz returned to the King Matthias, and did not go out again that day. At six o'clock Jonas served his dinner in the large room, when by a praiseworthy feeling of reserve neither Master Colts nor any of the villagers came to trouble his solitude. About eight o'clock, Rotsko said to the young Count, Do you have no further need of me, Master? No, Rotsko. Then I will go and smoke my pipe on the terrace. Go, Rotsko, go. Lounging in an armchair, Franz again began to think of all that had passed. He was at Naples during the last performance at the San Carlo Theatre. He saw the Baron de Gortz at the moment when, for the first time, this man appeared to him, his head out of the box, his look ardently fixed on the artiste, as if he would fascinate her. Then his thoughts recurred to the letter signed by the strange personage, which accused him, Franz de Telec, of having killed Lestilla. Lost in his recollections, Franz felt sleep come over him little by little, but it was still in that transition state when one could perceive the least noise when a surprising phenomenon took place. It seemed that a voice, sweet and modulated, made itself heard in the room, where Franz was alone, quite alone. Without knowing whether he dreamt or not, Franz rose and listened. Yes, it seemed as though a mouth came close to his ear, and invisible lips gave forth the expressive melody of Stefano, inspired by these words. Nel giardino de mille fiori andiamo mio cuore. This romance Franz knew. This romance of ineffable sweetness La Stilla had sung in the concert she had given at the San Carlo Theatre before her farewell performance. Unconsciously, Franz abandoned himself to the charm of hearing it once again. 
Then the phrase ended, and the voice, gradually growing fainter, died away with the last vibrations of the air. But Franz roused himself from his torpor. He straightened himself up abruptly. He held his breath to see some distant echo of his voice which went to his heart. All was silent within and without. Her voice, he murmured. Yes, it was really her voice. The voice I love so much. Then, returning to himself, he said, I was asleep, and I dreamed. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 The Count awoke at dawn, his mind still troubled with the visions of the night. In the morning he was to leave the village of Worst on the road to Kosovar. After visiting the manufacturing towns of Petrozny and Lividzel, Franz's intention was to stay an entire day at Carlsberg, before stopping some time in the capital of Transylvania. From there the railway would take him across the provinces of central Hungary, where his journey would end. Franz had left the inn, and, walking on the terrace with his field glass to his eyes, he was examining with deep emotion the outlines of the castle, which the sun was showing up so clearly on the Orgal Plateau. And his reflections bore on this point. When he reached Carlsberg, would he keep the promise he had made to the people of Worst? Would he inform the police of what had happened at the castle of the Carpathians? When the young count had undertaken to restore peace to the village, he had no doubt but the castle was the refuge of some gang of criminals, or at least of people of doubtful repute, who, having some interest in not being sought after, had taken steps to prevent anyone approaching them. But since the previous day, Franz had been thinking the matter over. A change had come over his thoughts, and he now hesitated. For five years the last descendant of the family of Gortz, Baron Rudolph, had disappeared, and what had become of him no one knew. Doubtless, rumor had said he was dead a short time after his departure from Naples. But was that true? What proof had they of his death? Perhaps the Baron de Gortz was alive, and if he lived, why should he not have returned to the castle of his ancestors? Why should not Orphanic, his only familiar friend, have accompanied him? And why should not this strange physician be the author and manager of these phenomena which caused such terror in the country? It will be admitted that this hypothesis appeared somewhat plausible, and if Baron Rodolph de Gortz and Orphanic had taken refuge in the castle, it was natural that they would try to make it unapproachable so as to live that life of isolation which was in accordance with their habits and characters. If this were the case, what ought the Count to do? Was it desirable that he should interfere in the private affairs of the Baron de Gortz? This he was asking himself, weighing the pros and cons of the question, when Rotzko came to rejoin him on the terrace. When he had told him of what he had been thinking, Master, replied Rotzko, it is possible that this may be the Baron de Gortz, who is giving himself over to every diabolic imagination. Well, if that is so, my advice is not to mix yourself up with his affairs. The poltroons of worst will get out of their difficulty in their own way. That is their business, and we have no reason for troubling ourselves about bringing peace to this village. Quite so, said Franz, and all things considered, I think you are right in my brave Rotzko. I think so, said Rotzko simply. As to Master Colts and the others, they now know what to do to finish up with the pretended spirits at the castle. Undoubtedly, all they have to do is tell the Carlsberg police. We will start after breakfast. All will be ready. But before we return down the valley of the sill, we will go around towards Plesa. And why? I wish to see this castle of the Carpathians a little nearer, if possible. For what purpose? Fancy, Rotzko, a mere fancy, which will not delay us half a day. Rotzko was much annoyed at this decision, which he looked upon as useless. All it could do would be to recall the memory of the past, which he tried his best to avoid. This time he tried in vain, and he had to yield to his master's inflexible resolution. Franz, as if he had become subject to some irresistible influence, felt himself drawn toward the castle. Without his being aware of it, this attraction might be due to the dream in which he had heard the voice of Lestilla murmur the plaintive melody of Stefano. But had he been dreaming? Yes, that is what he was asking himself now that he remembered that he was in the same room of the King Matthias, a voice had already made itself heard. That voice which Nick Deck had so imprudently defied. In the Count's mental condition there was nothing surprising in this forming a plan of going to the castle. In the Count's mental condition there was nothing surprising in his forming the plan of going to the castle, to the foot of its wall, without any thought of entering. Franz de Telec had, of course, no intention of telling the inhabitants of worst of his journey. These people would doubtless have joined Rotzko in dissuading him from approaching the castle, and he had ordered his man to be silent regarding it. 
when they saw him descending the village toward the valley of the sill, everybody imagined that they were on their way to Carlsberg, but from the terrace he had remarked that another road skirted the base of Red Gazette up to the Vulcan. It would thus be possible to climb the ridge of Plesa toward the castle without passing again through the village, and consequently without being seen by Master Colts or the others. About noon, having settled without discussion the somewhat inflated bill which Jonas presented to the accompaniment of his best smile, Franz prepared to leave first. Master Colts, the fair Muriotta, Magister Hermid, Dr. Patak, the shepherd Frick, and a number of the other inhabitants had come to bid him farewell. The young forester had even left his room, and it was clear enough would soon be on his legs again, for which the doctor took all the honor to himself. I congratulate you, Nick Deck, said Franz to him, both you and your betrothed. We are much obliged to you, said the girl, radiant with happiness. May your journey be fortunate, added the forester. Yes, may it be so, replied Franz, though his forehead was a little clouded. Monsieur le Comte, said Master Colts, we beg that you will not forget the information you promised to give at Carlsberg. I will not forget it, Master Colts, replied Franz. But should I be delayed on my journey, you know the very simple means of disembarrassing yourselves of your troublesome neighbors, and the castle will soon inspire no fear among the brave people of Worst. That is easily said, murmured the McEaster. And easily done, replied Franz. Before forty-eight hours, if you like, the police will have settled up with whoever is hiding in the castle. Except in the very probable case that they are spirits, said the shepherd Frick. Even then, said Franz, slightly shrugging his shoulders. Monsieur le Comte, said Dr. Patak, if you had accompanied me and Nick Deck, you might not talk about them as you do. I should be astonished if I did not, replied Franz, even if, like you, I had been so strangely detained by the feet in the castle ditch. By the feet, yes, Count, or rather, by the boots. Unless you suppose that it is my state of mind, I dreamt. I suppose nothing, said Franz, and will not try to explain what appears inexplicable. But be assured that the John Darms come to visit the castle of the Carpathians, their boots, which are accustomed to discipline, will not take root like yours. And with that parting shot at the doctor, the Count received for the last time the respects of the innkeeper of the King Matthias, so honored to have had the honor of the Honorable Franz de Telec, etc. After a salute to Master Colts, Nick Deck, his betrothed, and the inhabitants in the road, he made a sign to Rotsko, and both set out at a good pace down the road. In less than an hour, Franz and his man had reached the right bank of the river, which flowed round the southern base of Regisette. Rotsko had made up his mind to make no observation to his master. It would have been useless to have done so. Accustomed to obey him in military style, if the young Count met with some perilous adventure, he wouldn't know how to get out of it. After two hours walking, Franz and Rotsko stopped for a short rest. At this place, the Wallachian sill, which had been curving gently towards the right, approached the road by rather a sharp turn. On the other side was the Plesa and the Orgal Plateau at the distance of about a league. Franz then had to leave the sill if he wished to cross the hill in the direction of the castle. Evidently, this roundabout way, chosen for the purpose of avoiding a return through Worst, must have doubled the distance which separated the castle from the village. Nevertheless, it was still broad daylight when Franz and Rotsko reached the crest of the Orgal Plateau. The young Count would thus have time to see the castle from the outside. Then he would wait until evening before going back towards Worst, and it would be easy to follow the road without being seen. Franz's intention was to pass the night at Livingsdale, a little town situated at the confluence of the sills, and to resume the road to Carlsberg in the morning. The halt lasted half an hour. Franz, deep in his remembrances, much agitated at the thought that Baron de Gortz had perhaps concealed his existence in this castle, said not a word. And Rotsko had to make a great effort to keep from saying to him, It is useless to go further, master. Turn your back on this cursed castle and let us be off. They began to follow the foul wag of the valley but first they had to cross a thicket in which there was no footpath. Patches of the ground had been deeply cut into, for in the rainy season the sill frequently overflows, and flows in tumultuous torrents over the ground, which it converts into marsh. This caused some difficulty in the advance, and consequently some delay, and it took an hour to get back on the Vulcan Road, which was reached about five o'clock. The right flank of Plesa is not covered with the forest, such as Nick Deck had to cut his way through with an axe, but its difficulties were of another kind. There were heaps of moraines, among which they could not venture without caution. Sudden changes of level, deep excavations, great blocks dangerously unsettled on their bases and standing up like the seracs of the alpine regions, all the confusion of piles of enormous stones which avalanches had precipitated from the summit of the mountain. 
in fact, a veritable chaos and all horror. To climb a slope like this took a good hour's hard work. It seemed indeed that the castle of the Carpathians was sufficiently defended by the impracticability of its approaches, and perhaps Roscoe hoped that there would be obstacles that would be impossible to surmount, although there were none. Beyond the zone of blocks and hollows, the outer crest of the Orgal Plateau was eventually reached. From there the outline of the castle was clear enough in the midst of this mournful desert, from which for so many years fear had kept away the natives of the district. It should be noticed that Franz and Rotzko had approached the castle on its northern face. Nick Deck and Dr. Patak had attacked it on the east by taking the left of the plaza and leaving the torrent of Nyad to the right. The two directions formed a somewhat wide angle, of which the apex was the central dungeon. On the northern side it was impossible to obtain admittance, for there was neither gate nor drawbridge, and the wall, in following the irregularities of the plateau, ran to a considerable height. But it mattered little that access was impossible on this side for the young Count had no intention of entering within the walls. It was half-past seven when Franz de Telec and Rotzko stopped at the extreme end of the Orgal Plateau. Before them rose this barbaric pile of buildings spread out in the gloom, and of much the same color as that of the Plessa rocks. To the left, the wall made a sudden bend, flanked by the bastion at the angle. There, on the platform above the crenellated parapet, stood the beech, whose twisted branches bore witness to the violent southwesterly breezes at this height. The shepherd Frick was not deceived. The legend gave but three more years of life to the old castle of the barons of Gortz. Franz, in silence, looked at the mass of buildings dominated by the stumpy dungeon in the center. There, without doubt, under that confused mass, were still hidden vaulted chambers long and sonorous, long dandelion corridors, and redoubts concealed in the ground such as old Magyar fortresses still possess. No dwelling could have been more fit for the last descendant of the family of Gortz to bury himself in oblivion, of which none knew the secret. And the more the young Count thought, the more he clung to the idea that Rodolphe de Gortz had taken refuge in the isolation of his castle of the Carpathians. But there was nothing to show that the dungeon was inhabited. No smoke rose from its chimneys, no sound came from its closed windows. Nothing, not even the cry of a bird, troubled the silence of the gloomy dwelling. For some minutes, Franz eagerly gazed at this ring of wall, which once was full of the tumult of festival and the clash of arms, but he said nothing, for his mind was laden with oppressive thoughts and his heart with remembrances. Rotzko, who respected the young Count's mournful silence, took care to keep away from him, and did not interrupt him by a single remark. But when the sun went down behind the shoulder of the plaza, and the valley of the two sills began to be bathed in shadow, he did not hesitate to approach him. Master, he said, the evening has come. It will soon be eight o'clock. Franz did not appear to hear. It is time to start, said Rotzko, if we are to reach Livensdale before the inns close. Rotzko, in a minute. Yes, in a minute. I will go with you, said Franz. It will take us quite an hour, master, to return to the hill road, and as the night will then have fallen, we shall run no risk of being seen. A few minutes more, said Franz, and we will go down toward the village. The Count had not moved from the spot he had stopped at when he reached the plateau. "'Do not forget, Master,' continued Rotzko, "'that in the dark it will be difficult to pass among the rocks. We can hardly do it in broad daylight. You must excuse me if I insist. Yes, we will go, Rotzko, I am with you.' And it seemed as though Franz was helplessly detained before the castle, perhaps by one of those secret presentiments which the heart cannot account for. Was he, then, chained to the ground like Dr. Patak said he had been in the ditch at the foot of the curtain? No. His feet were free from every fetter. He could move about on the plateau as he chose, and, if he wished, nothing could have prevented him from going round the wall, skirting the edge of the counterscarp. Perhaps he would do so. So thought Rotzko, who said for the last time, Are you coming, master? Yes, yes, replied Franz. And he remained motionless. The Orgal Plateau was already in darkness. The shadow of the hills had spread over the buildings whose outlines were all vague and misty. Soon nothing would be visible if no light shone from the windows of the dungeon. "'Come, master, come,' said Rotzko, and Franz was about to follow him, when on the platform of the bastion, where stood the legendary beach, there appeared an indistinct shape. Franz stopped, looking at the shape, whose outline gradually became clearer. It was a woman with her hair undone, her hands stretched out, enveloped in a long white robe. But this costume, was it not that which Lestilla wore in the final scene in Orlando? in which Franz de Telec had seen her for the last time? Yes, and it was Lestilla, motionless, with her arms stretched out toward the young Count, her penetrating gaze fixed on him. She! he cried. 
and rushing towards the ditch he would have rolled to the foot of the wall if Rothsko had not stopped him. But the apparition suddenly faded, and Lestilla was hardly visible for a minute. Little did it matter. A second would have sufficed for Franz to recognize her, and these words escaped him. She! And alive! End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 Was it possible? Lestilla, whom Franz de Tolec thought never to see again, had just appeared on the platform of the bastion. He had not been the sport of illusion, and Rothsko had seen her as he had done. It was indeed the great artiste in her costume of Angelica, such as she had worn in public at her last performance at San Carlo. The terrible truth flashed across the young count. This adored woman, who was to have been the Countess of Telec, had been shut up for five years in this castle amid the Transylvanian mountains. She, who Franz had seen fall dead on the stage, had survived. While he had been carried almost dying to the hotel, the Baron Rodolf must have found her and carried her off to the castle of the Carpathians, and it was an empty coffin that the whole population had followed to the Santo Campo Nuevo of Naples. It all appeared incredible, inadmissible, contrary to probability, and Franz said to himself over and over again, yes, but one thing is indubitable. Lestilla must have been carried off by the Baron de Gortz, for she was in the castle. She was alive, for she had just appeared above the wall. That was an absolute fact. The young count endeavored to collect his thoughts, which were centered on one single object, to rescue from Rodolphe de Gortz Lestilla, who for five years had been a prisoner in the castle of the Carpathians. Rothsko, said Franz in a breathless voice, listen to me. Understand me at last. It seems as though my brain were going, my master, my dear master, at all costs I must enter this castle this very night. No, tomorrow. This night, I tell you, she is there. She has seen me as I saw her. She's waiting for me. Well, I will follow you. No, I go alone. Alone? Yes. But how can you get into the castle when Nick Deck was not able to? I will go in, I tell you. The gate is shut. It will not be for me. I will seek for and I will find a breach. I will get through it. You do not wish me to accompany you, master? You do not wish it? No, we will separate, and it is by leaving me that you will serve me. Shall I wait for you here? No, Rothsko. Where shall I go, then? To worst. Or rather, no, not to worst, replied Franz. There will be no use in those people knowing. Go down to Vulcan and stay the night there. If you do not see me, leave Vulcan in the morning. That is to say, no, wait a few hours. Then go to Carlsberg. There go to the chief of police. Tell him all that has happened. Then return with his men. If necessary, storm the castle. Deliver her. Ah, she... Alive, in the power of Rodolphe de Gortz. And as the young count uttered these broken sentences, Rothsko noticed that his excitement increased, and manifested itself in the disordered ideas of one who was no longer master of himself. Go, Rothsko, he cried for the last time. You wish me to? I do. At this formal injunction, Rothsko could but obey, particularly as Franz had begun to leave him, and the darkness hid him from view. Rothsko remained a few moments where he was, unable to decide on going away. Then the idea occurred to him that the Count's efforts would be in vain, that he would not be able to enter the castle, nor to even get through the outer wall, that he would be compelled to return to the village of Vulcan, perhaps next morning, perhaps that night. The two of them would then go to Carlsberg, and what neither of them could do alone would be done by the police. They would settle with this Baron de Gortz, they would rescue the unfortunate Lestilla, they would search this castle of the Carpathians, they would not leave one stone upon another, if necessary, even if all the fiends imaginable united to defend it and Rothsko descended the slopes of the Orgal Plateau so as to return to the Vulcan Road. Following the edge of the counterscarp, Franz had already gone round the bastion which flanked it to the left. A thousand thoughts crowded in his mind. There was now no doubt about the presence of the Baron de Gortz in the castle, for Lestilla was a prisoner therein. It could only be the Baron. Lestilla alive! But how could Franz get to her? How could he get her out of the castle? He did not know, but it must be done, and it would be done. The obstacles which Nick Deck could not overcome, he would overcome. It was not curiosity which had brought him among these ruins, it was love for the woman he had found alive, yes, alive. After believing her to be dead, he would rescue her from Rodolphe de Gortz. Doubtless, Franz had said to himself that he could only obtain admission to the interior by means of the south curtain, in which the gate opened opposite the drawbridge, and seeing that it was impossible for him to scale the high walls, he continued to skirt the crest of the Orgal Plateau as soon as he had turned the angle of the bastion. In broad daylight, there would not have been much difficulty in this. At night, the moon was not yet up, a night all the darker from the mists which thicken on the mountains. It was more dangerous. To the danger of a false step, 
to the danger of a fall to the bottom of the ditch was added that of stumbling against the rocks and perhaps causing them to fall over. Franz went on, however, keeping as near as possible to the zigzags of the counterscarp, feeling his way hand and foot to make sure he was not going astray. Sustained by superhuman strength, he also felt himself guided by an extraordinary instinct that could not deceive him. Beyond the bastion stretched the south wall, that with which the drawbridge established communication when it was not raised against the gate. When the bastion was passed, obstacles appeared to multiply. Among the huge rocks which covered the plateau, to follow the counterscarp was impossible, and he had to leave it. Figure a man endeavoring to traverse a field of Karnak, in which the dolmens and menhirs were on no plan whatever, and not a mark to guide him, not a ray of light in the dark night. Franz kept on, here climbing over a rock which barred his way, there creeping along the rocks, his hands torn with the thistles and brushwood, his head skimmed by a pair of ospreys, disturbed in their resting places, and flying off, uttering their horrible scream. Ah, why did not the chapel bell clang as it had clanged for Nick Deck and the doctor? Why did not the intense light which had enveloped them stream up from beneath the battlements of the dungeon? He would have headed towards the sound. He would have made towards the light, as the sailor towards the siren's whistle or the lighthouse rays. No, nothing but deep night bordered his view a few yards away. This lasted for nearly an hour. When the ground began to slope to the left, Franz felt he was going wrong. Perhaps he had gone lower than the gate. Perhaps he was beyond the drawbridge. He stopped, stamping his foot and wringing his hand. Which way should he go? Ah, how angry he was when he thought he would have to wait for the daylight. But then he would be seen by the people in the castle. He could not take them by surprise. Rodolphe de Gortz would be on his guard. It was in the night time that he must get into the enclosure, and Franz could not find his way in the darkness. A cry escaped him, a cry of despair. Stilla, he cried, my Stilla. Did he think that the prisoner could hear him, that she could reply to him? And yet a score of times he shouted the name and the echoes of place that repeated it. Suddenly Franz's eyes were on alert. A ray of light pierced the darkness, a dazzling ray, and its source was of considerable elevation. There is the castle, there, he said, and from his position the light could only come from the central dungeon. In his mental excitement, Franz did not hesitate to believe that it was Lestilla who showed him this light. There could be no doubt she had recognized him at the moment he had perceived her through the battlement of the bastion, and now she it was who had given the signal and showed him the road to follow to reach the gate. Franz went toward the light, which increased with every step he took. As he had gone too far to the left on the plateau, he had to go back about twenty yards to the right, and after a few trials, he regained the edge of the counterscarp. The light shone in his face, and its height showed that it came from one of the windows of the dungeon. Franz was about to find himself faced by the last obstacle, insurmountable, perhaps. In fact, if the gate were shut, the drawbridge raised, he would have to go down to the foot of the wall, and what would he do then, where it was fifty feet high in front of him? Franz went on toward the place where the drawbridge would rest if the gate were open. The drawbridge was down. Without even stopping to think, Franz rushed onto the bridge and laid his hand on the gate. The gate opened. Franz rushed under the dark arch, but before he had taken a dozen steps, the drawbridge was raised with a clatter against the gate. Count Franz de Telec was a prisoner in the castle of the Carpathians. End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 The country people and travelers who passed backwards or forwards over the Vulcan Hill knew only the castle of the Carpathians from its exterior aspect. At the respectable distance at which fear kept the bravest the worst and its environs, they presented to the eye but an enormous mass of rocks, which they might take to be ruins. But within the enclosure, was the castle as dilapidated as they supposed? No, and within the shelter of its solid walls and buildings, the old feudal fortress could have accommodated quite a garrison. Vast vaulted halls, deep excavations, innumerable corridors, courts of which the stonework was hidden beneath a lofty fence of herbage, subterranean redoubts to which the light of day never penetrated. Narrow staircases contrived in the thickness of the walls, casemates lighted by the narrow loopholes in the external wall, a central dungeon with three floors of apartments sufficiently habitable, crowned by the crenellated platform, and among the other buildings of the enclosure, interminable corridors capriciously entangled, mounting to the platform of the bastions, diving to the depths of the lower structure, with a few cisterns in which the rainwater was caught, the overflow feeding the torrent of the naiad and then long tunnels, not stopped up as was believed, but giving access to the Vulcan road. Such was the state of the castle of the Carpathians, the geometrical plan of which was as complicated as that of the labyrinths of Porcina, of Lemnos, or of Crete. As Theseus was led by his love for the daughter of Minos, 
So was it the power of love, more intense and more irresistible, which had led the Count within the intricacies of the castle. Would he find an Ariadne's thread to guide him, as the Greek hero had done? Franz had but one thought, to get within the enclosure, and he had to get there. But one thing might have struck him, and that was that the drawbridge, which had always been raised, seemed to have been expressly lowered to admit him. Perhaps he might have been uneasy when the gate shut suddenly behind him, but he gave no thought to these things. He was at last in the castle where Rodolphe de Gortz was keeping Lestilla, and he would sacrifice his life to reach her. The gallery into which Franz had advanced was wide, lofty, and with a vaulted roof, and it was quite dark, and its pavement was broken up so that it had to be trodden carefully. Franz took to the left wall and kept to it, feeling his way along the facing, the efflorescent surface of which rubbed off on his hands. He heard no sound except that of his steps, which echoed in the distance. A draft of warm air with an ancient, frowsy smell swept gently past him, as if it were an opening at the other end of the gallery. After passing a stone pillar which served as a buttress in the last angle to the left, Franz found himself in a much narrower corridor. He had only to open his arms to touch the walls. He went on in this way, his body bent forward, feeling with hands and feet, and endeavoring to discover if the passage were a straight one. Two hundred yards after passing the buttress, Franz felt the wall curving off to the left and take the exactly opposite direction fifty paces further on. Did it return to the outer wall, or did it lead to the foot of the dungeon? Franz endeavored to quicken his advance, but every moment he was hindered by a rise in the ground, against which he stumbled, or by some sharp angle which changed his direction. From time to time he would reach some opening in the wall leading off to lateral ramifications. But all was dark, unfathomable, and it was in vain he sought to make out where he was in this maze in a molehill. He had to retrace his steps several times on ascertaining that he had gone where there was no thoroughfare. One thing he had to fear was that some badly fastened trap door would give away under his feet and drop him to some underground cell from which he could not escape. And so whenever he touched a piece that sounded hollow, he took care to cling to the walls, though he went forward with an ardor that hardly left him time for reflection. At the same time he had neither gone upward nor downward. The floor was clearly on the level of the inner courts arranged among the different buildings within the enclosure, and it was possible that the passages ended in the central dungeon, perhaps at the foot of the staircase. Certainly there ought to exist a more direct means of communication between the gate and the central buildings. When the Gortz family had lived there, it had not been necessary to enter these interminable passages. A second gate, which faced the gate opposite the first gallery, opened on to the place of arms, and in the center of which rose the keep, but it had been stopped up and Franz had not been able to see where it had been. For an hour the young Count continued his advance at a venture, listening if he could hear any distant sounds, and not daring to shout for Lestilla, lest the echoes should carry to the upper floors of the dungeon. He was in no way discouraged, and would go on until strength failed him, or some impassable obstacle compelled him to stop. But although he took no notice of it, Franz was already nearly exhausted. Since he left worst, he had eaten nothing. He suffered from hunger and thirst. His step was not sure, his legs were failing him. In this warm, humid air, his respiration had become irregular, and his heart beat violently. It was nearly nine o'clock when Franz, putting out his left foot, found no ground to tread upon. He stooped down, felt that there was a step, and then another below it. It was a staircase. Did these stairs go down to the foundations of the castle, with no way of exit? Franz did not hesitate to go down them, and he counted the steps, which went off obliquely from the passage. Seventy-seven steps were thus descended to the level of the second passage, which led to many gloomy windings. Franz went along these for half an hour, and, tired out, had just stopped when a luminous point appeared several hundred feet in advance. Whence came this light? Was it merely a natural phenomenon, the hydrogen of some will-o'-the-wisp that lighted itself at the depth? Was it a lantern carried by one of the inhabitants of the castle? Can it be Lestilla? murmured France. And the thought occurred to him that a light had already appeared as if to show him the way into the castle when he was wandering along the rocks on the Orgal Plateau. If it had been Lestilla who had shown this light at one of the windows of the dungeon, was it not Lestilla who was now trying to guide him amid the sinuosities of these subterranean passages? Hardly master of himself, Franz bent down and looked ahead without moving. It was more of a diffused effulgence than a luminous point that seemed to fill a sort of vault at the end of the passage. Franz crawled towards it, for his limbs could scarcely support him, and passing through the narrow entrance he fell on the threshold of a crypt. This crypt was in good state of preservation, about twelve feet high, and circular in shape. The arches of the vault sprang from the capitals of eight dwarf columns and met in a hanging boss, in the center of which was a glass vase filled with a yellowish light. Facing the entrance between two of the columns was another door which was closed, and the large rounded bolts showed where the outer ironwork of the hinges was fastened. 
Franz dragged himself up to his second door and tried to move it. His efforts were in vain. Some old furniture was in the crypt. There was a bed, or rather a bench, an old heart of oak, on which were a few bedclothes. There was a stool with twisted feet. There was a table fixed to the wall with iron tenons. On the table there was a large jug full of water, a dish with a piece of cold venison, a thick piece of bread like a sea biscuit. In a corner murmured a fountain fed by the narrow stream, the overflow of which passed away at the base of one of the columns. Did not these arrangements show that some guest was expected in this crypt, or rather a prisoner in this prison? Was this prisoner Franz, and had he been lured by stratagem into the interior of the castle? In the trouble of his thoughts, Franz had no suspicion of this. Exhausted by want and fatigue, he dashed at the food on the table, quenched his thirst with the contents of the jug, and then fell on the rough bed, where a sleep of a few minutes might recruit his strength. But when he tried to collect his thoughts, it seemed as though they escaped like the water which he might try to hold in his hand. Would he then have to wait for daylight to recommence his search? Had his will so far forsaken him that he was no longer master of his acts? No, said he, I will not wait. To the dungeon. I must reach the dungeon tonight. Suddenly the light in the vase went out, and the crypt was plunged in complete darkness. Franz would have risen. He could not do so, and his thoughts went to sleep, or rather stopped suddenly, like the hands of a clock when the spring breaks. It was a strange sleep, or rather an overpowering torpor, an absolute annihilation of being which did not proceed from the soothing of his mind. How long the sleep lasted Franz did not know. His watch had run down and did not show the time, but the crypt was again bathed in artificial light. Franz jumped off the bed and stepped toward the first door, which was open all the time, then toward the second, which was still closed. He began to reflect and found he could not do so without difficulty. If his body had recovered from the fatigues of the night before, he felt his head empty and heavy. How long have I slept, he asked. Is it night or is it day? Within the crypt nothing had changed, except that the light had been renewed, the food replaced, and the jug filled with clear water. Someone, then, must have been there while Franz was deep in his overpowering slumber. It was known that he was in the depths of the castle. He was in the power of Baron Rodolphe de Gortz. Was he doomed to have no further communication with his fellow men? That was not possible, and, besides, he would escape, for he could do so. He would retraverse the gallery that led to the gate. He would leave the castle. Leave? He then remembered that the gate was closed behind him. Well, he would try to reach the outer wall, and by one of the embrasures he could try to slip down into the ditch. Cost what it might, in an hour he would have escaped from the castle. But Lestilla, would he give up on reaching her? Would he go away without rescuing her from Rodolphe de Gortz? Yes, and what he could not do single-handed, he would do with the help of the police, which Roscoe would bring from Carlsberg to the village of Wurst. They would rush to the assault of the old stronghold, they would search the castle from top to bottom. Having come to this determination, he decided to put it into execution without losing an instant. Franz rose and was walking toward the passage by which he had come when he heard the noise behind the other door. It was certainly the sound of footsteps approaching very slowly. Franz put his ear against the door, and, holding his breath, he listened intently. The steps seemed to be coming at regular intervals, as if they were going upstairs. No doubt there was a second staircase which connected the crypt with the interior courts. In readiness for whatever might happen, Franz drew from the sheath his hunting knife, which he wore at his belt and gripped it firmly. If it were to be one of Baron de Gortz's servants who entered, he would throw himself on him, take away the keys, and make it impossible for him to follow him, and then Franz would rush along this new road and try to reach the dungeon. If it were the Baron de Gortz, and he would recognize him, although he had only seen him once, at the moment Listilla fell on the stage of San Carlo, he would attack him without mercy. However, the footsteps stopped on the landing which formed the outer threshold. Franz did not move, but waited until the door was opened. It did not open, but a voice of infinite sweetness was heard by the young Count. It was the voice of Listilla. Yes, her voice a little weakened, her voice which had lost nothing of its inflections, of its inexpressible charm, of its careless modulations, that admirable instrument of the marvelous art which seemed to have died with the artiste. And Lestilla repeated the plaintive melody which he had heard in his dream when he slept in the saloon of the inn at worst. Nel giardino de mille fiori, andiamo mio cuore. The song entered into Franz to the depth of his soul. He breathed it, he drank it like a divine liquor, while Lestilla seemed to invite him to follow her, repeating, Andiamo, mia cori, andiamo. But why did not the door open to let him through? Could he not reach her, clasp her in his arms, and take her with him out of the castle? Stilla, my Stilla, he shouted, and he threw himself against the door, which stood firm against his efforts. Already the song seemed to grow fainter, 
the footsteps were heard going away. Franz knelt down trying to shake the planks, tearing his hands with the ironwork, calling all the time to Listilla, whose voice had died away in the distance. It was then that a terrible thought flashed through his mind. Mad, he exclaimed, she is mad, for she did not recognize me and did not reply to me. For five years she had been shut up in the castle in the power of this man, my poor Stella. Her reason has left her. Then he rose, his eyes haggard, his head as if on fire. I also, I feel that I am going mad, he repeated. I am going mad, mad like her. He strode backwards and forwards across the crypt like a wild beast in its cage. No, he repeated, no, I must not go mad. I must get out of this castle. I will go. And he went toward the first door. It had just shut silently. Franz had not noticed it while he was listening to the voice of Listilla. He had been imprisoned within the enclosure, and now he was a prisoner within the crypt. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 Franz was thoroughly astounded. As he had feared, the faculty of thinking, of comprehending matters, the intelligence necessary for him to reason on them, was gradually leaving him. The only feeling that remained was the remembrance of Listilla, the impression of the song he had just heard, and which the echoes of this gloomy crypt no longer repeated. Had he been the sport of an illusion? No, a thousand times no. It was indeed Listilla he had just heard. It was indeed her he had seen on the castle bastion. Then the thought returned to him, the thought that she was deprived of reason, and this horrible blow struck him as if he were about to go out of his mind a second time. Mad, he repeated, yes, mad, for she did not recognize my voice. Mad, mad. And that seemed to be only too likely. Ah, if he could only rescue her from this place, take her to his castle of Krajoa, devote himself entirely to her, his care and love would soon restore her to sanity. So said Franz, a prey to a terrible delirium, and many hours went by before he was himself again. Then he tried to reason coolly, to collect himself amid the chaos of his thoughts. I must get away from here, he said. How? As soon as they reopen that door? Yes. During my sleep they come and renew this food. I will wait. I will pretend to sleep. A suspicion occurred to him. The water in the jug must contain some soporific substance. If he had been plunged in this heavy sleep, in this complete unconsciousness, the duration of which he did not know, it was because he had drunk the water. Well, he would drink no more of it. He would not even touch the food on the table. Someone would come soon, and then... Then... What did he know of it? At this moment was the sun mounting toward the zenith, or sinking on the horizon? Was it day or night? Then Franz listened for the sound of footsteps at either door, but no sound reached him. He crept along the walls of the crypt, his head burning, his eyes glaring, his ears throbbing, his breath panting amid this heavy atmosphere, which was only just renewed through the chink around the doors. Suddenly, near the angle of one of the columns on the right, he felt a fresher breath than usual reach his lips. Was there an opening here through which air came in from the outside? Yes, there was a passage he had not noticed in the shade of the column to glide between the walls, to make for an indistinct clearness which seemed to come from above, was what Franz did in an instant. There was a small court five or six yards across, with the walls a hundred feet high. It seemed to be a well which served as an outer court for this subterranean cell, and gave it a little air and light. Franz could see it was still day. At the top of the well was a small angle of light which just shone on the upper margin. The sun had accomplished at least half its diurnal course, for this luminous angle was slowly decreasing. It must be about five o'clock in the afternoon. Consequently, Franz must have slept for at least forty hours, and he had no doubt this must have been due to the soporific draft. As he and Rothsko had left worst on the 11th of June, this must be the 13th, which was about to finish in a few hours. So humid was the air at the bottom of this court that Franz breathed it deeply and felt all the better for it, but if he had hoped that an escape was possible up this long stone tube, he was soon undeceived. To try and climb that smooth, lofty wall was impracticable. Franz returned to the interior of the crypt. As he could only get out through one of the doorways, he came to see what state they were in. The first door, that by which he had come, was very solid and very thick, and it kept in its place on the other side by bolts, working into iron staples. It was, therefore, useless to try and force it. The second door, behind which he had heard Lestilla's voice, did not seem to be so well preserved. The boards were rotten in places, and it might be possible to clear a way through them. Yes, this is the way, said Franz, who had recovered his coolness. This is the way. But he had no time to lose, as it was probable someone would enter the crypt as soon as he was supposed to be asleep under the influence of the soporific draft. The work went on more quickly than he had expected. The moisture had eaten into the wood around the metal clasp, which held the bolts against the embrasure. 
With his knife, Franz managed to get the round part off, working noiselessly, and stopping now and then to listen and make sure that nothing was moving on the other side. Three hours afterwards, the bolts were free, and the door opened with a scroop on its hinges. Franz then returned to the little court so as to breathe a less stifling air. At this moment, the sun no longer shone across the opening of the well, and consequently must have sunk beyond Retizet. The court was in complete darkness. A few stars gleamed above, as if they were seen through the tube of a long telescope. A few small clouds drifted along the intermittent breadth of the night breeze. A peculiar haze in the atmosphere showed that the moon must have risen above the eastern mountains. It was evidently about nine o'clock at night. Franz went back to the crypt, where he ate some of the food and quenched his thirst from the spring, after throwing away the liquid in the jug. Then, with his knife at his belt, he went out by the door which he had shut behind him. And now would he meet the unfortunate Listella wandering in these subterranean galleries? At the thought his heart beat almost ready to burst. As soon as he had made a few steps he stumbled. As he had thought, there was a flight of stairs, of which he counted the steps. Sixty only instead of the seventy-seven he had come down to the threshold of the crypt. Consequently, he was about eight feet below the level of the ground. Having nothing better to do than to follow the dark corridor, the sides which he could touch with his outstretched hands, he hurried on in that direction, and he went on for half an hour without being stopped by door or railing. But the large number of turns had prevented him from knowing in what direction he was going, with regard to the wall which faced the Orgal Plateau. After halting a few minutes to get his breath, Franz continued his advance, and it seemed as though the corridor were to be interminable, when an obstacle stopped him. This was a wall of bricks. Tapping it at different heights, he could find no sign of an opening. This was the only way out from the corridor. Franz could not help exclaiming. All his hopes were shattered against this obstacle. His knees bent, his legs gave way, and he fell at the foot of the wall. But just on the ground, the wall had a narrow crack in it, and the bricks, being rather loose, shook as he touched them. This is the way, said Franz. Yes, this is the way. And he began to pull out the bricks one by one, when there was a noise of something metallic on the other side. Franz stopped. The noise had not ceased. At the same time, a ray of light swept across the hole. Franz looked through. It was the old chapel that he saw. To what a lamentable state of dilapidation time and neglect had reduced it. The roof had fallen in, a few only of the ribs perfect on their swelling columns, two or three pointed arches threatening to fall, a window frame with flamboyant mullions thrust out of place, here and there a dusty tomb beneath which slept some ancestor of the family of Gortz, and at the end a fragment of an altar with the re-redus still showing traces of sculpture. Then the remains of the roof still over the apse, which had been spared by the storms, and then over the ridge above the entrance, the shaking belfry, from which hung a rope to the ground, the rope of the bell which occasionally rang to the terror of the people of Worst. Into this chapel, deserted for so long, open to all the rigors of the Carpathian climate, a man had just entered, holding in his hand a lantern, the brilliant light of which shone full on his face. Franz instantly recognized him. It was Orphanic, that eccentric individual whom the Baron had made his only companion during his sojourn in the large Italian towns, that oddity he had seen along the streets gesticulating and talking to himself, that incomprehensible scientist, that inventor ever in search of some chimera, and who doubtless put all his inventions at the service of Rodolphe de Gortz. If Franz had retained any doubt as to the presence of the Baron at the castle of the Carpathians, even after the apparition of La Stilla, this doubt was changed to certainty when he saw Orphanic. What was he going to do in this ruined chapel at this advanced hour of the night? Franz tried to discover, and this is what he saw. Orphanic, stooping over the ground, was lifting up a few iron cylinders to which he was attaching a line, which he unrolled from a reel placed in one of the corners of the chapel. And such was the attention he gave to his work, that he would not have seen the young Count if he had been able to get near him. Ah, why was not the whole Franz had begun to enlarge sufficient to let him pass? He would have entered the chapel, he would have hurled himself on Orphanic, he would have compelled him to lead him to the dungeon. But perhaps it was all as well that he could not do so, for if the attempt failed, the Baron de Gortz would have doubtlessly made him pay with his life for the secrets he had discovered. A few minutes after the arrival of Orphanic, another man entered the chapel. It was Baron Rodolphe de Gortz. The never-to-be-forgotten physiognomy of this personage had not changed. He did not even seem to have aged, with his pale, long face, which the lantern illuminated from top to bottom, his long gray hair thrown back behind his ears, and his look glittering from the depths of his black orbits. Rodolphe de Gortz went near to examine the work on which Orphanic was engaged, and this was the conversation exchanged between the men in short, sharp tones. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 Is the connection with the chapel finished, Orphanic? I have just done it. 
Everything is ready in the case meets of the Bastions? Everything. The Bastions and Chapel are in direct connection with the dungeon? They are. And after the instrument was made the current, we shall have time to get away? We shall. Have you made sure the tunnel onto the Vulcan is clear? It is. They were silent for a few minutes while Orphanic took up his lantern and directed its light into the corners of the chapel. Ah, my old castle, exclaimed the Baron. You will cost them dear who would storm your walls. And Rodolphe de Gortz pronounced these words in a tone which made the Count shudder. You have heard what they say at worst? The Baron asked Orphanic. Fifty minutes ago I heard on the wire what they were talking about at the King Matthias. Is the attack to be tonight? No, not until daybreak. When did this Rotsko return to worst? Two hours ago, with the police he brought from Carlsberg. Well, as the castle cannot defend itself, said the Baron, at least it can crush under its ruins this Franz de Talec and all his people with him. Then, after a few minutes, he continued. And this wire, or Fennec, will they ever know that it put the castle in communication with the village worst? I will destroy it, and they will know nothing about it. And now the hour would seem to have come to explain certain phenomenon which have occurred in the course of our story, the origin of which ought to no longer be concealed. At this point, it must be remembered that these events happened in one of the closing years of the 19th century. The useful electricity, which had justly been called the soul of the universe, had been brought to its highest perfection. The illustrious Edison and his disciples had finished their work. Among other electrical instruments, the telephone then worked with such wonderful precision that the sounds collected by the diaphragms could be freely heard without the aid of ear trumpets. What was said, what was sung, what was even whispered could be heard at any distance, and two persons separated by thousands of leagues could converse as easily as if they were side by side. For some years Orphanic, the Baron's inseparable companion, had been in all that concerns the practical applications of electricity an inventor of the first order. But, as we know, his admirable discoveries had not been welcomed as they deserved. The learned world had taken him for a madman, whereas he was a man of genius, and hence the inappeasable hatred which the despised inventor bore to his fellow men. It was under these circumstances that Baron de Gortz had met Orphanic, who was then in the depths of misery. He encouraged him in his work, he helped him with money, and finally he engaged him to be his companion, on condition that he alone should profit by any inventions. In fact, these two eccentric personages were made to understand one another, and since their meeting they had never separated, not even when the Baron de Gortz was following La Stilla from town to town in Italy, while the melomaniac was intoxicating himself with the singing of the incomparable artiste, or Fanick was busy in completing the discoveries made by electricians during these later years, perfecting their adaptations and obtaining the most extraordinary results from them. After the events which terminated the dramatic career of La Stilla, the Baron had disappeared without anyone knowing what had become of him. When he left Naples, it was in the castle of the Carpathians that he had taken refuge, accompanied by Orphanic, who had no hesitation in shutting himself up with it. When he resolved to bury his existence in this old castle, the Baron's intention was that no inhabitant of the district should suspect his return, and no one try to visit him. He need not say that Orphanic and he had the means of providing liberally for their daily wants. In fact, a secret communication existed with the road over the Vulcan, and by this road an old servant of the Baron's, whom nobody knew, brought in all that was necessary for the existence of Baron Rodolph and his companion. In reality, what remained of the castle, and particularly the central dungeon, was less dilapidated than was believed, and even more habitable than its inmates required. Orphanic, provided with all he wanted for his experiments, busied himself with immense researches in physics and chemistry, and of these he proposed to avail himself in his attempt to keep off unwelcome visitors. The Baron de Gortz received the propositions with eagerness and Orphanic built special machinery for spreading terror in the country by producing phenomenon which could only be ascribed to diabolic agencies. But in the first place it was necessary for the Baron de Gortz to be kept informed of what was passing in the nearest village. Was there any means of hearing what his people were talking about without their suspecting anything? Yes, if a telephone communication could be established between the castle and the large saloon of the King Matthias, where the notables of worst were accustomed to meeting every evening. Orphanic managed very skillfully and very secretly and in the most simple manner, a copper wire covered with the insulating sheath had one end fastened on the first floor of the dungeon and was then laid under the waters of the Naiad up to the village of Worst. This part of the work accomplished, Orphanic, going himself out as a tourist, came to spend a night at the King Matthias and there connect the wire with the inn saloon. It was easy for him to bring up the end from the bed of the torrent to the height of the back window which was never opened. He then fixed a telephonic instrument which was hidden by the thick foliage and with that connected the cable. As the instrument was ingeniously adopted to emit as well as receive sound, Baron de Gortz could hear all that was said at the King Matthias, and make himself heard whenever he chose. During the first years, the tranquility of the castle was not troubled. 
The evil reputation it enjoyed was enough to keep the people of Worst away from it. But one day, that on which our story began, the purchase of the telescope led to the smoke being noticed escaping from the dungeon chimney. From that moment, interest was reawakened, and we know what happened. It was then that the telephonic communication proved useful, for the Baron and Orphanic can keep themselves posted up on what was passing in the village. It was by the wire that they knew that Nick Deck had undertaken to visit the castle, and by the wire the threatening voice entered the room to endeavor to keep them away. When the young forester persisted in his determination in spite of the menace, the Baron resolved to give him such a lesson that he would have no desire to try it again. That night, Orphanic's machinery, which was always in working order, produced a series of purely physical phenomena intended to carry terror throughout the district. The bell was rung in the old chapel, intense flames were shot forth mingled with sea salt, giving a spectral appearance to everything. Powerful sirens were worked from which the compressed air escaped in terrible groans. Diagram outlines of monsters were projected onto the clouds by means of huge reflectors. Iron plates were laid about the ditch in communication with electric batteries, and one of these plates caught the doctor by his iron-shod boots while another had given the forester a shock at the moment he laid his hand on the drawbridge. And so the baron thought that after the apparition of these prodigies, after the attempts of Nick Deck which had ended so badly, terror would reach its height in the district, and that neither for gold nor silver would anyone approach even within two good miles of this castle of the Carpathians, evidently haunted by supernatural beings. Rodolphe de Gortz thought himself safe from all unwelcome curiosity when Franz de Telec arrived in the village of Worst. All that passed between him and Jonas and Master Colts and the others was immediately known to him along the wire in the naiad. The baron's hatred of the young count was rekindled by the memory of the events which had occurred at Naples. Not only was Franz de Telec in the village a few miles from the castle, but there before the notables he was deriding their absurd superstitions and demolishing the fantastic reputation that protected the castle of the Carpathians. And he was even undertaking to warn the Carlsberg authorities so that the police might come and scatter the legends to the winds. And so the Baron de Gortz resolved to allure Franz de Telec to the castle, and we know by what means he had succeeded. The voice of Lestilla, sent into the inn saloon by means of the telephone, had led the young count to turn aside from his road to visit the castle. The apparition of the singer on the platform of the bastion had given him an irresistible desire to enter. A light shone at one of the windows of the dungeon had guided him to the gate, which was opened to let him in. In this crypt, lighted electrically, in which he had again heard that wonderful voice, where food was brought him while he was in a lethargic sleep, in that crypt in the depth of the castle, the door which was closed to him. Franz de Telec was in the power of the Baron de Gortz, and the Baron de Gortz intended he should never get out of it. Such were the results obtained by this mysterious collaboration between Rodolphe de Gortz and his accomplice Orphanic. But to his extreme disgust, the Baron knew that the alarm had been given by Rotzko, who, not having followed his master into the castle, had warned the authorities at Carlsberg. A detachment of police had arrived at the village of Worst, and the Baron de Gortz would have a strong force to contend with. How could he and Orphanic defend themselves against a numerous party? The means employed against Nick Deck and the Dr. Patak would not be enough, for the police did not believe in diabolic intervention. And so they had resolved to destroy the castle completely, and were only waiting for the moment to act. An electric current had been prepared for firing the charges of dynamite which had been buried in the dungeon, the bastions, and the old chapel, and the arrangement would allow the Baron and his accomplice having time to escape by the tunnel on the Vulcan Road. After the explosion, of which the Count and a number of those who had scaled the castle walls would be the victims, the two would get so far away that no trace of them would be discoverable. What he had just heard had given Franz the explanation of many things that had happened. He now knew that telephonic communication existed between the castle of the Carpathians and the village of Worst. He also knew that the castle was about to be destroyed in an explosion that would cost him his life and be fatal to the police brought by Rotzko. He knew that the Baron de Gortz and Orphanic would have time to get away, dragging with them the unconscious Lestilla. Ah, why could not Franz rush into the chapel and throw himself on these men? He would have knocked them down. He would have stopped their injuring anyone. He would have prevented the catastrophe. But that was impossible at the moment, might not be so after the Baron's departure. When the two had left the chapel, Franz would throw himself on their track, pursue them to the castle, and with God's help would settle with them. The Baron and Orphanic were already in the apse. Franz had not lost sight of them. Which way were they going out? Was there a door opening onto the enclosure? Or was there some corridor connecting to the chapel with the dungeon? For it seemed as though all the castle buildings were in communication with each other. It mattered little if the Count did not meet with an obstacle he could not surmount. At this moment a few words were interchanged between Baron de Gortz and Orphanic. There is nothing more to do here? Nothing. Then we can leave each other. You still intend that I should leave you alone in the castle? Yes, Orphanic. And you get off at once by the tunnel onto the Vulcan Road. But you— 
I shall not leave the castle until the last moment. It is understood that I am to wait for you at Bistritz? At Bistritz. Remain here, Baron Rodolph, and remain alone, if that is your wish. Yes, for I wish to hear her. To hear her once again during the last night I shall pass in the castle of the Carpathians. A few moments afterwards the Baron de Gortz and Orphanic had left the chapel. Although the Stilla's name had not been mentioned in this conversation, Franz understood. It was of her that Rudolf de Gortz had just spoken. End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 The catastrophe was imminent. Franz could only prevent it by rendering the Baron incapable of executing his plan. It was then eleven o'clock at night. With no further fear of being discovered, Franz resumed his work. The bricks were easily taken out of the wall, but its thickness was such that half an hour elapsed before the opening was large enough to admit him through. As soon as he set foot in this chapel, open to all the winds that blew, he felt himself refreshed by the night air. Through the gaps in the roof and the window frames the sky could be seen, with the light clouds driving before the breeze. Here and there were a few stars, which were growing pale in the light of the moon now rising on the horizon. Franz's object was to find the door which opened at the end of the chapel, by which the Baron de Gortz and Orphanic had gone out, and, crossing the nave obliquely, he advanced towards the apse. This was in the darkness where none of the moonlight penetrated, and his foot stumbled against the ruins of the tombs and the fragments fallen from the roof. At last, at the very end of the apse, behind the re in the dark corner, Franz felt a moldy door yield before his hand. This door opened on a gallery which apparently traversed the outer wall. By it the Baron and Orphanic had entered the chapel, and by it they had just departed. As soon as Franz was in the galley, he again found himself in complete darkness. After winding about a good deal without either a rise or a fall, he was certain that he was now on a level with the interior courts. Half an hour later the darkness did not seem to be so deep. A kind of half-light glided through several lateral openings in the gallery. Franz was able to walk faster and reached a large casemate contrived under the platform of the bastion which flanked the left angle of the outer wall. The casemate was pierced with narrow loopholes, through which streamed the rays of the moon. In the opposite wall was an open door. Franz's first care was to place himself in one of the loopholes so as to breathe the fresh night breeze for a few seconds. But just as he was moving away, he thought he saw two or three shadowy shapes moving at the lower end of the Orgal Plateau which was now full in the moonlight up to the somber masses of the pine forest. Franz looked again. A few men were moving about on the plateau just in front of the trees. Doubtless the Carlsberg police brought by Rotzko. Had they, then, decided to attack that night in hope of surprising the occupants of the castle, or were they waiting for daybreak? It required considerable effort on Franz's part not to shout out and call Rotzko, who would have heard and recognized his voice. But the shout might reach the dungeon, and before the police had scaled the wall, Rodolphe de Gortz would have time to put his device in action and escape by way of the tunnel. Franz succeeded in restraining himself and moved away from the loophole. Crossing the casemate, he went out to the other door and continued along the gallery. Five hundred yards further on, he arrived at the foot of the staircase, which rose in the thickness of the walls. Had he, then, at last arrived at the dungeon, in the center of the place of arms? It seemed so. But this staircase might not be the principal one giving access to the different floors. It was composed of a series of circular steps arranged like the thread of a screw within a dark, narrow cage. Franz went up quietly, listening but hearing nothing, and after twenty steps, reaching a landing. There a door opened onto the terrace which surrounded the dungeon at the height of the first floor. Franz glided along this terrace and, taking care to keep in shelter behind the parapet, looked out over the Argyle Plateau. Several men were still on the edge of the firwood, and there was no sign of their coming nearer the castle. Resolved to meet the Baron before he fled through the tunnel, Franz went round the terrace and reached another door where the staircase resumed its upward course. He put his foot on the first step, rested both his hands against the wall, and began to ascend. All was silent. The room on the first floor was not inhabited. Franz hurried on up to the landings which gave access to the higher floors. When he reached the third landing, his foot found no further steps. There the staircase ended at the highest floor of the dungeon, that which was crowned by the crenellated parapet from which formerly floated the standard of barons of courts. In the wall to the left of the landing there was a door, which was shut. Through the keyhole filtered a ray of light. Franz listened and heard no sound inside the apartment. Looking through the keyhole, he could see only the left side of the room, which was in the bright light, the rest being in darkness. Franz gently opened the door. A spacious apartment occupied the whole of this upper floor. On its circular walls rested a paneled roof, the ribs of which met in a heavy boss in the center. Thick tapestry with figure subjects covered the walls. Some old furniture, 
Cupboards, sideboards, armchairs, and stools were scattered in artistic disorder. At the window hung thick curtains which prevented any of the light within from shining without. On the floor was a thick woolen carpet on which no footstep made a sound. The arrangement of the room was at least peculiar, and as he entered it Franz was struck by the contrast between its light and dark portions. To the right of the door its end was invisible in the deep gloom. To the left, on the contrary, was a sort of platform, the black draping of which received a powerful light due to some apparatus of concentration so placed in front of it as to be unseen. About twelve feet from this platform, from which it was separated by a screen about breast high, was an ancient, long-backed armchair, which the screen kept in a half-light. Near the chair was a little table with a cloth on it, and on this was a rectangular box. The box was about twelve or fifteen inches long and five or six wide, and the cover, encrusted with jewels, was raised, showing that it contained a metallic cylinder. As he entered the room, Franz saw that the armchair was occupied. Its occupant did not move, but sat with his head leant against the back of the chair, his eyes closed, his right arm extended on the table, his hand resting against the box. It was Rodolphe de Gortz. Was it to abandon himself to sleep for a few hours that the Baron desired to pass this last night on the upper floor of the dungeon? No, that could not be after what Franz had heard him say to Orphanic. The Baron de Gortz was alone in this room, and, comfortably to the orders he had received, there could be no doubt that Orphanic had already escaped along the tunnel. And Lestilla? Had not Rodolphe de Gortz said that he would hear her for a last time in this castle of the Carpathians before it was destroyed by the explosion? And for what other reason would he have come back to this room where doubtless she came each evening to fascinate him with her song? Where, then, was Lestilla? Franz saw her not, heard her not. After all, what did it matter now that Rodolphe de Gortz was at his mercy? Franz restrained himself from speaking, but in his present state of excitement would he not throw himself on this man he hated as he was hated? This man who had carried off Lestilla, Lestilla living in mad, mad for him, would he not kill him? Franz stole up stealthily to the armchair. He had but to make a step to seize the Baron, and he had already raised his hand. Suddenly, Lestilla appeared. Franz let his knife fall on the carpet. Lestilla was standing on the platform in the full blaze of the light, her hair undone, her arms stretched out, supremely lovely in the white costume of Angelica in Orlando, just as she had appeared on the bastion of the castle. Her eyes, fixed on the young Count, gazed to the very depths of his soul. It was impossible that Franz could not be seen by her, and yet she made no gesture to call him to her. She opened not her lips to speak to him. Alas, she was mad. Franz was about to rush onto the stage and seize her in his arms to carry her off. Lestilla had begun to sing. Without stirring from his chair, Baron de Gortz had leant forward to listen. In the paroxysm of ecstasy, the dilettante breathed her voice as if it were a perfume. Such as he had been at the performances in the theaters of Italy, so was he now in this room, in infinite solitude, at the summit of this dungeon which towered over Transylvania. Yes, Lestilla sang. She sang for him. Only for him. It was as though a breath exhaled from her lips which seemed to remain without a movement. If reason had left her, at least her artist soul remained in its plentitude. Franz also stood intoxicated with the charms of this voice he had not heard for five long years. He was absorbed in the ardent contemplation of this woman he had thought he should never see again, and who was there, alive, as if some miracle had resuscitated her before his eyes. In the song she sang, was it not one of those which would ever make his heartstrings vibrate? Yes, it was the finale of the tragic scene in Orlando, the finale in which the singer's heart breaks in the final phrases, Innamorata mia cuore triamante, voglio morire. This ineffable phrase Franz followed note by note, and he said to himself that it would not be interrupted as it had been in the San Carlo Theater. No, it would not die between Lestilla's lips as it had done in her farewell. Franz hardly breathed. His whole life was bound up in music. A few measures more and it would end in all its incomparable purity. But the voice began to fail. It seemed as though Lestilla hesitated as she repeated the words of poignant grief. Voglio morire. Would she fall on this stage as she had done on the other? She did not fall but a song fell silent on the very same note as it had done in San Carlo. She uttered a cry, and it was the same cry Franz had heard on that night. And yet Lestilla still stood there with her adored look, the look that awoke all the deepest feelings of the young man's heart. Franz leapt towards her. He would carry her away from this room, away from this castle. And he found himself face to face with the baron who had just risen. Franz de Telec, exclaimed Rodolphe de Gortz. Franz de Telec escaped! But Franz did not answer, and running toward the stage, he cried, Stilla, my dear Stilla, here I find you, alive! Alive! Lestilla alive! exclaimed Baron de Gortz. 
and the ironical phrase ended in a shout of laughter in which was apparent all the fury of revenge. Alive, continued Rodolph de Gortz. Well then, Franz de Telec, try and take her away from me. Franz stretched out his arms to her, whose eyes were ardently fixed on his. At the same instant, Rodolph stooped, picked up the knife that Franz had let fall, and rushed at the motionless figure. Franz threw himself on him to turn away the blow with which she was threatened. He was too late, and the knife struck her to the heart. And as the blow was given, there was a crash of breaking glass, and with the fragments which flew into all parts of the room, Lestilla vanished. Franz remained as if lifeless. He could not understand. Had he also gone mad? And then Rodolphe de Gortz cried, Lestilla again escapes, Franz de Hilleck, but her voice, her voice remains to me. Her voice is mine, mine alone, and will never belong to another. Franz would have thrown himself on the baron, but his strength failed him, and he fell unconscious at the foot of the stage. Rodolphe de Gortz did not even notice the young count. He took the box from the table, he rushed from the room down to the first terrace of the dungeon, and was running round it to gain the other door when there was the report of a gun. It was Rothsko who, from the slope of the counterscarp, had just shot at the Baron de Gortz. The Baron was unhurt, but the bullet shattered the box he held in his arms. He uttered a terrible cry. Her voice! Her voice! he repeated. Her soul! Lestilla's soul! It is ruined! 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 And then with his hair bristling and his hands clenched, he had seen to run along the terrace, shouting, Her voice! Her voice! They have taken away from me her voice. Curse them. And he disappeared through the door at the moment Rotsko and Nick Deck were, without waiting for the police, striving to scale the wall. Almost immediately a tremendous explosion shook the whole extent of Plaza. Sheaves of flames sprang to the clouds, and an avalanche of stones fell on the Vulcan Road. Bastions, curtain, dungeon, chapel were nothing but a pile of ruins scattered over the Orgal Plateau. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 it would not have been forgotten that according to the conversation between the Baron and Orphanic, the explosion should only have destroyed the castle after the departure of Rudolph de Gortz. But at the time the explosion took place, it was impossible for the Baron to have had time to escape through the tunnel. In the transport of grief, in the folly of despair, unconscious of what he did, had then Rudolph de Gortz brought on an immediate catastrophe on which he could be but the first victim? After the incomprehensible words which had escaped him when Roscoe's bullet had broken the box he carried, had he intended to bury himself beneath the ruins of the castle? In any case, it was very fortunate that the police, surprised by Roscoe's shot, were at a considerable distance when the explosion shook the ground. Only a few of them were struck by the fragments which fell over the plateau. Roscoe and the forester were alone at the base of the curtain, and it was indeed a miracle that they were not killed by the shower of stones. The explosion had done its work when Roscoe, Nick Deck, and the police entered the enclosure over the ditch, which had then nearly filled up by the fall of the walls. Fifty yards within the wall, at the base of the dungeon, a body was found among the ruins. It was that of Rodolphe de Gortz. A few old people of the district, among others, Master Colts, recognized him perfectly. Rothsko and Nick Deck sought only to discover the young Count. As Franz had not appeared in the time arranged with his man, it followed that he had been unable to escape from the castle. But could Rothsko hope that he had survived, and that he was not one of the victims of the catastrophe? And so he cried, and Nick Deck did not know what to do to soothe him. However, in about half an hour the young Count was found on the first floor of the dungeon, beneath one of the buttresses which had saved him from being crushed. My master, my poor master. Count. Such were the first words uttered by Rothsko and Nick Deck as they bent over Franz. They believed him dead. He had only fainted. Franz opened his eyes, but his wandering look did not seem to recognize Rothsko, nor did he hear him. Nick Deck, who had raised the young Count in his arms, spoke to him again, but he made no reply. The last words of Lestilla's song escaped from his lips. Inamorata Vogli Amore. Franz de Telec was mad. End of chapter 17. Chapter 18. As the young Count had gone mad, no one would probably have ever heard an explanation of the events of which the castle of the Carpathians had been the theater, if it had not been for the revelations which came about in this manner. For four days Orphanic had waited, as agreed, for the Baron to meet him at the town of Bistritz. But as he did not appear, he began to wonder if he had perished in the explosion. Urged as much by curiosity as anxiety, he had left the town, gone back towards Worst, and was prowling about the ruins of the castle when he was arrested by the police, who knew him from the description given by Rotsko. Once in the chief town of the district, in the presence of the magistrates before whom he had been taken, Orphanic made no difficulty about replying to the questions put to him in the course of the inquiry ordered in the circumstances of the catastrophe. 
but it must be confessed that the sad end of the Baron de Gortz seemed in no way to affect this learned egotist and maniac, whose heart was entirely in his inventions. In the first place, on the urgent demand of Rotsko, Orphanic stated that Lestilla was dead, really dead, and, such was his expression, buried and well buried, for more than five years in the cemetery of Santa Nuevo Campo at Naples. This statement was not the least astonishing of those provoked by this curious adventure. If Lestilla were dead, how came it that Franz could hear her voice in the saloon of the inn, see her on the bastion, and listen to her song when he was in the crypt? And how could he have found her alive in the dungeon? The explanation of this apparently inexplicable phenomenon was as follows. It will be remembered how deep was the Baron's despair when the rumor spread that Lestilla had resolved to retire from the stage and become Countess of Telec. The artiste's admirable talent and all his dilettante gratifications would thus escape him. Then it was that Orphanic suggested that by means of a phonograph he should collect the principal airs from the opera she would appear in during her farewell performances at San Carlo. This instrument had reached a high state of perfection at this period, and Orphanic had so improved it that the human voice underwent no change and lost none of its charm or purity. The Baron accepted Orphanic's offer. Phonographs were successfully and secretly introduced into the private box of the theater during the last weeks of the season and in this way their cylinders received the cavatinas and romances from the operas and concerts, including the melody from San Stefano, and the final air from Orlando, which was interrupted by Lestilla's death. These were the circumstances under which the Baron had shut himself up in the castle of the Carpathians, and there, each night, he listened to the music given out by the phonograph. And not only did he hear Lestilla as if he were in the box, but, and that would appear absolutely incomprehensible, he saw her as if she were alive before his eyes. It was a simple optical illusion. It will be remembered the Baron de Gortz had obtained a magnificent portrait of the singer. This portrait represented her in the white costume of Angelica in Orlando, her magnificent hair in disorder, her arms extended. By means of glasses inclined at a certain angle calculated by Orphanic, when a light was thrown on the portrait placed in front of a glass, Lestilla appeared by reflection as real as if she were still alive, and in all the splendor of her beauty. It was by means of this apparatus, taken for the night to the bastion platform that Rodolphe de Gortz had made her appear when he wished to lure Franz de Telec into the castle, and by its means the young Count had seen her in the room of the dungeon, while her fanatic admirer was in full enjoyment of the voice reproduced by the phonograph. Such very briefly were the explanations given in much detail by Orphanic during his examination, and it was with infinite pride that he declared himself the author of these ingenious inventions, which he had brought to the highest pitch of perfection. But if Orphanic had explained these phenomenon, he did not explain why it was that the Baron de Gortz had not had time to escape by the tunnel on the Vulcan Road. When, however, he had heard that the bullet had shattered the object Rodolphe de Gortz bore in his hands, he understood how it had happened. The box was the phonographic apparatus containing Lestilla's last song, that which the Baron had wished to hear for the last time in the dungeon before destroying it. With its destruction, his life was destroyed, and, mad with despair, he had resolved to bury himself under the ruins of the castle. Baron Rodolph was buried in the graveyard at worst with the honors due to the ancient family that ended with him. The young Count Franz de Telec was taken by Rotsko to the castle of Krajoa, and there he devoted himself entirely to watching over his master. Orphanic had willingly handed over the phonographs containing the other songs of Lestilla, and when Franz heard the voice of the great artiste, he seemed to listen to them and recover a little of his old intelligence, and it seemed as though his mind were struggling to revive in the memories of the unforgettable past. In fact, a few months later he recovered his reason, and through him became known what had passed during the last night in the castle of the Carpathians. The marriage of charming Miriota and Nick Deck took place during the week following the catastrophe. After receiving the benediction from the Pope of the village of Vulcan, they returned to Worst, where Master Colts had reserved for them the best room in his house. But although these different phenomena have been explained in so natural a manner, it must not be imagined that Miriota ceased to believe in their supernatural nature. Nick found reasoning in vain. So did Jonas, who had as many customers as ever in the King Matthias. She would not be convinced. Neither would Master Colts, nor the Shepherd Frick, nor Magister Hermid, nor the other inhabitants of Worst, and many years will elapse before they will renounce their superstitious beliefs. Dr. Patak, who had resumed his customary swagger, is often heard to say, Well, did I not tell them so? Spirits in the castle, just as if there ever were any spirits. But no one listens to him, and he is invariably asked to be silent when his facetiousness exceeds due bounds. The Magister Hermit continues to base the lessons he gives to the young folk of Worst in the study of the Transylvanian legends, and for many years yet the villagers will believe that spirits from the other world haunt the ruins of the castle of the Carpathians. The End End of chapter 18
End of The Castle of the Carpathians by Jules Verne Recording by Joe DeNoya, Somerset, New Jersey